I barely knew Levy back in the day when we were still kids. But he was just another guy from my hometown of Poston, Arizona. That's why I was surprised when our paths crossed again at a small cafe in Tucson, where I had stopped to have lunch. It had been more than a decade since we last talked, so we thought it would be great to catch up. I'm Kieran Lavery, by the way, but that was never important until that encounter. We talked about everything from our families to our careers, reminiscing about school days and sharing old stories. As the conversation flowed seamlessly, a lull settled over the cafe, and Levy ventured into much darker territory. He described how Poston had changed after we grew up and moved on, how the once simple place we knew was now shrouded in an eerie mystery. It all started with those mysterious animal attacks on local farms. He sighed. At first, people didn't pay it much mind. They thought it must have been coyotes or something like that. But things escalated so quickly. He shared with me the horrific events of that fateful night when his life took an abrupt turn for the worse. After returning from work late one evening, he found his wife lying in their bedroom, her body mutilated beyond recognition. This was no animal attack or random act of violence. No one had seen any stranger wandering to town with malicious intent. As the initial shock subsided slightly, Levy furrowed his brows in contemplation and described what he'd seen hidden away in a nearby shed near his wife's body. A mangled meal left unattended by its attacker, dead livestock twisted beyond repair or logic, and paw prints scattered across the scene only furthered Levy's confusion around the situation. Gripping tightly onto his coffee cup with a shaky hand, Levy leaned in slightly before continuing with his story, this time more fervently. There was something about those prints, man. They were like a wolf's tracks but larger, and I don't know, wrong somehow. I think maybe it's an escape from that weird government facility located just outside town. You know what I'm talking about, right? He went on to tell me about a more recent encounter he'd had with something monstrous in the desert, something he couldn't quite put into words. The creature stalked him and his new girlfriend while they were camping one night, circling their campsite with silent, menacing footsteps before launching an attack that left his girlfriend injured and traumatized. As Levy reached the end of his tale, it was clear to me that whatever had claimed his wife's life and was still tormenting him to this day couldn't be easily explained away or ignored. This wasn't some urban legend or practical joke gone too far. There was tangible fear nestled deep within his gaze as he spoke about the harrowing experiences that would forever haunt him. You should be careful too, Levy warned sternly as we parted ways. Whatever's out there is hungry for more than just animals. And until you see it for yourself, no one can truly grasp how terrifying it is. I bid my goodbyes and walked away from that cafe lost in thought. How could anyone even begin to accept such a story? The idea of a creature capable of maiming people and livestock alike while avoiding detection from authorities and locals alike seemed implausible at best. But Levy wasn't the kind of guy who would make up stories to be the center of attention, and that unsettlingly sincere fear in his eyes haunted my thoughts long after our conversation. Over time, what Levy shared only seemed to grow darker with each retelling of the tale by Poston residents who crossed my path. The attacks became increasingly gruesome. Each new sighting brought an even more hellish description of the twisted, unidentified creature that now engulfed life in Poston in a cloak of terror. Engrossed by this chilling mystery, I decided to head back to Poston to investigate further and found myself standing at the very spot Levy described as the location of his earlier encounter. As I surveyed the scene and searched for any potential clues, 
A sudden, unnatural growl echoed through the surrounding desert. My heart raced in my chest, uncertain if what I just heard was simply a figment of my overly active imagination or a prelude to an encounter with the terror that haunted my old friend. The noise grew louder, and I knew it was time to act. I wasn't going to let this thing terrorize anyone else, especially not in my hometown. As soon as the sun set the next evening, I decided to venture out and confront this sinister creature. I journeyed deeper into the desert with a knapsack holding a rifle, a flashlight, and some rope prepared for whatever I might encounter. My heart raced with anticipation, but I felt a profound responsibility to confront this monstrous predator and protect those who were still in danger. My flashlight revealed large, peculiar-looking paw prints leading deeper into the desolate landscape as I followed Levy's description of the route. As I cautiously tracked them through the desert, I could feel my pulse pounding in my ears. Finally, after hours of following its trail, my flashlight beam caught a glimpse of reflective eyes staring back at me from a distance. The creature was massive with an ethereal quality. It had thick matted fur covering its lean frame, long claws that extended from its paws, and sharp fangs exposed as it snarled softly. As the realization settled that I was face to face with the attacker of so many innocent lives, Adrenaline surged through my veins and spurred me into action. Raising my rifle with trembling hands, I aimed at its monstrous form and fired. To my surprise and horror, the sound of gunfire echoed through the air but seemingly didn't phase the creature. Instead of reacting in pain or fear, it simply tilted its head curiously, then leaped towards me with terrifying agility. With quick reflexes fueled by desperation, I evaded its lunge and sprinted back towards town, with the harrowing knowledge that this monster couldn't be stopped by conventional weapons. As I caught up with Levy to reveal what had transpired during my encounter with the malevolent beast, his eyes widened in terror as he realized that his tormentor may never be vanquished and the reality that we may never find a way to stop this creature before it harms more innocent people only added to the weight of our shared nightmare. Exhausted and defeated, we nestled into a local bar for some much-needed reprieve from our horrific experiences. With every sip of my drink, the lingering fear and unease continued to coil in the pit of my stomach a constant reminder that neither Levy nor I would ever be free of this ancient predator's menace. As days turned into weeks, more victims fell prey to this seemingly indestructible creature. The mood in Poston became increasingly despondent as news of each devastating attack reached us. One fateful day, during another desperate search for answers, I noticed something significant about its unusually large paw prints. The path was leading towards an abandoned silver mine on the outskirts of town. Seizing upon this possible lead, I rallied a group of brave townsfolk armed with unconventional makeshift weapons, like Molotov cocktails and flares. We cautiously descended into the mine to confront our fears and face our adversary head-on. The air inside was heavy with tension as we stalked through the dark tunnels, weapons at the ready. Suddenly, bone-chilling snarls echoed through the caverns, warning us that we'd found what we were looking for. The creature sprang from its hiding spot, immediately lunging towards one of our group members. A well-timed flare was thrown into its path, temporarily disorienting it with a burst of searing light and heat. This showed us that while conventional weapons may not work on this monster, perhaps using unconventional tactics could at least slow it down. However much damage was done to the creature, it quickly disappeared deeper into the mine's labyrinthine passages, leaving us with both relief and persistent dread. Our victory proved to be short-lived, 
As even after our encounter in the mine, the creature continued to stalk and terrorize Poston intermittently. As elusive as any specter, this unfathomable predator remains a living nightmare that can never truly be escaped, only briefly evaded in those fleeting moments of uneasy respite. The evil creature that prowls its deserts has cast an unavoidable shadow over the once peaceful town of Poston. The evil creature that took the life of someone he loved and taunts Levy and I with a horrifying clock that ticks ever closer to an end that is always just out of reach is what has forever bound our lives together. It was one of those things that you don't expect to happen to you. It was straight out of a creepy story, except it wasn't fiction. Last June 27th, over a long weekend, my buddies and I decided to go on a hiking trip in the dense woods of Manistee National Forest in Michigan. My name is Zydrinus Chauncey, but most people just call me Z. As odd as my name is, I promise this story is even odder. The first day passed without incident. There was banter and laughter as we navigated winding trails and set up camp. Our group consisted of Clay Steinhauer, Parsival Kasperzik, Zoraida Betancourt, and myself. We didn't know each other's names until we got lost together in an unfamiliar town two summers ago, but that's a story for another time. On the second day of our hike, we stumbled upon something strange. Large prints scattered around that seemed like a mixture of animal and human tracks. The bizarre sight piqued our curiosity. Little did we know we were getting ourselves into something far darker than any curious footprint. Later that night, as we sat around the fire roasting marshmallows and sharing stories, there came an unsettling sound breaking branches from somewhere in the dark woods around us. Clays grabbed his flashlight while Parsival reached for his hunting knife, attempting to sound nonchalant but unable to hide the fear trickling into his voice. So Ryder whispered nervously, Do you guys think it's some sort of wild animal? As if on cue, another loud crunch echoed through the silence. We huddled together quietly intently listening for any signs that could tell us what was happening in the darkness surrounding us. Suddenly, and impossibly fast, there appeared before us an almost human figure with bone-chilling red eyes and sickly gray skin that stretched over its emaciated frame. It snarled cruelly, revealing sharp, mangled teeth that glistened against the dying firelight. I felt more terror than I've ever felt in my life as the thing lunged at us, grabbing Zoraida and ripping into her with inhuman strength. Blood sprayed everywhere while we screamed and tried to fight off the beast. It was pure pandemonium as Zoraida's limp body fell to the ground in a heap of crimson and gore. We didn't have time to process what had just happened. Our survival instincts took over, and we ran. The creature's deafening howls sent shivers down my spine as we fled for our lives, with Parsival trailing just behind me, both of us in a panicked sprint. But no matter how fast we ran or how far away we thought we'd gotten from it, the creature kept pace with a relentless determination that verged on predatory malice. And then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, it was gone vanished back into the shadows as if it had never been there at all. Parsival and I finally crumpled to the ground in exhaustion, our breaths coming out in ragged gasps. We managed to make our way back to camp, where Clay's crouched over Zoraida's mangled body, his eyes filled with tears and terror etched across his pale face. I'll never forget the sense of chilling dread that gripped us as we left the campsite that night, our hearts pounding violently in our chests, 
and fleeting glances cast back over our shoulders into the treacherous darkness enveloping us. To this day, Parsival doesn't speak much about that night, opting instead for quiet brooding and an unspoken vow never to return to Manistee National Forest. Several days later, I found out through whispered rumors that the creature we encountered was known as a skinwalker, a terrifying entity with roots deep within the folklore of the area. But instead of providing comfort and closure, this new information only served to poke at fresh wounds and reinforce just how close we came to our own doom. As I sit here now, clutching an old newspaper article about the grisly scene we left behind, I can't shake the feeling that on some moonless night in the near future, I'll look up into the darkness and see those blood-red eyes staring back at me once more. As I stared at the blood-stained newspaper clippings in my trembling hands, I knew I had to face this nightmare. I wasn't ready to just go on living in a constant state of fear. But how could three ordinary guys like us hope to take down a supernatural creature like the Skinwalker? The legends about Skinwalkers made it clear that conventional weapons were useless against them. So, we sought help from a local Native American shaman who had knowledge of such things. The shaman was an old man with piercing gray eyes and long, silvery hair that hung down to his waist. He listened intently as we recounted our horrific encounter in Manistee National Forest. A somber expression washed over his face, and he told us in no uncertain terms that the skinwalker was not something we should trifle with. However, he agreed to help us when he sensed our unwavering determination. The shaman performed a ritual to cleanse us from the evil energy and gave us each a woven amulet infused with sage and protective energies. While these wouldn't be enough to defeat the creature, they would at least provide some defense against its magic. For our offense, the shaman recommended weapons made of pure silver, the only material thought to harm the beast. Over several cautiously planned weeks, my friends Clay's Parsival and I prepared ourselves physically and emotionally for our confrontation with the monster. We obtained pure silver knives that were said to be sharper and more durable than anything else we could find. As D-Day finally arrived and we set out into Manistee National Forest, we carried more than just those gleaming silver blades. We carried our determination to end this nightmare once and for all. We returned on June 27th at exactly 11.05 p.m., one year since our initial encounter, to where it all started. According to what little information we could gather about the Skinwalker, it was most likely to return around the same time and place it first attacked. The air was thick with apprehension as we nervously glanced around in the shadows for any signs of our adversary. Then, just past midnight, a guttural growl came from the thicket nearby. Hearts pounding in our chests, Clay's Parsival, and I readied our silver knives and braced ourselves for the imminent attack. Suddenly it appeared as if from thin air. The monster had returned, with twisted gray skin pulled tight over its skeletal frame and those haunting red eyes that seared into our souls. With a roar that shook the very earth beneath us, it charged at us. We each dodged to different sides, with clays slashing wildly at the creature as Park, meanwhile, sneaked up behind it to start stabbing vigorously at its legs. Blood splattered across my face as the monster writhed in agony. Turns out Silver really was effective against this creature. Using every ounce of strength I could muster, I lunged toward its back and drove my knife deep inside its fetid flesh. The creature screamed in pain and collapsed to the ground, thrashing madly in a desperate attempt to dislodge us. But we didn't let up. We continued sinking our silver knives into its body, over and over again, until finally, silence. 
With wide-eyed disbelief, we stared at the lifeless body of the skinwalker before us. Grotesque limbs bent unnaturally and a nauseating amount of blood pooling beneath it. It may not have been an idealistic solution, but it nevertheless satisfied our hatred and fear towards that vile entity. Seething questions regarding its origin hovered heavily above us as we departed from Manistee National Forest's haunted grounds. Bidding our farewells to Zoraida's unmarked grave, we vowed never to return after having avenged her gruesome death. Over time, we kept our vow and moved on with our lives, always grateful for the shaman's assistance and honoring Zoraida's memory. I am eternally cautious now, more than willing to heed warnings about unexplained creatures that supposedly lurk beyond our understanding. Although turbulent emotions may still sporadically rattle my core, I take solace in knowing those blood-red eyes will never set their sights on me again. I've always been a bit of an adventurer, constantly seeking out new experiences and thrills. On October 15, 2016, my friend Ellis and I decided to explore the abandoned industrial park on the outskirts of Ashwood Falls, a seemingly innocuous meeting point for urban explorers and thrill-seekers alike. Little did we know our adventurous nature would lead us into a horrifying, inescapable nightmare that still haunts me to this day. The Ashwood Industrial Park had been abandoned since the late 1980s. The buildings had become overgrown with weeds, with rusted metal sticking out at odd angles like skeletal fingers reaching for the sky. Graffiti covered the decaying walls, some were merely tags, while other works were more intricate monstrous forms looming over us as we ventured deeper into the park. Despite our skepticism, a quiet unease crept through us when we stumbled upon the derelict factory and laboratory at the heart of the park. Inside, darkness swallowed us whole. Ellis fumbled for his flashlight, revealing colossal machines covered in years of dust and grime. The air was thick with musty odors of decay, as we plunged deeper into the shadows, navigating through cluttered debris, we began to hear muffled noises echoing through the labyrinthine halls, something thumping heavily in our direction. Ellis suggested it might be squatters or explorers like us, but admitted he couldn't shake an eerie feeling that there's more to this place than meets the eye. Determined not to let fear control us, Ellis led me towards an office at the far end of a corridor when suddenly he stopped dead in his tracks. A rancid smell filled our nostrils. Curiosity outweighing disgust, we discovered something so gruesome that it still makes my stomach churn. In front of us lay two decomposing bodies dangling from metal hooks on either side of their necks, relics of malicious intent. They'd been eviscerated, with organs scattered haphazardly across the blood-soaked floor and flies buzzing around the remains. I'd never felt terror so real before that moment. Just when we began fearing for our own safety, the pounding returned, closer and louder. My breath quickened, and my heart pounded in my chest. Ellis whispered we needed to hide, so we slipped behind an old metal cabinet concealing us from view. The stench of death became overbearing as the heavy footsteps grew louder before finally stopping right outside. A guttural growl filled the air, and we fell silent, praying it wouldn't notice us. Then it walked into our line of sight, a grotesque creature standing on two legs, its humanoid form distorted by patches of fur and rotting flesh. Claws scraped against the ground where fingers should have been, its awful mouth licking in anticipation as it surveyed its grisly domain. Before we could ponder its origin or intent, 
It confronted its grotesque handiwork, inhaling deeply as if reveling in the carnage. And then it did something utterly horrifying. It began devouring what little was left of the bodies. We could do nothing but watch helplessly from our hiding spot. Time felt endless. The thing finished feasting on human remains, licking the viscera from its twisted claws before starting to shriek, an unnatural sound beyond comprehension. Suddenly Ella's phone rumbled, a text alert. Out of nowhere, panic hit hard as his phone illuminated with that piercing tone. The creature's head snapped towards us, eyes filled with rage, before it charged our direction. There wasn't any time to think or be scared. Instinct had taken hold as we sprinted out of that office, down corroded hallways, adrenaline pumping full force while that thing outrageously pursued us, roars echoing deafeningly throughout the abandoned factory. I don't know how we managed to escape that living nightmare. Blind turns and fragmented memories swirl without a sense of reality or coherence. But somehow, we found our way out and bolted for the safety of Ellis' car, speeding away from Ashwood Industrial Park. To this day, I don't know the true nature of that monstrous being lurking within those decaying ruins. In the weeks that followed, Ellis did some research, speaking with various local historians and cryptologists. There were whispers of a skinwalker, an ancient creature born of malice stalking Ashwood, yet still, nothing conclusive. Distraught by the traumatizing events, Ellis and I knew we had to expose this creature. After a couple of days, we gathered our courage, armed ourselves with knives and a shotgun, and resolved to put an end to this horror. As we returned to the abandoned industrial park, our senses were hyper-aware. The creature seemed to anticipate our arrival. The distant echoes of its guttural growls filled the decaying halls. Ellis and I split up to cover more ground, but we remained in constant contact via cell phone. During my search, I found more victims inside the factory. They were disemboweled like the others we'd discovered days prior, a sickening spectacle. It dawned on me that this beast was far more cunning than we thought. It had used those lifeless bodies as bait. Suddenly, Ellis called me. Panic gripped his voice. It's here, the creature. I shot it, but it didn't seem to have any effect. Racing towards his location, my legs felt like lead weights, dragging me through the dimly lit labyrinth. With a knife clenched firmly in my hand and sweat dripping down my brow, I frantically searched for Ellis. Through a broken window frame came his voice again. It's wounded. Keep your distance. It's furious. Footsteps crashing behind me spurred adrenaline like wildfire. There it was, the horrible entity responsible for countless deaths in Ashwood Industrial Park. Its body is a grotesque combination of human-like features melded with animalistic characteristics. The glimmering eyes locked on me with unadulterated fury as blood oozed from the shotgun wound on its torso. Deftly, I hurled my knife at it, but like before, a gunshot or knife plunged into its sickly flesh barely even phased it. Making a hasty retreat to regroup with Ellis, thoughts raced through my mind. What could actually kill this monster? There was a library in Ashwood several days before that Ellis showed me, the Ashwood Chronicles. Although Ellis dismissed it as folklore, I recalled reading about a creature that seemed to resemble the beast we were dealing with. Scouring through the ancient pages, one grisly detail stood out. The creature could only be slayed by fire. Armed now with Molotov cocktails, Ellis and I returned to the industrial park to finish what we'd started. Strange guttural noises echoed eerily through the halls, guiding us straight to the monster's lair. We spotted it feasting on another victim, 
a sight that cemented our resolve to end this nightmare. With swift synchronization, we hurled our Molotovs at the beast. Flames engulfed its ghastly form, and furious screams reverberated throughout the decaying factory. Clawing at walls and searing flesh, it howled in agony before collapsing onto the cold ground. Not willing to take any chances, we waited for its body to become ash. As it did, amidst the smoke and embers, an oppressive aura lifted from Ashwood Industrial Park. A feeling of freedom washed over us. In the days that followed, Ellis and I reported our findings to local authorities, accompanied by ample evidence of the terror that lurked inside those factory walls. While they found it hard to accept such twisted accounts of supernatural horror, they could not deny our chilling testimonies. Our actions saved countless other urban explorers from a gruesome fate. That day, fire's purifying embrace consumed whatever unknown abomination resided in Ashwood Industrial Park. Though this chapter of terror reached an end, New horrors undoubtedly lay waiting in shadows not yet discovered, chilling reminders that humanity's grasp of evil hardly scratches its true depths. I never thought I'd be the kind of person to have an encounter I couldn't explain but I guess that's how these things always seem to start. It was August 7th, 2017, and my buddy Graham Manaudi and I decided to hit the road for a spontaneous road trip to unwind from our mundane daily routines. Destination, the Sierra Nevada mountains little did we know that the trip would unravel into a nightmare like no other. So, Caden, Graham said, lighting up his cigarette with a carefree grin. You think we'll actually find any gold up in these hills? You never know, man. I responded lightheartedly. And while I knew we weren't exactly experienced gold prospectors, the adventure itself was enough. As we arrived at Hogsback Peak National Forest, we set up camp near the entrance of an abandoned mine system rumored to have housed miners in the 1800s. We drank beers around the campfire, Graham did a few of his signature tequila shots, and we cracked increasingly questionable jokes as the night wore on. That's when we first heard it, a blood-curdling scream echoing through the trees. It didn't sound like any animal we knew about. Puzzled, Graham grabbed his flashlight and shone it in the direction of the terrifying noise. All right, so who here's trying to spook us? He yelled into the night. We assumed it was just another camper having some fun at our expense. But another scream pierced through the cool mountain breeze, and this time it was closer and more guttural than before. A cold shiver ran down my spine as we both realized that this might be more than just a practical joke. The following day, against our better judgment or perhaps fueled by morbid curiosity, we decided to explore deeper into the mine shaft to see if there was any connection between the screams and the abandoned mines. That's when I caught a glimpse of something or someone that I can only describe as sinister. Hunched over with long, thin limbs and patches of fur barely covering a skeletal body, bloodshot eyes studied us intently as if calculating its next move. Mutilated animal carcasses were strewn about, a deer with its spine ripped from its body, a raccoon whose face was savagely torn off, and an unidentifiable creature oozing entrails from its gaping abdomen. My blood ran cold and my heart began pounding like a jackhammer in my chest. We were no match for this thing, whatever it was. Graham pulled out his .45 caliber handgun from his backpack and fired a shot into the air, hoping to scare it off. Instead, the creature just tilted its head curiously, 
as if analyzing the threat. We stumbled back toward the campsite, our legs trembling violently with panic. We passed by other campers who clustered together in whispered discussion after also hearing the bone-chilling screams the night before. I heard there are some old Native American tales about these parts, said one particularly grizzled-looking man who introduced himself as Horatio Fairweather. Something about unnatural creatures haunting these forests. The sun had begun to set behind the mountain peaks when we finally made it back to our campsite. The last rays of light painted the trees in ominous shadows. I knew in my gut that we had to pack up and leave immediately, but there was something intoxicating about our brush with mortal danger that urged us to stay another night. Sure enough, as darkness enveloped us once more, we found ourselves confronted by the horrifying entity again. This time we could see every grotesque detail of this monstrous being stalking closer towards us with a predatory grace that still haunts me to this day. Graham and I fought off our paralyzing fear and prepared to defend ourselves against what seemed like the embodiment of pure evil. Cruel laughter radiated through the forest as it began to move around us, disappearing in the shadows only to reappear moments later in a different location. This terrifying game of cat and mouse carried on far into the night. The sun peeked over the horizon as we prepared for one final frenzied confrontation with this unknown antagonist that seemed to take pleasure in our panic and torment. Our battered bodies and minds are nearly at their breaking point, with nothing but adrenaline and sheer desperation keeping us conscious. It was Sunday morning when we decided to take matters into our own hands. Graham and I discussed our plan, as any logical person would do in this situation. He still had his 45 caliber handgun and I managed to find a hunting knife among the junk from the previous campers. We knew it would be risky, but we were done cowering in fear. We began our journey deeper into the forest, prepared for anything. Our senses were heightened. We noticed that others who had heard the screams had left the area, and I couldn't blame them. We continued further into the dense foliage until we reached a small clearing a perfect place for an ambush. But before we could execute our plan, a new voice broke through the eerie silence. A woman clad in old hiking gear emerged from behind a tree, her eyes searching cautiously. Are you two here to get rid of that thing? She asked nervously. Yeah, I replied, gripping my knife tighter. If it's even possible. The woman introduced herself as Maggie, a cryptozoology enthusiast who had been following strange sightings in this area for weeks. She claimed that the creature had decimated local wildlife and was now branching out to torment human visitors. Maggie also explained that the creature seemed vulnerable to loud noises and bright lights, weapons that could buy us some time if needed. And so, with newfound knowledge on our side, we carried out our plan. As darkness fell once more, we created makeshift noise devices from empty cans and rocks and set them up around the clearing's perimeter. Then we created a large fire in the center and waited for our foe to arrive. The first scream echoed through the forest as it had each night before, guttural and angry. It drew nearer until we finally laid eyes on the abomination again. It was tall and gaunt, its grotesque body clad in disheveled fur, and the malice in its eyes was apparent beneath the flickering light. Our makeshift booby traps sprung into action as the creature approached, temporarily startling it with bursts of noise. Graham fired his handgun into the air to further deter it and I lunged forward, thrusting my knife at its outstretched arm. But the strike was futile. My blade failed to pierce the beast's unnaturally thick hide. It snarled at us, 
seemingly more annoyed than injured, and retreated back into the shadows. With blood pounding in our ears, we knew that we couldn't go on like this forever. We needed a different solution. With Maggie's help, we stumbled upon something far more disturbing than we could have ever imagined. A cave with paintings covering the walls that were centuries old. We carefully studied these ancient inscriptions and learned that this creature wasn't just an anomaly but rather a protector of the land. Without its terrible presence, other dangers would be unleashed upon us. And so, our role had now changed from vanquishers to negotiators. Armed with this knowledge and a newfound sense of understanding towards the beast, we humbly approached it one final time. We spoke calmly into the night air, expressing acceptance of its existence and compelling it to see us as part of this place now too. This time, instead of retreating into the darkness or attacking us outright, it seemed to listen. The fierce gaze in its eyes softened ever so slightly before it vanished once again into the shadows. We were puzzled yet relieved. We hadn't defeated our enemy through brute force but instead found some semblance of peace that would keep both us and it alive. As we packed up our belongings to leave Hogsback Peak National Forest for good, we knew that this story would end differently than we'd anticipated. But life is full of surprises, and sometimes the hardest battles are fought not with weapons but with understanding, respect, and negotiation. I was perched on the edge of the old abandoned train bridge, staring into its dark and seemingly never-ending tunnel. It was Friday, July 17th, and I had been drawn to this mysterious place for reasons I couldn't quite understand. My name is Thaddeus Everhart, just an ordinary guy with a general curiosity for this eerie location. My friends Lysander Sloan and Cordelia Havisham joined me that day. We were considered the troublemakers of our small town in southern West Virginia known as Harwood Hollow, but we were simply daring teenagers looking for a bit of excitement. Little did we know that thrill would change our lives forever. So why exactly did you bring us here, Thad? asked Lysander as he took a puff of his cigarette and blew out the smoke. Well, I replied hesitantly, I've heard people say there's some sort of wild animal living in this train tunnel. Something they claim doesn't quite fit any normal description. Locals are calling it Jenkins Shadow Beast or something like that. I thought it might be interesting to see for ourselves. Cordelia rolled her eyes but followed us anyway as we began cautiously walking into the dark tunnel. Our fascination grew with every step we took deeper into the darkness and further from the daylight streaming through the entrance behind us. Beginner's luck or fate, I don't know what to call it, but there we were, standing face to face with what could only be described as an enormous beast covered in mottled fur and wearing an eerily human-like expression. It resembled a tall, deformed wolf with piercing red eyes that seemed to glow in the dim light. Its bared teeth glistened, sharp like daggers, dripping saliva that sizzled onto the ground beneath it. Ah! Cordelia screamed at the top of her lungs as the creature lunged toward us, the sound echoing throughout the tunnel. Our instinctual response to fight or flight kicked in, and we ran like our lives depended on it because at that moment they did. Lysander, Cordelia, and I stumbled over loose rocks and abandoned railroad ties as we sprinted for our lives. Hot on our heels, we could hear the guttural snarl of the monster, a constant reminder that we couldn't slow down. We felt its presence closing in. We heard its claws scraping against the walls, and the scent of its putrid breath filled our nostrils. 
The adrenaline pumping through my veins made me run faster than I ever thought possible. The tunnel's exit was now in sight, but as we neared it, Lysander tripped over a rail spike that had somehow dislodged itself from one of the decaying cross beams. He fell hard to the ground with a sickening crunch as his ankle twisted beneath him. Cordelia and I turned just in time to see the creature rapidly closing in on him. With yellow eyes now focused intently on Lysander, Jenkins' shadow beast didn't even notice when I hurled a chunk of broken cement from my hiding spot. It connected squarely with its head, causing the monster to emit a warbled yelp and pause momentarily. Go! Keep running! Lysander yelled as he struggled to stand. Despite his twisted ankle, he managed to hobble in our direction. Cordelia and I grabbed him by their arm and helped carry him out of what could have been his grave. We ran without looking back until we found ourselves back at my truck, where we quickly piled in and took off down the dirt road leading back to town. A chilling howl echoed across Harwood Hollow that night, leaving no doubt in my mind that Jenkins' shadow beast was real, and it had marked us. After what felt like an eternity, we arrived at the hospital. I swiftly carried Lysander in, with Cordelia close behind. They rushed our friend to a room for immediate treatment, but we knew there was more to this story than just a broken ankle. We needed answers and were determined to find them. Days later, when we heard talk of lost dogs and disfigured animals turning up around town, it only confirmed our worst fears. Something evil, something born of legend and darkness, marked us. Feeling a chilling sense of responsibility, we knew we had to do something to stop this creature from attacking our town. So Lysander, Cordelia, and I began to research the legend of Jenkins' shadow beast. Scouring the internet, consulting old records at the local library, and interviewing some of the elder residents of Harwood Hollow, we pieced together a clearer picture. Rumors suggested that the beast was created accidentally when an old hermit named Jenkins tried to perform an ancient ritual that went horribly wrong. Jenkins had been attempting to summon a guardian spirit to protect him from the growing ills of the world. Instead, he unleashed a dark and twisted entity that took on a nightmarish form. After Lysander recovered from his injuries and was discharged from the hospital, we paid him a visit at his house. It had been two days since our encounter with the creature. Time was of the essence. Guys, said Lysander as he hobbled towards us with his crutches, I found something. He handed me a photograph of what appeared to be an old manuscript. If we can hurt it physically, he explained, pointing at a portion of text mentioning piercing its reddened eyes with silver projectiles. We have a chance of banishing this creature. Silver is often used as a weapon against supernatural beings and legends. We had nothing to lose and everything to gain. With that knowledge in hand, I purchased three slingshots and crafted silver pellets using my father's metalworking tools. The next day, around dusk, armed with our makeshift weapons and battered courage, Cordelia, Lysander, and I returned to face our fears at the abandoned train bridge. We hid among the shadows near the tunnel entrance and waited for the sun to set fully in anticipation of Jenkins' shadow beast's arrival and arrive it did. A haunting growl confirmed its presence before we even saw it. I whispered, Remember, aim for its eyes. We nodded to each other in acknowledgement. As the creature drew closer, we could see its grotesque form in more detail. Bony ridges under its black, mottled fur and jagged, canine-like ears that twitched as if sensing our pulse. With hearts pounding wildly in our chests, we suddenly sprung from hiding and took aim with precision. 
The creature seemed momentarily stunned by the unexpected confrontation. A moment was all we needed. In unison, we let the silver pellets fly. I felt as if time slowed down as we watched our pellets sail through the air. One, two, and three solid impacts connected with the beast's eyes. It bellowed in agony and confusion, blood streaming down its face as it swung wildly at us. We dodged its oncoming swipes, using the tunnel's debris to hinder its movements. And then we noticed something incredible. The creature began to shrink before our very eyes. Suddenly, a gust of wind erupted from within the tunnel. It howled like a beast's rage being silenced, echoing through the night air. Our ears rang as the force of it knocked us off our feet. In place of the monster that had once stood before us now lay the body of Jenkins himself, old and decrepit but no longer a menacing presence terrorizing our town. We couldn't believe what we were witnessing. We had triumphed over an unimaginable horror. In gratitude and relief, we bore witness to his last breaths as he whispered a final, Thank you. The wind that had once roared became a soft zephyr that carried him away into oblivion. We stood there for a moment, uncertain of what to do, but finally agreed to silently bury Jenkins' mortal remains in a makeshift grave at a nearby meadow clearing under a crescent moonlit sky. As Cordelia picked a wild flower to lay atop the grave, we shared a mutual understanding. Sometimes, Confronting darkness together creates an unbreakable bond for all eternity. It was the last goodbye to a story that stayed with us about a man and the tragedy that consumed him, the legend of Jenkins' shadow beast. I never thought a simple bike ride could turn into such a nightmare. This all happened about five years ago when I, Zarek Balthazar, was just a college student trying to keep active during the summer break. I was visiting my cousin Santana Covington in a small town named Winston Falls, located in Vermont. We decided to go for a bike ride in the beautiful, dense forest that surrounded the town. It was late afternoon when we set out on our journey, not knowing we were about to cross paths with something gruesome from local legends. The first few miles were fun and filled our lungs with the pure air that only an untouched forest can provide. The friendly banter between my cousin Santana and me filled the air as we enjoyed our peaceful ride. Slowly, however, the peaceful atmosphere morphed into something eerie as we ventured deeper into the woods. Suddenly, we came across a disturbing sight, a mangled deer carcass. Its limbs were twisted while fresh blood oozed over its body. A sense of dread washed over us as we silently wondered what could have inflicted such violence on this poor creature. Must have been a bear or something, Santana nervously suggested. I don't know. This seems too brutal to be just a bear, I replied, my stomach churning at the sight. Reluctantly, we continued our ride but couldn't shake off that lingering feeling of unease, like something evil had its eye on us. As we rode, dusk began to settle in, and shadows grew darker and longer around us. Suddenly, rustling in the trees above caused us to stop in our tracks. Our hearts raced as we wondered whether it was only a squirrel or perhaps whatever attacked that deer earlier on. As we listened closely, the noises seemed to come closer until, out of the darkness, emerged a figure unlike any animal either of us had ever seen before. It was like someone strayed out of a nightmare. This creature stood on two legs but looked completely unnatural with its elongated limbs, hunched back and oily black hair. It stared at us with menacing yellow eyes and emitted a low, disturbing growl that shook us to our core. 
My heart pounded in my chest, and I could feel my legs trembling beneath me as adrenaline surged through my veins. Gritting my teeth and gathering all the courage I could muster, I threw a rock at the creature, which struck it hard in the face. With an enraged howl, it lurched forward, ready to attack. Santana and I knew running wasn't an option. We had to fight. We searched for anything that could be used as a weapon. Rocks, branches, anything we could find. The creature charged us with immense speed, managing to throw Santana violently to the ground. He screamed in pain while grasping his broken arm. Infuriated and desperate to save him, I lunged forward and began hitting this monstrous thing with all my might. The sound of bones crunching against bones was sickening as blood spewed from the creature's face. It howled in fury before launching itself one last time at Santana. With a sudden burst of strength, Santana kicked it square in its hideous face using his good arm while gripping the knife we found earlier on our ride. The creature stumbled backward for a moment before retreating deeper into the growing darkness. By now, twilight had smothered the last rays of sunlight, and we stumbled out of the forest using adrenaline as fuel to suppress any kind of pain threatening to paralyze us. When we finally reached the edge of town, Santana's face paled from confusion and terror upon realizing that we described an encounter with a creature whispered among locals, the infamous Skinwalker. We didn't waste any time and went straight to the local sheriff's office. We told them everything, from the mangled deer in the forest to our confrontation with the creature. The sheriff, a weathered man named Carl Johnson, listened intently as we recounted our harrowing tale. What you two encountered was not human, Sheriff Johnson said grimly, but something that has plagued this town for decades. Do you know what it could be? Santana asked curiously, wincing while nursing his broken arm. Some believe it's the work of an ancient being that has existed in these woods for centuries. Others say it's a shapeshifter that can assume any form it chooses. Sheriff Johnson sighed. But whatever it is, no one has managed to kill or capture it. Santana and I decided to take matters into our own hands. In the following days, we gathered information from locals about this mysterious creature lurking in the woods. Some shared their personal encounters with it while others directed us to old newspaper articles reporting similar cases over the years. During our research, we discovered a pattern. This malevolent creature's attacks seemed to increase dramatically during a full moon. As luck would have it, there would be another full moon approaching in just three days. With time running out and motivated by our desire to protect the town from further harm, we developed a plan to hunt down this elusive menace once and for all. We spent the next few days preparing for our attack. Santana acquired several bear traps and thick chains from a local store, whereas I purchased a handgun registered under my name. We had practiced shooting before, but this time, it felt like we held life and death within our grasp. On the night of the full moon, Armed with weapons we hoped would be sufficient, we ventured into the dense forest where our initial encounter had occurred. As darkness descended upon us, an unsettling tension hung in the air. The forest was unnervingly quiet, not even the wind dared disturb the silence. Treading carefully, we set up bear traps and laid out long chains to entangle our foe. We covered any exposed metal with foliage, our hands shaking with a mix of anticipation and dread. Suddenly, I saw it, the creature's menacing silhouette lurking in the shadows. Swiftly, Santana activated the flashlight on his phone while I took aim. Show yourself! I yelled, my voice cracking under pressure. There was no response 
save for an indistinct growl that sent vibrations across our very souls. As if summoned by the malicious call, a thick cloud engulfed the moon above us, plunging our surroundings into complete darkness. With guns in hand and hearts pounding, we listened intently for any movement or sound from the creature. Then, without warning, it burst out of the darkness towards Santana, who barely dodged the lethal swipe of its claws, tripping over a trap that had ensnared its leg. The creature howled in agony as Santana managed to loop a chain around its neck before pulling it tight. It thrashed violently and growled menacingly, but he held on with all his strength despite his injured arm. Now's my chance. With one deep breath, I aimed my gun at its head, no room for error, and squeezed the trigger. The shot echoed in the empty woods as blood sprayed on my face. For a moment, everything blurred into an indescribable chaos of noises, struggling breaths and sobs filled with terror. But then all went silent as the creature went limp after several guttural gasps. As days turned into weeks after our encounter, people whispered about our supposed victory against the evil that had sprawled over Winston Falls for ages. Yet, this so-called triumph always remained ephemeral, a gnawing feeling within me that dreaded confirmation like an omen. My nightmare-like premonition came true one week later when a lone fisherman found another mangled deer along the river. The wounds bore an uncanny resemblance to those we had seen before, and a chilling warning that whatever had met its end in that blood-filled night might not be the creature we feared. If it wasn't the monster we had killed, then who or what was it? With the horrifying reality that our skinwalker antagonist was still lurking in the shadows, I vowed silently, we would never rest until truly trampling upon this force of evil beyond human comprehension. It was my first visit to the little-known town of Guineville, nestled deep within the dense forests of Oregon. This would be the last family reunion I ever attended at my Aunt Lavenderia's place. She lived in an old Victorian house near an abandoned lumber mill, which had a sense of eeriness and seclusion, but also a strange beauty. My name is Calcifer Daxirian. Yeah. My parents had a thing for unique names. My father, Drystand Axirian, was always the adventurous type. He thrived on exploring isolated areas and introducing our family to new experiences. My mother, Charlotta Daxirian, a renowned botanist, was not too different either. They were quite the pair. Our house was about half an hour's walk from Aunt Lavenderia's. One morning, while everyone slept in, I decided to venture toward that old lumber mill before joining them for lunch. The forest cracked and rustled around me like a surreal orchestra as I strolled down the narrow dirt path flanked by trees adorned with moss and fungi. Jostling branches reminded me of something my cousin Meredith said last night over a campfire. I'm warning you all. There's something lurking in these woods. That statement forced out a chuckle from most of us, but I could see Meredith was serious. Suddenly, out of nowhere, an unsettling stench enveloped the air. The repulsive odor of rotting meat combined with an ammonia-like smell hit me hard. Coupled with sudden, painful screams echoing nearby, my heartbeat pounded faster than the furious beating wings of a thousand hummingbirds. Jogging toward the origin of those unsettling cries, I saw Trenton Remington lying on the ground, his clothing torn to shreds, while his arms were wrapped tightly around his stomach, as though holding together his insides. Trembling and weeping uncontrollably, he whispered to me. It was like a shadow with red eyes. 
barely able to register the horrific sight before me. I helped Trenton stagger back to Aunt Lavenderia's house amidst the hushed dread settling over the family reunion. The police arrived soon after, but they couldn't find any trace of the assailant. The local deputy, Eldrin Parkton, talked about similar attacks that had taken place around Guineaville for years. However, due to the victim's reluctance to share more about their encounters and unclear descriptions of their attacker, an identifiable suspect never turned up. The ominous presence in the woods had become something of a local legend, told only in hushed tones beside campfires and inside dimly lit living rooms. Some called it a ghost or demon, others labeled it the shadow beast. No one could explain why it was stalking Guineville's residents, or why it seemed hell-bent on leaving them in sheer terror and pain. As days morphed into weeks, tensions within our family grew unbearable. Everybody knew what I now understood. We would pray for this unearthly visitor. My father became obsessed trying to debunk legends surrounding this shadow beast as he monitored nighttime activity from his makeshift surveillance post. Then one evening, when the sun began its descent into twilight, I came across something in the woods I'll never forget. As I edged closer, trying to discern what lay before me, my calm curiosity transformed into unadulterated panic as my eyes locked onto the lifeless form of my father, Dry Stan, slowly decomposing beside a tree. His body was grotesquely twisted and torn, and blood smeared horrifically in all directions like a wild masterpiece created by an insane artist. His wide-open eyes glistened like grisly marbles the sheer terror trapped within them haunting every corner of my thoughts. With my father's haunting, lifeless eyes etched in my memory, I knew I was the one responsible for seeking a resolution. My family was broken, and this shadow beast intended to keep it that way until everyone succumbed. For the next few days, I obsessively researched the town's history hoping to find any clue and reveal the weakness of our tormentor. During one of my investigative outings, I stumbled upon an elderly woman named Agnes, a lifetime resident of Guineaville. With her wrinkles formed over years of sorrow and fear, she quietly confided in me her suspicions about this creature causing havoc in their lives. Agnes described the antagonist as unearthly, a monstrous beast with red eyes that glowed like sinister embers and arms stretching unnaturally long as they reached out to their prey. Its elongated black body seemed to be made of darkness itself while it moved swiftly through both night and day. My course became obvious. I had to confront the enemy head-on. Talking to locals revealed that there have been sightings near an abandoned cabin deep in the woods. Equipped with a hunting rifle, knives, and protective gear, I ventured into the murky forest with steely determination. The eerie silence enveloped me as I trudged towards the supposed lair of our nightmare. A disquieting chill crept up my spine while approaching the dilapidated cabin, a feeling that instilled dread but merely stoked my resolve. I nudged open the creaking cabin door with trembling hands, my rifle aimed before me. It seemed empty at first glance until my gaze landed on what appeared to be a slumbering figure huddled in the corner. With bated breath, I braced myself for whatever might come next. As if responding to my presence, it stirred awake. Red, gleaming orbs snapped open. Panic surged through me as I realized it wasn't just a creature. It was part human too, or perhaps used to be. Its sickening jagged teeth ground together, and a guttural voice uttered a threat. You dare intrude into my domain? The voice hissed, seeming to possess an air of twisted amusement. My fingers tightened around the rifle, and my heart pounded relentlessly. Why are you tormenting us? 
What do you want? I demanded with forced courage. It sensed my bravado, that edifice of confidence threatening to crumble at any moment. It rose menacingly, its red eyes glistening ominously. I was driven from my home by your people. This forest belonged to me before they tore it down for the sake of their wretched town. I've returned to exact vengeance. The realization and sympathy struck me like a thunderbolt, but I couldn't let grief overshadow the need for justice. I will stop you, I warned lowly, taking aim. You can't terrorize us any longer. Its laughter pierced the air like a shrill, siren-like shriek. Your bullets can't harm me. Your misery sustains me. But contrary to its brazen taunt, I could see hints of fear in its once human visage as I pulled the trigger. The bullet tore through its malign form. It let out an anguished howl that reverberated through the surrounding forest. Writhing in pain but not yet defeated, it broke free from the cabin and fled deeper into darkness. I knew that this bullet had not killed the shadow beast. It only weakened and wounded it. The town would never be the same again. However, instead of feeling triumph or relief at this quasi-victory, my heart sank, unable to ignore and move past the torment placed upon everyone in Guineville due to a perpetual cycle of anguish and loss. Looking back on those dark days, I've often wondered if there could have been another way, rather than seeking retribution, to coexist in peace. But now, the torment has finally abetted, and we live in the hallowed memories of the horror that once gripped our lives. While the creature's fate remains uncertain, one thing is now clear. There is no simple right or wrong in this world, just the tangled web of chaos ultimately woven by the flaws in our shared humanity. I've never been one to scare easily or give much thought to local legends. People would chit-chat about the strangest things, spinning tales of bizarre occurrences that always seemed too fantastical to be true. It wasn't until March 27, 2017 that my perspective shifted forever. I had been camping with my buddies Aldous Hartford and Zephyr Albright in the idyllic, remote woods of Loda, Illinois. The three of us met in college and have remained close friends since then. Aldous, a sturdy six-foot-three guy with a sharp wit, and Zephyr, an avid outdoorsman who shared encyclopedic knowledge about nature with us. What could go wrong? The first couple of days were filled with endless laughter and an unspoken bond that only close friends could muster. However, on the third day of our trip, the mood shifted in an inexplicable way. We all sensed something odd in the air but chose to keep it to ourselves in order not to ruin the good time we'd been having. That night around the fire, Zephyr brought up his family's encounters with an unknown creature that had terrified local communities for generations. All this chimed in with similar stories his parents would share about a horrific beast roaming the countryside at night. I felt goosebumps rise along my arms as they recounted these chilling stories. There was something unsettling about how each account seemed so unsettlingly familiar. As morning broke on our final day at camp, we were hastily packing up when I noticed strange tracks near our site large indents in the mud that couldn't have been made by any animal we knew of. They snaked along the ground towards a heavily wooded area adjacent to our clearing. Determined to find out what was responsible for those mysterious marks on the ground, we followed them into the forest. The deeper we walked into those woods, the more an ominous sense of dread crept into our guts. But we pushed forward, driven by a morbid curiosity we couldn't resist. Gradually, 
we started to come across bizarre signs that something vile was afoot. We found the carcass of a mangled deer spread across several trees, its blood-stained antlers impaled deep into the bark. As if things weren't strange enough, we stumbled upon what appeared to be a small clearing filled with peculiar markings on the ground and twisted figures crafted from sticks and stones. As night began to take hold, we knew we had to resume our search in the morning. While trying to catch some sleep, I heard labored breathing just outside our tents. I could feel my pulse racing as my mind played through every horrendous scenario possible. As I slowly opened my tent flap, bracing for whatever lurked on the other side, I was immediately confronted with a monstrous figure standing eight feet tall, covered in matted fur. My heart stopped. Its red eyes seemed to pierce through me as it snarled viciously. Without thinking, I screamed and scrambled backward into my tent as Aldous and Zephyr sprung awake. What's happening? They shouted in unison as they caught sight of the monstrosity looming over us. It let out a gut-wrenching howl that shook the earth beneath us. In an instant, Zephyr tossed his knife towards its pallid face, which glistened with blood and pus while Aldous grabbed a burning log from our smoldering campfire, threatening the creature. The ferocious beast swiped at us, just grazing Zephyr's arm, before retreating back into the woods. An unholy screech pierced the air as it disappeared into darkness. We stood there, all three of us panting and shaken to the core by what had transpired. The following morning, we tried to piece together what happened. It wasn't until weeks later in a musty old library that we discovered that our attacker bore an uncanny resemblance to a terrifying creature spoken about only in whispers, the Skinwalker. Its origins? A mystery left unsolved to this day. Some say it's a shapeshifter, others believe it is an ancient curse and the rest think of it as merely an urban legend perpetuated by generations of fear. In the days that followed our harrowing encounter with the Skinwalker, we couldn't shake the feelings of dread and unease. Sleep became difficult as every sound in the night sent chills racing through our veins. We resolved to uncover more about the creature and find a way to put an end to its reign of terror. We spent those days researching and gathering intel on the Skinwalker from local sources, paying particular attention to its hunting patterns and victims. Throughout our investigation, we discovered that the beast seemed to avoid specific areas marked by intensely pungent scents of garlic and sulfur. It dawned on us. The Skinwalker had an aversion to these powerful smells. Feeling a renewed sense of hope, we decided to confront the creature once more, this time prepared with makeshift weapons and deterrents. With camping backpacks filled with garlic cloves, jars of sulfur, and forest honed spears tied with razor-sharp knives, we set out into the deep woods that used to be our haven. The sun began to set on the third day of our trek as we discovered another set of peculiar markings eerily similar to those at our previous campsite. Our hearts raced as we recognized this as a sign that we were getting close to the Skinwalker's lair. As daylight dwindled and darkness wrapped around us like a suffocating cloak, it wasn't long before a guttural growl resonated through the trees, sending shivers down our spines. The creature emerged from the shadows, its matted fur appeared slick with blood, and its red eyes burned with fury. As it lunged towards me, I quickly raised my spear and drove it into its gaping maw with all my might. The skinwalker reared back in pain and anger, shaking free from my spear's impalement. In that moment, Aldous hurled a lumpy sack filled with garlic bulbs directly at its grotesque face. The impact sent the creature spiraling into a frenzy, retreating with a blood-curdling shriek as the pungent smell of crushed garlic overwhelmed it. Seizing the opportunity, 
Zephyr tossed a handful of sulfur powder in its direction, creating a dense cloud that enveloped the beast. The skinwalker's agonized screams echoed through the night while it clawed at the air to escape, but to no avail. It was blinded and incapacitated by our well-timed attack. Our adrenaline pumping, we scrambled back to our campsite, clutching our makeshift weapons tightly. We hastily packed up and exited those cursed woods as fast as our legs could carry us. Although we could still hear its wails fading behind us deep into the night, I believe that for now we have inflicted enough damage to deter it from tormenting others in its vicinity any time soon. Consequently, many campers claim that they noticed a decrease in strange occurrences in the Loda woods after that night. We could have gone to law enforcement with our story and proof that something sinister lurked in those woods. However, we were met with mocking laughter and scoffs of disbelief when we tried. That's when we realized whatever happened that night would be ours to bear alone. These events have left an indelible mark on each of us. I sought solace by surrounding myself with pungent herbs and minerals at home, converting my once quiet abode into a fortress against any possible dark encounter for years to come. But sometimes, when I close my eyes at night, I see those burning red eyes staring back at me, haunting my dreams, and reminding me that despite appeasing it for a time, it's still out there. And so we live our lives every day, aware of the unknown monsters lurking just beyond our sight, creatures who elude capture and death itself. But we refuse to give in to fear, and instead, we steel ourselves and hold on to the hope that one day we'll find a way to rid the world of the skinwalker for good. Until then, this is our burden to carry, a tale that will likely follow us all our days. My name is Viridian Mascardo, and I've always considered myself a bit of a cynic. I tend to find logical explanations for everything, even events that some might consider inexplicable. That's why I never thought I would experience something so bizarre that it would leave me questioning my own reality. It all began during summer vacation on July 19, 2012. My friends Castalia Ambers and Kaylin Bevan had rented a secluded cabin near the Bridger Teton National Forest in Wyoming. The three of us wanted to take a break from city life, relax, and enjoy each other's company before we had to return to our busy lives. When we arrived at the cabin, it looked like something straight out of a movie. It was surrounded by towering trees with no visible neighbors for miles. We took advantage of the solitude and spent our days hiking and exploring the stunning landscape around us. Despite my general skepticism, I quickly began noticing strange occurrences surrounding our stay. Animal carcasses would appear on the doorstep each morning, torn open and mutilated beyond recognition. It was unnerving, but we assumed that some wild animal was just making its presence known, attempting to scare off the intruders on its territory. On one particular evening, Castalia, Kalen, and I were sitting outside around a campfire when we heard rustling in the tree line behind our cabin. All three of us turned toward the sound, tense with anticipation as fear clawed at our hearts. Out of nowhere, a grotesque figure emerged from the shadows, barely human in appearance with towering limbs covered in fur and elongated claws extending from its hands. Petrified, we could only stare as it dragged a lifeless deer carcass across the ground towards us. Its eyes glowed an unnatural yellow, which only added to the terror that gripped us as it approached. It stopped just short of our campfire and began to feast upon the deer, ripping flesh from bone with astonishing force. I glanced over to see Kaelin and Castalia, 
pale with abject horror in their eyes, unable to move. I felt something within me snap, an instinct to survive. I grabbed them both by the arms, and as quietly as we could, we slipped away from the campfire and towards the cabin. As we reached the cabin door and silently closed it behind us, we knew we were safe for the moment. My heart pounded in my chest as I tried to make sense of the gruesome creature we had just witnessed. Was it a bear? A wolf? Nothing seemed plausible, given its monstrous appearance and ungodly strength. Castalia started searching through old newspapers that the cabin owner had left for fire kindling and stumbled upon an article from a few years back that mentioned local legends about a shape-shifting creature referred to as a skinwalker. The article described it as a malicious being that tormented whoever entered its territory. Despite my usual skepticism, there was no denying that whatever we had seen fit the description in the newspaper. Our reality was shattered even more as we concluded it might indeed be a creature out of folklore. Several tense nights passed as we barricaded ourselves in the cabin, but our luck ran out when Castalia went outside to grab some firewood, believing that the creature had finally moved on from terrorizing us. With Castalia out gathering firewood, I knew we couldn't risk leaving her alone any longer. I grabbed a heavy camping hatchet, and Kaelin opted for a large hunting knife. We stepped cautiously outside the cabin, weapons in hand, ready to face the creature we now believed to be a skinwalker. The sun was setting fast behind the dense tree lean, casting long shadows that seemed to dance along the forest floor. It was 7.19 p.m. when we finally found Castalia kneeling near a stack of firewood. Pale with fear, she stared at something just beyond the trees. Guys, it's back, she whispered. I felt my heart pounding in my throat as I noticed the creature slowly emerge from between two huge pines. Standing well over eight feet tall, it resembled a twisted version of a wolf or bear, but with elongated limbs and human-like hands ending in menacing claws. Its dark fur was matted with blood from its past kills, while a putrid stench of decay surrounded it like a noxious cloud. We knew that we had only one choice, fight back with everything we had. The three of us readied our weapons as the skinwalker approached, snarling ferociously and unafraid. Kaelin charged first, swinging the hunting knife furiously at its torso only to be knocked backward by the force of its massive hand. Castalia lunged next with a swift jab to its legs, using her Swiss army knife, in an attempt to weaken it. As it reeled from her surprisingly successful strike, I took my chance and swung my hatchet toward its head with every ounce of strength I could muster. The skinwalker shrieked in pain as the handle crashed against its skull, releasing an ear-piercing sound that echoed through the air. It stumbled away from us momentarily, but soon regained its balance and lunged forward again. Now enraged and desperate, the creature swung its massive fists and swiped its claws at us with terrifying force. We dodged, barely escaping each swipe with mere inches to spare. Realizing that we couldn't defeat it on our own, I had an idea. The creature seemed vulnerable to fire, given that it had lurked in the shadows away from the campfire days earlier. It was already 7.52 p.m., darkness was falling fast, and time was running out. With adrenaline pumping through our veins, we made a break for the campfire pit outside our cabin. Kaelin, throw whatever you can find into the fire. We need it as big as possible, I ordered as we sprinted across the dwindling light. Kaelin frantically grabbed logs, pine cones, and dried leaves, creating a towering inferno that illuminated the night in a warm orange glow. Within seconds, we succeeded in creating an impenetrable barrier of flames around us. 
The beast approached cautiously but halted at the sight of the flames, its yellow eyes narrowing with anger. It paced around us, trying to find a way through without scalding itself but failing each time. I locked eyes with Castalia and Kaelin as we stood, panting and victorious, on the other side of our makeshift fire barrier. But one question remained. How would we leave this place without unleashing the wrath of this supposed skinwalker, who now seemed set on revenge? As if in answer to my unspoken question, through the dense forest emerged park rangers, attracted by plumes of smoke rising into the night sky from our roaring fire. The creature recoiled from their presence and fled back into the shadows from where it came. We wasted no time in explaining to them what had transpired, leaving out any supernatural elements so as not to be seen as insane, and arranging for immediate police assistance. In a short span of time, our once serene wilderness retreat had turned into a crime scene. Armed officers combed the area for the creature, unable to find any trace of it. Though we never encountered the skinwalker again, it would forever remain an open case. Days later, at 10.48 a.m., when it was all over and we boarded a plane back home, we couldn't stop thinking about our harrowing escape. On that silent flight home, bound by the memory of what we had faced together, an unexplained terror straight out of folklore, I came to realize that sometimes there are things in this world that defy logic and reason. I've always had a fascination with urban exploration, venturing into abandoned buildings and exploring the relics within. My name is Xander Quintrell, and I was born and raised in a small town in Wyoming. One day, my friend Milo Gauntlet and I decided to explore an old, abandoned house on the outskirts of town. We heard strange stories about its mysterious past but chalked them up to gossip. For our adventure, we made sure we were prepared, flashlights, extra batteries, snacks, and everything possible to make this experience one for the books. On August 7, 2009, around 5 p.m., we set off towards the old house. The property was vast and dilapidated. There was a strange tension in the air as we walked toward the decaying building. Its once vibrant appearance now has peeling paint and broken windows, which gave us an eerie feeling that was difficult to shake. We started making jokes to ease our tension. Maybe we'll find some homeless ghosts living here. Milo chuckled nervously. We stepped inside through the broken front door. Darkness swallowed the hallway like it hadn't seen light in ages. The floorboards creaked with every step and even the smell of stale air and mold filled our senses. As we ventured further into the house, room by room, we found remnants of furniture and trinkets left behind by forgotten lives. Despite our initial unease, we began to relax a bit within the musty confines of this abandoned palace, laughing at bizarre knickknacks or quirky wallpaper patterns found buried beneath layers of dirt and grime. But as we looked around more closely, I came across something off-putting, an odd-looking claw-like bone structure hidden under thick cobwebs at one corner of an empty fireplace mantle. Hey Milo, I called across the room, where he just opened a rusty closet door. You've got to see this, some animal must have called this place home at some point. Milo joined me, chuckling at the sight and saying, that's one crazy pet to keep around. Our fascination with this bizarre find quickly turned to an unsettling feeling as we noticed more oddities throughout the house. We stumbled upon rooms where furniture violently toppled over and scratch marks scraped deep into the floorboards. 
What kind of creature could have done all of this? I muttered, my skepticism now wavering. I wish I hadn't voiced the question because it seemed reality tangled our nerves tighter as if responding in kind. The air seemed to grow colder and thicker, even heavy breathing became burdensome. We couldn't shake a feeling that something was watching us intently, maliciously. We knew it was time to leave when we found what looked like the dark, mangled corpse of a deer lying in a spare bedroom. It was covered in scratches and scorch marks. Whatever had mutilated the poor creature showed no mercy. Despite my innate curiosity for deciphering cryptic enigmas, Milo and I now both agree that some mysteries are better left unsolved. It was then, as we turned to flee from this unspoken terror that loomed in the house, that we got our first glimpse of the unseen antagonist the stuff of nightmares, twisted horns atop its grotesque visage, glaring hungrily through the darkness with eyes burning like embers against our frightened souls. As the monstrous figure emerged from the shadows, Milo and I froze in terror. Its twisted, horn head stood tall, while its muscular, beast-like body stood on two legs. Its shimmering, Scaly skin had an unnatural metallic undertone, and its foul breath filled the air with a sulfuric stench. The creature's eyes, glowing like molten lava, zeroed in on us. At that moment, our survival instincts kicked in. Racing from the bedroom, we scrambled down the stairs and toward the front door, where our escape awaited. The creature let out a guttural roar and began to chase us. Hearing its teeth snap behind us only pushed our adrenaline higher. Just as we exited the front door and felt a sense of relief wash over us, I realized I dropped my flashlight inside. Without it, navigating our way back through the dense forest would be impossible. Ignoring Milo's protests and subduing my own fear, I rushed back into the house to retrieve it. As I reached for the flashlight near the base of the stairs, I glimpsed something attached to a wall nook, one of those ancient animal traps with metal jaws meant for catching coyotes or bears. It was rusty and looked like it had been there for years, but desperation made me grab it anyway. With my heart pounding in my chest, I rejoined Milo outside just as the beast lunged towards him. Thankfully, it missed its mark, as he nimbly dodged its attack by diving out of its path at the last moment. Angered by its failed attempt to catch him, the monster turned its attention back to me. Brandishing the trap like a weapon, I stared into those fiery eyes and held my ground. To my disbelief and sheer relief, it seemed to work. It hesitated in its advance, as though trying to gauge what this strange human had picked up. Go! I yelled, shooing it away with the trap like I would a stray dog. The creature lunged at me, swiping its long, vicious claws near my face but impossibly missing me entirely. This gave Milo the chance to scan the area and find two thick branches nearby. You okay? He called out as he tossed one towards me. Never better. I replied with a strange, shaky voice as I grabbed the branch. Together, we charged at the creature, swinging our makeshift clubs with all our might. The beast seemed caught off guard by our sudden bravery and clearly did not expect prey to fight back. We managed to land a few solid blows, but it wasn't enough to defeat the monster. The beast roared, releasing a torrent of hot air that smelled of decaying flesh and sulfur. Throwing us off balance momentarily, it seized the opportunity to slip back into the darkness from which it came. Covered in bruises and scrapes, Milo and I stared at each other in disbelief. We had just survived an encounter with something that could have torn us apart. Wasting no more time, we fled from that wretched house with each shallow breath, 
amplifying our fear of what could lurk in every shadow around us. The moonless night was horrendous, a constant reminder of our terrifying brush with death. Once we finally made it back to town alive, we couldn't stop talking about how close we'd come to meeting our end. Nobody believed us when we told them what had happened at the old house, with good reason, but we knew the truth about what had taken place there. In the days that followed, Milo and I grew closer than ever due to our shared experience, even as unease crawled into every corner of our lives, haunted by the memory of those fiery eyes staring at us from the darkness in that forsaken home. We never dared go near that house again, certain that if we encountered the twisted creature once more, we might not be so lucky to escape with our lives. As much as whatever was in that house remained a terrifying mystery, the one certainty that emerged was the unspoken bond and trust it had built between Milo and me. Where most friendships would have buckled under such duress, ours appeared to solidify even further. And although the events of that harrowing evening will torment our nightmares forever, at least we share that burden together. I've always been enamored with the peculiar as a collector of oddities and strange tales. It was 7.29 p.m. on February 16, 2009, when my obsession led me to an obscure village halfway between Idaho and Montana called Shadow Creek. Locals were hospitable yet guarded about the area, each carrying an unspoken secret. For an outsider like myself, it was equal parts mesmerizing and unsettling. My name is Lyndon Esterhazy and being part of a long line of globe-trotting adventure seekers meant that I never shied away from exploring the unknown. My current quest in Shadow Creek remained vague and unspoken until I met Sky Pemberton, the owner of a local bar named the Moonlit Hair. She was an older woman with silver hair and knowing gray eyes who seemed to possess an air of understanding about my reasons for visiting. Looks like you've come looking for something you can't quite put your finger on. She mused as I sat at the bar sipping whiskey. Shadow Creek is known for things that tend to reside beyond an average person's imagination. Intrigued by the subtle invitation Sky offered for me to pry further, we started exchanging stories about unusual creatures and myths we had encountered during each of our respective travels. Eventually, Sky opened up about the sinister secret plaguing Shadow Creek's residents. Years ago, she began hesitantly, there were reports of an enigmatic beast lurking around these parts, a distinctive creature that looked like a mix between a huge coyote and a wolf. Her voice shook as she continued. It would torment people in their homes at night with howls that didn't sound quite human often leaving large paw prints on their doorsteps. We sat quietly for several moments before Sky stood up suddenly and motioned for me to follow her out the back door of the bar. As we stood in the shadows, she handed me a flashlight and whispered that she had received word earlier that day about the beast being seen skulking along the edge of the village. My pulse quickened with anticipation. Sky led me through a thick forest, where we eventually emerged on a cliff overlooking Shadow Creek. We surveyed the area carefully, looking for any signs of this elusive creature that had evaded capture for years. Sky showed me how to determine natural tracks from those attributed to the beast, eerie and misshapen as they were. As the moon climbed higher in the sky and we continued our search, my adrenaline began to surge. Suddenly, Sky stopped in her tracks and cautiously pointed to a set of distinct prints leading towards the abandoned quarry nearby. The prints appeared freshly made, as if an immense creature were near, 
evading our watchful gazes by mere moments. As I inspected one of the carnivalesque tracks more closely, I felt an ominous growl reverberate through the air while Skye's eyes widened in terror. Up there! She screamed as I snapped my head up, just in time to catch a glimpse of an abhorrent figure disappearing into darkness. The sounds of trees snapping echoed through the night as we gave chase, desperate yet terrified to see this creature more clearly. We reached a clearing near the edge of a cliff when, all at once, the music of our heartbeats pounding wildly drowned out by ghastly snarls, we suddenly froze. Before us loomed the unspeakable visage of every nightmare made flesh, standing at well over six feet tall, its mottled fur dripped with viscera. Its yellow eyes glinted malevolently as it now faced us, eerily human-like paws bearing sharpened claws slick with blood from its last grisly meal. I stared into the gaping maw of the hellish beast, its fangs stained red with fresh blood from its recent carnage, the source of which was still unknown. Sky and I lurched backward in unison, nearly stumbling off the cliff as adrenaline pumped through us. The ground shook as the monstrous creature barged down on us. Run! Sky screamed, her voice filled with urgency. We bolted back into the forest at 11.33 p.m. Every nerve in our bodies heightened as we scrambled to avoid an inevitable death. What do I do? I don't know anything about killing these things. I panted breathlessly. Neither do I, Sky replied hoarsely. But right now, we need to survive. Worry about killing it later. As we sprinted through the woods at breakneck speed, Sky pointed out a concealed box nestled between two bushes, an emergency supply box for woodland emergencies. It was 11.47 p.m. when we opened it to find a flare gun and several climbing ropes inside. Not ideal weapons against a supernatural monster, but they would have to do. I brandished the flare gun while Sky tied one end of a rope into a makeshift lasso. We spread out to flank the creature, purposely making noise so it couldn't predict our movements. As expected, it fixed on me, likely because I held the weapon that had a higher chance of actually hurting it. Its ferocious yellow eyes locked onto mine, lips curling back in a vicious snarl as it launched itself at me. At precisely 12.01 a.m., as it hurtled toward me, I fired a shot directly into its growling throat, and with a hideous screech, it stumbled backward just as Sky tossed her makeshift lasso around its flailing limbs. The flare didn't kill the beast, but it provided a temporary distraction and likely caused some damage. The creature thrashed violently, attempting to break free from the ropes and snaring it. Sky looked at me, her eyes wild with shock and terror. This isn't going to hold it for long. We need to run. Reluctantly acknowledging that our makeshift weapons would ultimately be futile, we fled the scene and made our way back to the moonlit hair, our hearts pounding as we glanced anxiously over our shoulders. It was 12.17 a.m. when we burst through the door, knowing that although we temporarily subdued the beast, this was far from over. Catching our breaths inside the bar, I studied Sky. We managed to hurt it but couldn't kill it. Now what? She sighed resignedly. We protect ourselves and our community as best we can and continue searching for a solution. As the days went by, Shadow Creek's residents banded together placing traps and deterrents around town while seeking more substantial information on how to rid themselves of this monstrous plight once and for all. Mournfully, the village began discovering victims of the wolf-like abomination, dismembered bodies beyond recognition, as they ventured cautiously into areas once deemed safe havens. 
Although only a few days had elapsed since my involvement in the fight against this nightmarish creature, I couldn't help but acknowledge a strange sense of unity within Shadow Creek's population. Despite their losses, their resilience remained strong. It was as if my return had reignited not only my own conviction in facing these horrors but theirs as well. In time, perhaps a method would reveal itself, one that could finally eradicate the heart-chilling fear of living in near-constant despair as vicious attacks ambush their once secluded village. Until then, I resolved to work alongside Sky and others in Shadow Creek who refused to abandon hope. Together, we swore that no matter how long it took or how harrowing the journey, we would face this looming darkness with the strength of our unity. It wouldn't devour us, not as long as we could stand together against it. It was a peculiar turn of events that led me to stumble upon the chilling tale I'm about to share. My name is Zephyrinus Durant, and my journey began on Saturday, October 13, 1990. Unbeknownst to me at the time, this adventure would forever change my perception of the world we think we know so well. Growing up in Solomon's Rest, a quaint little town nestled deep within the Appalachian Mountains of West Virginia. I always had a profound fascination with curious tales and unsolved mysteries. However, it wasn't until I became acquainted with a couple of fellow adventurous souls, Eustathius Boone and Olympia Rudge, that our collective curiosity led us down a dark path filled with terror and mystique. One fateful evening, as we sat in Eustathius's dingy apartment, sipping cheap beer and engaging in idle banter, Olympia mentioned an eerie rumor circling around town. Hushed whispers detailed an entity stalking the nearby woods, an unknown inhabitant that had claimed the lives of several unfortunate souls who dared to venture too far into the thickets. Being avid fans of peculiar mysteries ourselves, we agreed to suspend our disbelief just long enough to launch an ill-advised investigation into this alleged woodland terror. Armed with crude maps, flimsy flashlights, and only a modicum of courage, we embarked on what we thought would be another run-of-the-mill escapade that would eventually lead us nowhere. As we trudged down dusty roads and got lost in misty forests overgrown with treacherous vines, we gradually realized we might have unleashed something far more sinister than any mundane legend. Pungent odors burned our nostrils as unnatural howls echoed throughout the moonlit night. Our endeavors culminated when we stumbled upon a gruesome scene amidst a clearing, entrails scattered carelessly across damp earth, surrounded by scraps of clothing that once belonged to living, breathing beings. It was then that we caught a glimpse of the monster responsible for this horrific act of violence. A grotesque abomination, vaguely human yet twisted and gnarled with matted fur and leathery skin. Its eyes glowed with the intensity of a thousand suns, piercing into our very souls as it let out a guttural snarl that would haunt me till the end of my days. We stood rooted to our spots, paralyzed with fear as the beast approached us at an alarming speed. Eustathius, regaining his senses first, fired a shot from his pistol, causing the creature to flinch. Seizing this brief window of opportunity, Olympia and I joined Eustathius in making a hasty retreat from those unforgiving woods. As we fled breathlessly towards civilization, I couldn't help but feel that a darkness had descended upon Solomon's rest, one that could inhabit any person regardless of age or gender. The creature's true identity remained hidden behind layers of deception and falsified stories told to lull us into a sense of security. We didn't waste any time. We reported our findings to the local authorities 
handing over the scraps of clothing we'd discovered and telling them about the creature we encountered. Their initial skepticism was evident, but Detective Archibald Voorhees seemed more open-minded than the others. He even encouraged us to continue our search for clues while they carried out their investigation. Eustathius, Olympia, and I spent hours researching possible explanations, from local folklore to obscure science experiments gone awry. Having already faced the creature ourselves, we refused to accept any mundane explanations. On Monday evening, October 15, 1990, we stumbled upon a lead that took us back into those damned woods, equipped with hunting rifles, bear traps, and makeshift body armor crafted from scrap metal. Our hearts raced as we traveled once more through that oppressive darkness, driven equally by determination and dread. Each noise made us jump, our senses heightened by fear. It was shortly after midnight when we finally came upon a cave entrance hidden within a dense thicket of overgrowth. What you thinks in there? Eustathius muttered. No idea, Olympia chimed in nervously. But we better find out before one of those poor bastards loses another family member. We cautiously entered the cave, our flashlight beams cutting through darkness so thick it seemed to swallow light itself. As we went deeper inside, we started noticing occasional bloodstains on the walls and floor every horrifying step acting as confirmation that this was indeed the creature's domain. The air grew colder and damper as we descended deeper into the cave. When what sounded like bones crunching echoed through the cavernous space ahead, our worst fears were realized. We weren't alone. In an area filled with mounds of decomposing bodies, jaws gaping in silent screams, Several similarly grotesque creatures feasted on human remains. The sight was revolting, and Olympia struggled to muffle a gag while Eustathius whispered harshly, There's more than one! As panic threatened to overwhelm us, stealing our nerves, we set the bear traps throughout the cave and cautiously retreated. Waiting several hours outside for any change in the creature's activities proved trying. They were far more clever and patient than we'd anticipated. It wasn't until early dusk on Tuesday, October 16th, that one of the creatures finally ventured out. Seizing this opportunity, we sprang into action and took aim. Our rounds hit it hard, wounding it severely. But before we could deal a killing blow, it managed to lunge back into the cave. Its pain, monstrous howls signaled that we managed to injure it gravely but elicited no further confrontation from the others inside. With our ammunition expended and time against us, we retreated from the woods to formulate a new strategy. Our tale didn't fall on deaf ears again. Archibald Voorhees convened an emergency meeting with local officials, who reluctantly agreed upon drastic action. A joint operation was planned between local law enforcement and forest rangers to seal off the cave entrance by detonating explosives at its mouth. We were forced to stand down as law enforcement took over. It wasn't easy stepping back. Our quest had become deeply personal. But remaining would have done nothing but endanger both them and ourselves further. The following day, October 17th, our town carried out its explosive assault on the nest of creatures deep within our woods. A series of earth-shattering detonations sent shockwaves through Solomon's Rest, marking both the end of those caverns and purging our home of those hellish abominations forever. But for Olympia, Eustathius, and me, dread crept alongside triumph in unison with peace. Eyewitnesses of incomprehensible horrors. We could never entirely quiet those nagging whispers that perhaps they'd survived. All we could do was return to our daily lives, a more vigilant routine in Solomon's rest. Every now and then, 
You're tempted to walk those eerie woods, aren't you? To corroborate our story, or even prove us wrong. But heed the warnings on the signs that barricade the forest entrance, and pay homage to the people who fought to keep those terrors at bay. Don't go searching for trouble, for in Solomon's rest, truth often proves far more chilling than fiction. It all began on June 7, 2018, in the small town of Ravello Basin, Colorado. I had always had a fascination with nature, ever since I was a child, and this stunning location offered the perfect backdrop for my regular hikes. My name is Azian Carmichael, and it was my close friend Creighton Burnell who first told me about the majestic trails woven through the vast pine forests that surrounded our quaint little town. As a pair of outdoor enthusiasts and adventure seekers, Creighton and I were always on the lookout for new hiking destinations. That fateful Thursday morning, I got a text from Creighton suggesting we tackle one of these exciting new trails he had found online. The trail was called Sacrifice Ridge, a forbidding name that somehow only added to its appeal for us. We agreed to meet at the entrance to the trailhead at around 2 p.m. Upon arriving, there was an odd silence that hung over the area as Creighton and I made our way into the forest, eerily quiet, as if nature itself was holding its breath. As we delved deeper into the heart of Sacrifice Ridge, we caught glimpses of oddly mutilated wildlife scattered around, unnerving, but not enough to deter two seasoned hikers like ourselves. Our conversation continued casually as we trekked further into this curious terrain. Along our journey, we encountered more dismembered remains of animals, some missing limbs or heads, others gruesomely torn open, their insides exposed, a horrific sight that sent a shiver down my spine even though I refused to show concern. Three hours into our hike, darkness began creeping in earlier than expected. The air felt heavy with tension, no doubt amplified by our gruesome discoveries along the path. Just when we decided it was best to return home, an unusual rustling sound caught our attention not far from where we stood. Hesitant yet curious, Creighton and I inched closer to the source of the noise. What we saw next made our blood run cold. A towering, dark figure hunched over yet another animal carcass. Its monstrous form seemed to defy logic, with its legs resembling those of a deer, and its limbs appearing more like sharpened branches than those of any recognizable creature. Its head snapped towards us, almost as if it sensed our presence. The beastly figure's glowing red eyes pierced the darkness as it shifted its stance. The grotesque and twisted creature is now very much aware of our existence. Without speaking a word, Creighton and I instinctively knew it was time to flee. Adrenaline surged through our veins as we rushed back down the trail the bone-chilling howls and snarls echoing behind us as the unfathomable monstrosity continued its pursuit. Our breasts were ragged, our hearts hammering in our chests as we sprinted through the ever-darkening forest terrain. The air had become suffocating with fear and dread, with every rustle of leaves and snapping of twigs further fueling our panic. I dared a quick glance behind me just in time to witness that horrifying creature leaping towards Creighton, its clawed hands aimed at his throat. His desperate scream split the night air but was quickly silenced by the gut-wrenching sound of tearing flesh. As Creighton's screams echoed through the forest, I scrambled for any sort of weapon to use against the monstrosity that now turned its attention towards me. In my frenzy, I found a thick branch and hastily broke it off from a nearby tree. 
My heart pounded in time with the creature's approaching footsteps, its sandpaper-like skin barely visible through the darkness. Go to hell! I screamed, wildly swinging the branch and managing to connect with one of its sharp limbs. There was a sickening crunch, and a guttural screech erupted from the creature. It staggered back, clearly injured but not defeated. With my makeshift weapon in hand, I raced towards Creighton's lifeless body. Blood poured from his torn throat, drenching the ground beneath him. His eyes stared blankly into mine as I attempted to drag him away from that hellish place. Every inch of my soul was doused in despair as I struggled to keep moving. At 6.45 p.m. on June 7th, we managed to make it back to Sacrifice Ridge's entrance, a task that took every ounce of strength I had left in me. Gasping for breath and covered in blood, sweat, and tears, I stumbled out of the forest's suffocating grasp, knowing that relief would be short-lived. The following day was filled with police sirens and desperate questions. Hours were spent recounting our harrowing experience on Sacrifice Ridge Trail as investigators feverishly recorded every detail they could get. One thing is certain, said Detective Harris after reviewing my testimony. We have an unknown predator on our hands, something we've never encountered before. The fear was clear in his eyes. June 9th saw an eager swarm of media descend upon Ravello Basin, their morbid curiosity being their only ticket out of obscurity. Reporters fixated on the details of Creighton's gruesome demise, weaving wild tales and ignoring the fact that my friend had been extinguished at the hands of a horrifying beast. Every new headline made it painfully clear that there would be no respite for us in Ravello Basin. Both I and Creighton's family would have to put up with constant scrutiny while still suffering from the effects of our loss. Living through this nightmare had unleashed a need for revenge on the creature responsible, a force that threatened to engulf me. Over the next few days, I reached out to others who claimed they had also encountered what we now called the Ravello Abomination. Together, we formed a tight-knit group hell-bent on ensuring no one else would suffer Creighton's fate. We devoted every waking hour to studying the creature, its habits, and behaviors, anything that might help bring it down. June 12th crept upon us faster than we could comprehend. Time seemed to march out of step with the rest of the world. We came up with a plan to trap and immobilize our terrifying foe deep inside an abandoned mining shaft, thereby forever sealing our own monstrous creation. The atmosphere in Ravello Basin had never been more tense. Fear hung heavy in the air as two separate worlds watched with bated breath for what was about to unfold. In retrospect, my fight against the Ravello abomination could have only ever ended in failure. Despite unleashing everything we had at our disposal, what followed was nothing short of a bloodbath. June 13 saw me emerge from the forest's sinister embrace for the last time. Hollow-eyed and shivering from fear, I stumbled into town bearing an unimaginable weight on my shoulders. My friends were gone, torn apart by jagged claws and voracious hunger. The monster remained at large, alive and all too aware of the challenge it had conquered. Rivello Basin was a ghost town. Its remaining inhabitants were left to live in the shadow of the beast that stalked them. That was the last I saw of my childhood home. These events doomed me to a life of nocturnal terror where no sleep would come undisturbed. If there is one thing I've learned from that tragedy, it's this. When faced with pure evil, sometimes all you can do is bear witness and flee, lest you become the prey yourself. It was a day like any other, 
but it was far from ordinary. Cobalt skies faded into soft purples and peaches as the sun dipped below the horizon. That's when my evening took a sharp turn that I could never have anticipated. Anastasius Hardy, a longtime friend and colleague of mine, had asked if I would accompany him to an isolated cabin in the woods to gather forgotten items he had left during his work retreat last month. In his haste to leave, he had left behind quite a few essential documents needed for an upcoming meeting. The cabin was located deep in the heart of West Virginia, surrounded by dense forests and miles away from civilization. Neither of us felt that eerie feeling that clings to your bones before tragedy strikes. Instead, we were cracking jokes about how horrific this day might have been had Anastasius lost his pants instead. As we drove through the twists and turns of the back roads leading to his secluded cabin, we began to notice something strange. Alongside the road lay mutilated animals, their fates seemingly undetermined aside from the brutal carnage displayed before our horrified eyes. Rather than cower at this gruesome sight, Anastasius chuckled nervously and commented that perhaps someone dumped these poor creatures here after some failed taxidermy projects. We eventually reached our destination, with dusk casting an otherworldly glow on what would otherwise be a beautiful woodland setting. Grabbing our flashlights, we entered cautiously yet somewhat lightheartedly, joking about how glad we were that those strange animal carcasses hadn't followed us here. Shortly after entering, we discovered shredded scraps of clothing on the wood flooring that led out into the surrounding darkness. Afraid but curious by nature, we decided to investigate further, illuminating our way through the eerie night while cautioning each other not to stray too far from one side. That's when we encountered her, the first victim. Collapsing in sheer terror, Anastasius fought to absorb the grisly image before him. On the forest ground lay a young woman with piercing blue eyes, staring lifelessly into the vast unknown. Pinned to a nearby tree was her left arm, still attached by threads of skin, a barely fathomable rage had torn through this poor soul, as reflected in the carnage that painted the once pristine forest floor crimson. Panic-stricken and hyper-aware of our own vulnerability, we scrambled back into the safety of the cabin. As I fumbled to lock the door behind us, Anastasia let out a blood-curdling scream. In that brief moment of confusion, I stumbled back and found myself looking up at an unfathomable horror. The creature towering above me seemed almost human. Or rather, what happened when mankind and its worst nightmares combined to form an abomination beyond compare. It snarled with lips of decay and rotten teeth sharp enough to tear flesh in an instant. Its skeletal figure seemed haphazardly stitched together from different beings human legs sporting the claws of wolves and arms adorned with razor-sharp talons. With adrenaline coursing through my veins like wildfire, I had only one thought, survive. And so began our game of cat and mouse, with this monstrosity clashing against all odds to claim our lives. The minutes dragged on while adrenaline sustained our desperate flight through the darkness. As we raced further into the dense forest, away from what dreadful fate awaited us within that wretched cabin, I couldn't help but wonder how many nights such terrifying encounters unfolded around innocent souls, perhaps even now. Anastasius and I had escaped from the grasp of that horrendous creature, but only for the time being. Our minds were racing, analyzing every detail that led up to this moment. The mutilated animals, Anastasia's work retreat, the torn clothes, could there be a connection? Gathering our courage and determination, we decided that we needed to confront this monster before it terrorized anyone else. It was 10.30 p.m. when we stumbled upon a small shed on the property. Hidden away, 
and likely not something Anastasius had been aware of during his work retreat. Perhaps this was where the monstrous antagonist originated. With our eyes wide open and hearts pounding in fear, we entered carefully. Inside, we found what looked like an experiment gone wrong. Cages with remnants of various animals, rabbits, birds, even wolves, alongside scattered chemicals and laboratory equipment throughout the space. Suddenly, it clicked. Someone had been attempting to create a living nightmare from the remains of these creatures. We came to the conclusion that this nightmare creation had most likely been the result of a particular drug cocktail after carefully examining the chemical table and notes. Our eyes locked together on an almost empty syringe labeled GVM4. If we could only find an antidote, or some way to neutralize this substance in its bloodstream. At 11.15 p.m., after searching through every shelf and drawer of that vile laboratory, we finally found Hope, GVM4N, which seemed to be designed as a counteractive solution specifically for GVM4. Filling two syringes with GVM4N, our faces contorted with renewed determination and purpose. We ventured back into the forest towards the creature's last known location, armed with little more than our makeshift antidotes and a terrifying knowledge of our enemy. At precisely midnight, we found fresh tracks leading us deeper into the woods, and we knew it was near. 11.45 p.m. The horrifying sound of raspy breathing and gnashing teeth met our ears. We spotted the ghastly beast lurking among the shadows, waiting to pounce on its next victim. As it leaped forward to attack us, I managed to plunge the syringe into its monstrous leg, while Anastasius tried to avoid being maimed by its razor-sharp talons. Time seemed to slow down as we watched the creature's agonizing reaction to the GVM4N. Bones cracked and twisted unnaturally, flesh undulating as if trying to expel it from within. Then, before our astonished eyes, the monster began shedding its repulsive features one by one, slowly regressing into a familiar human-like form. It was Edmund Cross a disgraced researcher Anastasius had mentioned from his work retreat who had been fired for his questionable experiments. As he lay groaning on the damp forest floor, his agony was clear but not enough to warrant sympathy after the horrors he had caused. Although we wished more than anything to leave Edmund to his fate, we couldn't risk allowing this horror story to continue. Hands bound tightly with rope, we escorted him back to civilization and turned him over to the authorities. As for GVM-4 and GVM-4N, they were left behind in that forsaken laboratory, never again to unleash their terrifying effects on humanity. The following week, still reeling from our harrowing experience, I contacted wildlife conservation organizations in hopes of preventing such cruel experiments in the future. It's a small consolation given all that transpired, but it's a step forward in ensuring these horrors stay buried deep among those dark West Virginia woods. I stood at the edge of Raycliffe Park in Yumont, Alabama completely dumbfounded as I examined the peculiar symbols etched into a group of trees where my eyes had caught a brief, unusual movement. A few days before, on March 17, 2010, to be exact, I'd received an anonymous tip about this place. Something about it just captured my interest. It seemed like just another Tuesday afternoon. Little did I know how wrong that assumption was. My name is Elwyn Braxton, a local blogger and amateur investigator of strange occurrences around town. 
Today was merely another chapter in my quest to unearth reality from the scattered rumors and legends that plagued Yumut. With my trusty camera in hand, I ventured deeper into what appeared to be a forgotten corner of Wycliffe Park. As I examined the peculiar markings on the tree trunks further, a chill swept through my body despite the afternoon sun warming my neck. The trees around me seemed to collectively shudder in response to an unseen force. That's when an unmistakable smell hit me, coppery and acrid. It was unmistakably blood. Frantically looking around, I spotted a mutilated animal carcass not far away. My heart raced as I slowly approached the gut-wrenching scene. There were deep gashes running along its body and several organs strewn about. Something had ripped this poor creature apart with frightening force and savage precision. With a mix of terror and morbid curiosity, I snapped some photos for later examination while silently praying the entity responsible wouldn't find me next. The creepiest part of it all was how none of these brutal acts fit the pattern of any known predator in Yumont or surrounding areas. Furthermore, Gossip started circulating among townspeople about strange laughter echoing through Raycliffe Park late at night and treacherous growling whispers carried by the wind. Each torn apart animal carcass fueled these chilling tales, spreading a sense of dread across our community. Unsettled but committed to unveiling the truth, I began connecting with locals who had encountered these occurrences firsthand. From their stories of terrifying encounters and gut-wrenching descriptions, a frightening image started painting itself in my mind, not just a man, but an otherworldly creature merged with human-like characteristics. Slim and agile, its eyes burned like embers in the dark, while its elongated limbs carried it effortlessly as it stalked its prey. As if the universe were conspiring against me, my initial curiosity transformed into a deadly obsession as I ventured deeper into Raycliffe Park night after night, searching for this elusive and monstrous being. Armed with my camera, a can of pepper spray, and a desperation to understand what I was dealing with before it could strike again, fear clouded my every thought. My search took me down murky trails and hidden groves and snared in spiderwebs, each step feeling more treacherous than the last. With each passing hour, the tree canopy swallowed the moonlit sky while twisted branches seemed to converge around me, confining me within an endless maze of darkness. Panic coursing through my veins left me feeling vulnerable, despite my arsenal. When I decided to leave Raycliffe Park that night, I heard rustling behind me. The malevolent sound grew louder as something lurched forward from deep within the shadows, reaching out to clutch my trembling body in grasps unimaginably cruel. Sensing impending doom enveloping every fiber of my being, I progressively choked any semblance of sanity from within me. Twisted laughter vibrated through the once quiet air. Suddenly and without warning, the rustling ceased and I found myself face to face with the nightmarish creature. Its twisted visage bore rows of jagged teeth, bloody from its recent kill. The creature's eyes glowed like dying embers, and I could see the hunger driving its every move. My instincts kicked in. I reached for the pepper spray and doused the creature in a barrage of chemicals. It recoiled, howling in pain, as I scrambled away from its grasping claws. With adrenaline fueling my escape, I ducked and dodged through the maze of trees, knowing that a single misstep could be my last. At 2.32 a.m. on March 21, 2010, I burst out of Raycliffe Park and into the town's main street. A group of late-night revelers stared at my disheveled appearance as I tried to catch my breath. Realizing that no one would believe me without proof, I steeled my nerves and decided to return to confront the creature. 
gathering a small group of local residents who possessed firearms and knew how to handle them. We returned to Raycliffe Park at 10.25 p.m. that same day. As we neared the area where I had encountered the beast, we stumbled upon another mutilated carcass. This time a deer ripped open gruesomely. Its limbs were scattered about in a frenzied pattern, clearly a testament to the creature's insatiable hunger. We split into two groups, hoping to corner the monstrous being before it could claim any more lives. My group went left while the others veered right when suddenly an eerie cry echoed through the park. Following its source, we found ourselves standing in front of an old shed at approximately 11.52 p.m. I could feel my heart hammering within my chest as we approached with bated breath. The door slipped open, each creak heightening our tension. Inside the shed, the creature sat hunched over another animal carcass, tearing it apart with its elongated claws and nightmarish teeth. It reacted immediately, unfurling its grotesque form to its full height and lunging at us in fury. Our group didn't hesitate. We fired our weapons in unison, slowing its advance momentarily but not enough to stop it entirely. I watched my neighbor John hit the ground, the creature's claws slashing through his arm like hot knives through butter. And then it happened. The creature made a fatal mistake. In its frenzied rage, it stepped into a bear trap that had been hidden beneath the thickets. The creature was immobilized but not killed. We stared at one another, realizing that we could never hope to kill something so sinister. I did what I had to do and documented everything on my camera. Its formidable size, jagged teeth, crimson eyes, gruesome wounds, and wicked power as a testament of truth. In the following days, we called in an unnamed government agency specializing in these types of creatures. With their arrival at Raycliffe Park, they captured it and took it away under immense secrecy. The town was told it was an escaped circus performer gone mad on a cocktail of drugs. That seemed easier to swallow than the horror that had truly unfolded. Yumont gradually returned to normalcy. However, those of us who had been there that fateful night would carry their memories as scars seared onto their souls for all eternity. To this day, I remain committed to uncovering the truths behind such creatures lurking in our world's darkest corners. My experiences were documented and shared anonymously online as a warning for others to tread lightly when venturing into uncharted territory, for what lurks within is sometimes far beyond human understanding or control. I've never been one to believe in folklore or myths, especially those that seemed less than credible. However, it all changed that one afternoon at Loggers Point, Oregon. My friends and I had decided to try our luck at a camping trip out in the heart of the dense pine forest. We were college students trying to unwind during a break from exams, looking for an escape from a semester's worth of stress. My name is Theodore Hawksbury, and this camping trip turned out to be more of a nightmare than the relaxing getaway we hoped it would be. Our group consisted of my best friend Soren McAllister, his girlfriend Delphine Torrance, and our mutual friend Ludovic Abrams, quite an eclectic bunch. We set off on a three-day hiking trail through what promised to be mesmerizing landscapes and unforgettable experiences. The beginning of our journey was fun and harmless. We cracked jokes, shared personal stories, and occasionally consumed one too many beers around the campfire. We didn't know what awaited us in those woods. On the second day of our trip, as we ventured deeper into the forest, we stumbled upon an unnerving sight, 
a large deer carcass that looked like it had been violently torn apart. The entrails were strewn across the ground in haphazard patterns, like some sick form of abstract art. Being skeptical individuals with no belief in superstitious tales, we attributed the scene's gore to a natural predator, perhaps a bear or mountain lion, and continued our hike with only mild unease. Toward dusk on our third day in the wilderness, while setting up camp by a picturesque lake reflecting the vermilion western sky, Soren made an interesting discovery. Multiple sets of oddly elongated human-like footprints surrounded our campsite. They appeared too large and distorted to belong to any regular person, almost abnormal, but none of us knew what could produce such prints. Night fell upon us, and the soothing sounds of the forest seemed to keep our fears in check. Delphine suggested we play a card game to pass the time. However, the game was short-lived as an unsettling symphony of distant growls and screeches pierced through the otherwise calm night. Soren, being bold and fearless, decided to venture out with a flashlight to investigate the source of the eerie sounds. The look in Ludovic's eyes mirrored my own feelings of dread, but we kept our concerns quiet so as not to worry Delphine. Time felt like an eternity as we waited for Soren's return, the silence interrupted only by the occasional rustle of leaves or crackle of twigs. Just when our anxiety had nearly reached its peak, Soren burst back into camp, his face a canvas of terror and disbelief. He recounted how he'd followed the sound to an eerily illuminated clearing where a creature with twisted limbs and a spine-chillingly distorted human expression feasted on something unidentifiable, though by his description, it seemed far too large to be anything logically found in these woods. Our skepticism was thrown out the window as fear took over. We hastily packed up our belongings abandoning plans for any further nights in this haunted forest. Ludovic took the lead with his hunting rifle firmly grasped, while the rest of us followed shakily behind. As we sprinted toward civilization, bone-chilling cries echoed from all directions, growing louder and more distinct with each passing moment. Branches cracked and snapped around us, casting sinister shadows on the forest floor that twisted into haunting humanoid forms. We dared not look back for one second as dread coursed through our veins. Whether by imagination or reality, it felt as if that grotesque entity was gaining on us. I couldn't shake the spine-tingling sensation of being watched, hunted, even by a creature that might as well have been lifted from the very depths of our darkest nightmares. The forest was no longer just an expanse of trees but had transformed into a labyrinth, ensnaring us in its sinister tendrils. Every step forward seemed to drag us further into the clutches of unimaginable terror. Was this creature the enigma of Logger's Point legends, the one they whispered about around campfires? Were we meant to be its next victims? It seemed impossible to escape our fear, and each scream and wail from this monstrosity only fueled our terror-ridden souls. Just as hope seemed futile, hope seemed to find its way back into our hearts. We'd been running for what felt like hours when Delphine suddenly stopped, pointing out a trail marker that we recognized. Guys, look! That's the marker from this morning. We're getting closer, she exclaimed. A wave of relief washed over us, but we knew that there was no time to lose. With the hope of escaping this nightmare situation, we moved as quickly as our worn-out bodies would allow. The eerie cries and snapping branches continued to haunt us as we made our way along the familiar path. Ludovic had his rifle at the ready, prepared to defend us from whatever abomination pursued us. I could see him scanning the area with determined focus, ensuring we stayed one step ahead of our hunter. 
As daylight began to break through the trees and spill over the forest floor, we took solace in knowing that we were finally within reach of safety. But just when we thought it was over, a gut-wrenching howl pierced through the silence, almost as if realizing that it was about to be defeated. The creature wasn't going down without a fight. It charged at us from behind with a speed and force that seemed superhuman, or even beyond it. Ludovic frantically tried to aim his rifle at the monstrous figure that threatened our lives. Guys, get behind me! He yelled as he took aim. With a swift pull of the trigger, Ludovic released a hail of bullets toward the creature, damaging its twisted limbs. It let out an otherworldly wail and violently flailed around before retreating back into the dense foliage. We didn't wait to see if it would return. Instead, we forged on with renewed determination until finally reaching our vehicle parked at Loggers Point Trailhead. After stowing our equipment and piling it into the SUV, Soren turned over the ignition with shaking hands. The engine roared to life, injecting hope back into our chests. As we sped away from the forest, we couldn't help but gaze back at the tree line. A sinister presence that resided there had tainted the once beautiful landscape. Soren finally broke the silence, his voice tense and trembling. We should have listened to the locals who warned us about hiking through that cursed forest, he admitted, letting out a forced laugh. But all things considered, at least we made it out alive. It's hard to wrap our minds around what happened that fateful night at Logger's Point. We've never spoken about it publicly or even between ourselves since that day. Whatever malicious creature resides in the depths of those woods remains free to roam, and we all find solace in never again venturing near that forsaken place. It just goes to show you that some stories, no matter how unbelievable they seem, are grounded in chilling reality, and cautionary tales woven from whispered legends may sometimes hold far more truth than fiction could have ever prepared us for. Ever since I moved to Johnsport, Louisiana, in 2010, I'd heard whispers about strange occurrences in the area. My name is Tarquin Stahl, a newcomer who took comfort in the mundane routines and small-town charm of the place. On February 2nd, at about 5.45 p.m., my world was flipped upside down. I was on my way back home after grabbing a beer with some buddies when I decided to take an alternate route that led through the woods. There was something alluring about the dense greenery that veiled whatever lay beyond its foliage. I'd walked this path before, but never after sunset. As the darkness rapidly enveloped the trees, my heart began to race involuntarily. Soon enough, I heard a rustling sound coming from somewhere behind me. I figured it must be an animal searching for food or something equally innocuous. But the rustling grew louder by the minute. A splitting sound filled the air, like branches being snapped with tremendous force. My friend Cordell had mentioned something eerie happening in these woods years ago, but back then I dismissed his claims as an exaggeration. Without warning, a grotesque figure lunged forward between two trees just ahead of us. It had long, twisted limbs and unnaturally glowing eyes, a vision so terrifying that no words can adequately describe it. Cordell and his brother Talon screamed while I stood frozen in terror. The creature leaped towards Talon, sinking its sharp claws into him and ripping flesh from bone with ease. Blood splattered everywhere as we could only watch in abject horror. Our minds failed to comprehend what was unfolding before us. It then turned its attention toward Cordell and me. We tried our best to outrun the monstrous being, 
but it seemed to possess supernatural speed. Our screams echoed through the forest as we fled desperately for our lives. The creature toyed with us, allowing us to get only slightly ahead before clawing the ground mere inches from our heels. With every breath, I could feel the creature's malevolent presence growing stronger and its foul scent overwhelming my senses. I knew I couldn't outrun it forever, but my adrenaline kept me pushing forward. Terror consumed my thoughts. As the beast closed in on Cordell, he tried to fire a wild shot at it with his concealed pistol. The bullet merely grazed its flank, but the force of it was enough to send the creature bolting away into the darkness. We didn't stop running until we reached the safety of our homes. The following day, we went to the authorities and recounted our harrowing tale. They listened half-heartedly and eventually dismissed it as a wild animal attack, despite my insistence that this was no ordinary beast. Days turned into weeks, and I continued sharing our story, finding solace in knowing others had experienced similar encounters. Unable to shake off the unease, I sought out information from locals about any strange occurrences connected to that route through the woods. Some shared stories of a creature known as Amituk, something neither man nor animal, but a malicious being fueled by darkness and spite. The more I learned about Amituk, the more compelled I felt to uncover its origin. What could push something so deadly and terrifying? Was there anything we could do to prevent future attacks? It seemed that no matter how much research I put into the matter or how many questions were answered, an infinite number of mysteries still remained unsolved, leaving me haunted by that night in John Sport's dense woods forevermore. Unable to shake the feeling of dread, I decided to take matters into my own hands. I contacted Cordell, and together we started researching Amituk and looking for a way to protect ourselves and our town from the beast's gruesome attacks. We spent hours looking through old newspaper articles and talking with local hunters, trying to gather as much information as possible. To our surprise, we found out about an experienced hunter named Terence who had encountered Amituk before and survived. We met with Terence on February 8th at 3.15 p.m. to learn more about the creature. He told us that Amatuk had some similarities with a werewolf, human-like but twisted and corrupted by dark forces. While it wasn't precisely a werewolf by definition, it shared the same vulnerability to silver. Heeding his advice, Cordell and I armed ourselves with silver-plated bullets for our firearms. We knew that conventional weapons wouldn't stop Amatuk like they would with an ordinary animal. Its supernatural nature required a more specialized approach. On February 10th, at 10.30 p.m., Cordell, Terence, and I ventured back into the woods where we first encountered the beast. Our hearts pounded in our chests like war drums as we cautiously walked along the shadowy path. After two nights of searching in vain, on February 12th at 11 p.m. sharp, we finally came face to face with Amatuk again. Its grotesquely elongated limbs were somehow even more twisted than before, and its eyes were glowing menacingly through the darkness of night. As it lunged toward us, we opened fire using our silver-plated ammunition. Each bullet that struck seemed to inflict genuine pain on Amatuk, causing it to let out horrifying shrieks that made the hairs on our necks stand on end. After an intense battle that felt like an eternity yet probably only lasted minutes, Amatuk realized it was losing and attempted to flee deeper into the woods. Wounded but not defeated, it left a trail of thick black blood as it managed to escape. We briefly followed the blood trail before deciding that we should regroup and plan our next move. We returned to Johnsport with a sense of accomplishment, proud that we had discovered the creature's weakness and managed to wound it. 
News spread quickly, and our attack seemed to work like a charm. Amatuk didn't show up for over four days. The townsfolk felt at ease once again. However, on February 17th, our momentary victory was cut short. At 1.16 a.m., screams echoed through the night as Amatuk reappeared, stronger and angrier than before. It rampaged through our town, brutally murdering two more people before vanishing into the shadows again. With our hearts heavy from this devastating turn of events, we realized what must be done. We had to follow Amatuk and hunt it down wherever it might slumber or recover during daylight hours. Obsessed with finding a way to rid our small town of its malevolent presence once and for all, Cordell, Terence, and I said goodbye to John Sport. Now, we travel along the Louisiana countryside together as hunters of nightmares, following trails of unspeakable terror left by Amatuk in search of vengeance. Time is of the essence because each day may bring more victims to this merciless beast. As I now recount my story in a dimly lit motel room where Cordell nurses his bullet wound, sustained during our last encounter with Amatuk, I hope that one day we'll succeed in putting an end to this seemingly unstoppable force of darkness. We'll never give up. After all, our nightmare has just begun. I had always been a thrill seeker constantly looking for the next adrenaline rush. So, when my buddy Remington Sutherland invited me to spend the weekend alone at his family's cabin in the remote Chiricahua Mountains of Arizona, I immediately agreed. This proved to be an experience beyond what I could have ever imagined. The cabin sat on a piece of land that had been passed down in the Sutherland family for generations. I took note of the details, wooden walls covered with eccentric trinkets and taxidermied animals, a crooked fireplace that barely held itself together, and an air of mystery that seemed to surround every corner. I sensed a fascinating history behind it, but I never expected what was around the corner. On our first night there, Remington and I were sharing drinks on the porch when we heard an unsettling sound echoing through the darkness. It was unlike any animal we'd ever encountered before, terrifying yet intriguing. The following day, we decided to investigate. Our exploration took us further into the dense forest surrounding the cabin. The light from our flashlights barely made it through the thick trees overhead as we stepped cautiously over gnarled roots and muddy ground. We followed animal tracks that eventually led us to a grisly discovery, an eviscerated deer carcass strewn about in a small clearing. While examining this horrific scene, we noticed something in the distance, a tall figure covered in matted fur with unnaturally distorted limbs, that appeared to be watching us from behind a tree. Panic set in like ice water flooding our veins as we tried to remain calm. That night, we hardly slept, haunted by what we'd stumbled upon earlier that day. We consulted old documents in Remington's cabin, searching for any history of violent incidents or similar encounters with this unknown creature. With each hour passing by, our sense of security rapidly diminished as strange noises continued outside our cabin. We were convinced that this thing was stalking us, waiting for the perfect opportunity to strike. In the light of the weak fire, thoughts of escape consumed our minds. Approaching early morning, we bravely decided to leave the shelter of the cabin and try to make our way out of the forest. As we gathered our essentials, we shared nervous glances, suppressing the fear that threatened to overwhelm us. As we stepped into the enveloping darkness just outside the cabin, 
I had a primal instinct that whatever was stalking us in the shadows wouldn't let us leave without a fight. I clutched my knife tightly, hoping against hope that it would be enough. Remington, I think it's best if we stick together. I whispered as we began moving stealthily further away from the cabin. The unbearable silence enveloped us as we pressed on. Then suddenly it came. Blood-curdling screams erupted only a few yards away. Run! Remington screamed as we both began sprinting through the forest for our lives, every second filled with adrenaline and fear for what was hot on our heels. As our pace grew faster and our breathing heavier, the creature's shrieks grew louder and more persistent. Its presence felt dangerously close as if it were right behind us all the time. Follow me! Remington panted, veering off of the main path and onto a slippery, narrow trail through a tight cluster of trees. The fear of being trapped by this monstrous creature forced every step, promising unthinkable consequences if we slowed our pace. We need to lose it! Remington shouted over the entity's haunting cries and breaking branches. At 1.43 a.m., we stumbled onto a moonlit clearing with a natural rocky outcrop concealed by foliage. Up there! I pointed to the rocks above. We scrambled up through the foliage-covered rocks, using them to conceal ourselves from view. With arms protecting our chests from the jagged stones piercing into our skin, we lay as still as possible to blend in with our surroundings. There we were, hidden and anxiously listening for any signs of movement below us. Our hearts pounded alongside a deafening silence that seemed to stretch on for an eternity. We waited in terror until dawn broke casting light onto the now eerily quiet forest that seemed so malevolent under the moonlight. Whispered that we should make our way back to the cabin and gather supplies to lay a trap for this seemingly otherworldly beast. Although I was weary of facing this horror once again, Remington's words filled me with determination to end this nightmare. As we cautiously made our way back home, we noticed how unsettlingly normal everything appeared. The previously dead atmosphere now seemed alive with birdsong, a serene contrast compared to what unfolded mere hours earlier. Upon arriving at the cabin at 6.12 a.m., I remembered an old bear trap I noticed within the shed when searching for firewood on our first night. We discussed laying it nearby with fresh meat as bait hoping our foe would be victim to its steel jaws. After we set a trap hidden below a bed of leaves, we took refuge inside the cabin. With a loaded shotgun resting on Remington's trembling lap, we waited in agonizing silence. Time ticked painfully slowly until 11.08 p.m. when the creature appeared again. The intense stench of blood and decay confronted us as growling echoed from outside shaking us to our very cores. A loud snap echoed, followed by gut-wrenching cries of pain and anger. The beast had fallen for our bait. As we cautiously approached the trap, our breath caught in our throats at the sight before us. This monstrosity was even more terrifying up close. Its coarse matted fur dripped with blood, and its twisted limbs contorted unnaturally as it writhed against the steel trap caught on one of its legs. Its eyes oozed malice and locked onto me with undeniable fury. Despite my fear, I felt unexpectedly sympathetic towards the wretched beast. We crept closer to inspect the now injured creature, as it seemed to be sizing me up with a combination of hatred and curiosity. Remington raised his shotgun hesitantly, but lowered it after I placed my hand on his arm. We slowly backed away, deciding that we should leave the creature to its fate rather than risk any further violence or upheaval between us. Immediately after making this decision, an otherworldly sound pierced through the air, 
something unrecognizable and unearthly. The creature twitched erratically before releasing an ear-piercing shriek and retreating back into the darkness from which it came. We returned to the cabin utterly terrified yet relieved by our survival. We couldn't help but assume that leaving it alive while wounded would satisfy whatever primal vengeance it held hidden behind those malevolent eyes. Somehow survived a force beyond anything we could have imagined. With the feeling of conquering death, we left the cabin at sunrise and began our descent back to civilization, leaving the events of the night behind us. As I recount this harrowing experience, many may doubt our tale's veracity. Still, it remains a frightful adventure that will live in my memories forever. I've always had an inexplicable fascination with unexplored territories. So, when my friend Caspin Thorne invited me to accompany him on a camping trip to the dense wilderness of Nebraska's Pine Ridge Reservation, I eagerly accepted. There was just something about that place that seemed to call out to me. We arrived at a remote campsite near the town of Chadron on June 19th at around 4.30 in the afternoon. Caspian and his cousin, Ravenna Dahlstrom, wasted no time in setting up camp while I began unpacking our limited provisions. As evening approached and darkness fell, we sat around the campfire, sharing tales of past adventures and laughing at our follies. Little did we know that our light-hearted camaraderie would soon be shattered by an encounter with something straight from our darkest nightmares. Three hours into nightfall, we heard it, a sudden, piercing scream echoing through the woods. It sounded terrifyingly close, unlike anything any of us had ever heard. As an avid outdoorsman, I was familiar with many animal noises, but this one eluded me. We immediately dropped our conversation and exchanged nervous glances. That sounded like someone being gutted alive. Ravenna said nervously. Caspian tried to comfort her, saying it might have just been some strange animal or a hunter's gunshot echoing through the trees. An unsettling tension settled upon the group as we decided it was best to extinguish our fire and hunker down inside Caspian's large tent. As I lay in my sleeping bag, thoughts of strange creatures creeping through the shadows kept me awake. Sleep finally came fitfully to me as exhaustion took over. I awoke just past midnight to the sound of scratches against fabric, the tent wall nearest my head. Startled and with my heart pounding, I reached for my flashlight with trembling hands and shone it out towards the area of disturbance. The scuffling stopped abruptly. My curiosity got the better of me and I decided against my own instincts to step outside the tent. What met my eyes was a gruesome scene in the pale moonlight, deer carcasses, limbs twisted and torn, and entrails strewn about in a macabre artwork of gore and death. It was as if something had brutally hunted and mutilated these innocent creatures with untamed savagery. Caspin and Ravenna were awakened by my gasp of terror stepping out of the tent with equal shock upon viewing the carnage before us. The air seemed charged with an oppressive, malevolent energy. We knew we had to leave. As we frantically packed our belongings, Caspin spotted a figure near the tree line, tall, lanky, with elongated limbs and a hunched gait. It's sunken, Intelligent eyes bore into ours as it swiftly vanished into the darkness. We left everything behind as we fled back to civilization, plagued by thoughts of what we had encountered. Days later, while discussing the event with Chadron locals, we discovered rumors of the Pgazanka, an ancient Arapaho legend that allegedly haunted those very woods for centuries past. 
That malevolent being still haunts my dreams as I relive our horrifying brush with terror on that fateful night at Pine Ridge Reservation. Some things are better left undiscovered, and some secrets remain shrouded in shadow for good reason. Escaping that place felt like a stroke of luck, but life has never quite returned to normal since then. In the days following our disastrous camping trip, I couldn't shake the eerie feeling gnawing at my insides. This both intrigued and terrified me to the point of obsession. Caspian, Ravenna, and I decided to seek out more information about the Pagazanka, hoping that gaining knowledge might alleviate some of our fears. On June 22, at approximately 9 a.m., we visited Chadron's Historical Society, searching through old newspaper articles and town records. We stumbled upon several accounts of strange occurrences over the centuries on the Pine Ridge Reservation. One particular entry from a journal dating back to 1897 described an uncanny creature with similar features to the one we had witnessed. Tall, lanky limbs, sunken eyes, and a hunched gait. In the evening, around 7 p.m., we contacted Dr. Wendell Lorrington, a renowned anthropologist specializing in Arapaho mythology. He agreed to meet us for dinner to discuss our experiences and review his own encounters with the Pagazanka legend. Dr. Lorrington shared stories of isolated incidents throughout history, victims found torn apart, their remains scattered across the forest floor. He described an encounter from six months earlier, when two hunters reported finding another mutilated deer not far from where we had camped. After several hours of discussion over dinner, Dr. Lorrington hypothesized that it must have been this elusive creature we had come face to face with. As irrational as it seemed to me at first, his hypothesis was too detailed to be pure imagination. One comment stuck with me as we said our goodbyes on June 23rd at 11.30 p.m. The Pingazanka may appear as a fearsome beast, but ancient Arapaho stories tell of its ability to take any form it desires. Some legends even suggest it can mimic the voices and mannerisms of its victims. The following day, June 24th, at around 10 a.m., Caspin and I returned to the campsite, armed with road flares, pepper spray, and hunting knives, driven by an unspoken desire to confront the creature we had hoped to forget. We arrived by noon and were horrified to discover the fresh remnants of another slain deer. The putrid stench of death that hung in the air was nauseating. At roughly 2.30 p.m., we noticed unnatural sounds coming from deep within the woods, as if the trees themselves were groaning in pain. Driven by adrenaline, excitement, and dread, we ventured further into the darkened forest, our direction guided only by these unnerving cries. We eventually stumbled upon a clearing at around 4 p.m., illuminated by the sunlight where a disfigured figure crouched over yet another victim, this time a young woman who appeared lifeless. Her eyes were wide open in terror, her clothes were torn and bloodied. Upon spotting us, the Pingazanka snarled with rage, its sunken eyes glaring at us. In that moment, we didn't have time for rituals or nonsense. We knew we had to act fast using our primitive weapons for defense. Caspin ignited one of our road flares while I brandished my hunting knife beside him. Seemingly intimidated by the flare's blaze or perhaps sensing our unwavering determination to protect what remained of our sanity, the Pingazanka retreated to the darkness of the trees with menacing agility. Unsettling as it was to realize we likely hadn't seen the last of this creature, we couldn't leave the girl's body abandoned in these sinister woods. The remaining daylight hours were spent carefully carrying her corpse back to civilization, 
a chilling reminder of the grisly reality left in the wake of our encounter with the Pgizanka. It was just a bit past midnight on August 16, 2012, when my friends Ellery Ashwood and Cove Sutton convinced me to join them for an impromptu camping trip. We had been entertaining ourselves with some poker and tequila when the idea was mentioned, and I couldn't say no. Being an outdoors enthusiast, I was more than excited so we decided to head to the Appalachian Wilderness near Monongahela National Forest in West Virginia. After all, it promised stunning views and the possibility of a thrilling adventure. My name is Avril Ipswich, by the way. There is no need to know anything more about me than that. We started our day-long drive from Philadelphia that very morning. The excitement in our car was palpable as we barreled down the highway, listening to our favorite tunes and cracking jokes that only made sense among the closest of friends. Cove was the king of banter, while Ellery always came back with that subtle, dry wood of his. The sun dipped behind the horizon as we pitched our tents deep in the forest under an ink-black sky decorated with stars forming an intricate celestial map above our heads. With the fire crackling at our feet and open beers in hand, our night began peacefully, filled with camaraderie and laughter. But that tranquility was shattered when Cove returned from getting more firewood on edge and pale-faced. He stuttered, Guys, I swear there's something out there. Nonsense! Ellery muttered with condescension. You know what they say, there ain't nothing in these woods but the birds and the bees. But as he spoke those words, a chilling scream pierced the night air. It wasn't human or animal, something much more sinister, which made my skin crawl more than I'd ever admit. We frantically tried to assure ourselves that it was a trick of nature or some prankster playing a cruel joke. As the night wore on, the screams persisted, closer and louder. The fire dwindled under my trembling hands. My throat was dry, and I could barely utter a word. Soon, the fire went out completely. In the unnerving blackness that enveloped us, I could hear Ellery's shaky breaths. Suddenly, there was a gut-wrenching crunch as Cove whispered his final words. It has my leg. In sheer terror, I clambered up a tree with surprising speed to get away from whatever it was. As an enormous creature dragged our friend's mangled body away, Ellery scrambled behind me as we both watched in horror. It was tall and gaunt, with leathery gray skin stretched tight over its skeletal frame. It exhibited unnatural deformities such as an elongated spine and antlers like those of a deer. A guttural growl emanated from deep within its chest as it disappeared into the trees. Frozen with fear in that tree for hours, we finally mustered enough courage to make our way back to civilization. We stumbled onto a ranger station, where we reported what had happened. Their expressions turned from skepticism to grave concern as they recognized the description we provided. Our tormentor resembled a skinwalker a mythical creature born from dark magic with the ability to kill or possess those it encounters. I'm sitting here now trying to find some solace in writing this account, feeling sick knowing that Cove's gruesome demise is just another mystery destined to remain unsolved. There's no telling if this monster still roams the forest. What other atrocities await those who dare enter its territory? Ellery and I knew we had to find a way to unmask this creature and put an end to its torment. We spent the next few days researching skinwalkers, learning about their weaknesses and habits. That's when we noticed our prey's glaring vulnerability, 
It was nocturnal and seemed to avoid sunlight at all costs, tending to strike between midnight and dawn. We decided it was time to lay a trap for that abomination. We returned to the forest armed with shotguns loaded with silver buckshot, a potent weapon against supernatural beings, according to folklore. On the third day of our stakeout, around 2.32 a.m., we heard it again, that unnerving wail no man or beast could produce. Our hearts raced as, out of the darkness, came the twisted figure of our quarry. It looked even more grotesque up close. Its sunken eyes bore into my soul as if peering right through me. Ellery and I stood our ground with a tempered sense of fury, posing an immediate threat that required an equally formidable response. The skinwalker let out one final agonizing shriek before lunging at us with searing rage. At 2.45 a.m. that night, we opened fire, but to our horror, the buckshot seemed to have little effect apart from momentarily stunning the beast. Realizing our flaw in logic, silver only worked against werewolves, we retreated into a small cave and sealed ourselves in as best as we could. As night turned into day, the horrifying situation seemed incompatible with reality. Bright sunbeams streaming through chinks in our makeshift barrier belied the monstrous ordeal just outside. At 3.07 p.m. that afternoon, there was silence. The sounds of the forest resumed their usual rhythms, signaling that not only had night passed but also the dreaded skinwalker. Tired but safe, we returned to our research that evening with renewed determination and hoped for better results. After poring over countless ancient books, we eventually discovered a crucial piece of information. By using ashwood cut during a solar eclipse, one could weaken the skinwalker to the point where regular weapons could kill it. Gathering our strength, we searched high and low for ashwood meeting the distinct criteria, eventually locating rare specimens in the attic of an old witch's house. At that very moment, we knew what had to be done. On the night of August 23rd, exactly one week after Cove met his untimely end, Ellery and I marched back into that unholy forest, locking eyes with death himself. As the creature charged us at 3.12 a.m., we waved branches of that celestial wood-like crucifixes before vampires, stopping the monster in its tracks as it reared in agony. Exposing a fleeting vulnerability, we unloaded our shotguns into their crumpled form at point-blank range. Like leaves in the autumn wind, there came cries of unimaginable pain, and then nothing. We had done it. The nightmare was over. In the aftermath of our near-death experience, Ellery and I went on to lead fulfilling lives devoted to helping others with supernatural threats. Of course, Cove's memory is never far away. It drives us forward like a flickering flame against darkness's tide. Yet even through triumph comes a question we dread. In this twisted world, what other nightmares do humans unknowingly harbor? As long as fear treads Earth's shadowy corners, our work will never end, fueled by dedication to justice and answers forever elusive. The truth is buried beneath a mantle only brave souls dare pry open, for what lies underneath may be humanity's ultimate foe. We're ready, are you? I've always been fascinated by the unexplained, but I never thought it would brush so close to my own life. It all began while visiting my friend Kaden Marikov in a remote town called Blue Mesa, located somewhere in New Mexico. The place seemed unusually quiet, which was a pleasant change from the bustling city life I was accustomed to. My name is Everard Berlanda, a 27-year-old with an insatiable appetite for adventure. 
I met Caden back in college, and we've been amazing friends since then. He had recently moved to this mysterious small town for his work as a researcher in the field of biomimicry. During our first evening together in Blue Mesa, we decided to explore the woods surrounding the town before nightfall. It didn't cross our minds that maybe we should familiarize ourselves with local legends before venturing off-grid. Our hike took us further into the forest than expected, and twilight found us on an unfamiliar path. The light was rapidly fading as our relaxed conversation gave way to an eerie silence, occasionally punctuated by strange distant noises. We felt like we were being stalked. Shit, Everard! Did you hear that? Caden whispered with terror apparent in his voice. I nodded, my heart pounding as we continued moving cautiously along the path. Then I saw it, a figure of unspeakable horror lurking amongst the trees. Its silvery fur shimmered, and its dark eyes seemed to slice through me like sharpened knives. Mangled remains of what might have once been an animal lay about its bent and twisted limbs. Damn it! Caden cursed as he yanked me down behind a cluster of bushes with surprisingly quick reflexes. We need to get back right now! Maintaining absolute silence, we stealthily crawled back towards civilization. With every rustle and snapping twig underfoot, Waves of adrenaline surged through our bodies. It was as if we could actually feel the creature's gaze on the back of our necks. We managed to seek shelter in Caden's car before speaking the horrific word that plagued both our minds. Skinwalk. We drove home in silence, unable to comprehend or accept what we had just witnessed. After days of restless sleep filled with sweat-drenched nightmares, our denial began to wane, and we sought answers. We approached a local named Araminta Spalesbury, who cautiously shared some guarded knowledge about the beast. She told her grandfather's harrowing tale of encountering a skinwalker in Blue Mesa during his youth. The creature's grotesque appearance resembled an unnatural blend of human and animal features. As days turned into weeks, we remained obsessed with solving the enigma. We tirelessly researched and hunted down any leads we could find until finally discovering a pattern. Every few months, horrifically maimed bodies of missing people would be discovered in those woods, some dating back decades. Determined to reveal the truth behind this horror, I felt compelled to journey back into the depths of those woods armed with just a shotgun and a camera. I shivered as the once familiar path transformed into an ominous hell's cape at twilight. My determination wavered as I stepped slowly between the trees, feeling as if this imminent descent into darkness would consume me altogether. It was then that I heard it again. The grotesque snarl from our first encounter echoed all around me. As my eyes frantically searched for any sign of movement and my heart raced uncontrollably, one thought consumed my mind. It's now or never. As I stood trembling in the dense forest, I faced a terrible choice, confront the skinwalker or flee for my life. My heart pounded, and my mind raced as I wrestled with the unthinkable decision. Every instinct shouted at me to run but I remembered Caden and the looming threat to the people of Blue Mesa, pushing me to face the monstrous creature. I looked around quickly, searching for a suitable weapon. As luck would have it, there were several fallen branches that appeared sturdy enough to use as a makeshift club. I picked up two of them, slipping one into my backpack for backup and clutching the other with white-knuckled strength. Without realizing it was 9.23 p.m. on that fateful night, I crept through the underbrush as silently as possible toward the hideous howling sounds. The fear that enveloped me was strangling, but something deep within propelled me forward. 
My determination grew stronger as moonlight filtered through the trees, casting eerie shadows that played tricks on my eyes. I gritted my teeth and continued until suddenly, at exactly 10.18 p.m., I saw the creature in all its horrific glory. At an astonishing height of nearly eight feet tall, the skinwalker stood on two legs like a man but resembled an amalgamation of animal parts like those of a wolf and a bear. It had enormous, twisted limbs covered in patches of decaying fur. Its elongated face had piercing black eyes that seemed to see straight through me and rows of razor-like teeth dripping with blood from its latest meal. I watched it disassemble its recent victim, twisted limbs scattered like a macabre jigsaw puzzle, and gruesome fascination for what seemed like hours when it was only minutes. It began to feast hungrily on the tattered remains of what used to be human. Bones cracking under intense pressure were like gunshots in the otherwise silent woods. At precisely 10.34 p.m., I summoned the last bit of courage and swung my makeshift club with a mighty yell, aiming for the skinwalker's head. To my astonishment, I landed a solid hit. The impact temporarily stunned the creature, causing it to stumble backward. I didn't waste another second, sprinting toward the direction of Caden's car at 10.39 p.m. as fast as my shaking legs would allow. Willing myself to ignore the agonized cries of the furious skinwalker in pursuit, I finally found his car in the distance with relief. Though it was only 10.48 p.m. at this point, it felt as if I had been running for hours. As Caden and I sped away, we exchanged horrified gazes before falling back into silent contemplation. We had narrowly survived an encounter with the skinwalker, but our ordeal had frighteningly confirmed its existence. In the months following our nightmarish confrontation, Blue Mesa saw a decline in mysterious disappearances and brutal murders. We were grateful for that small reprieve but couldn't shake the knowledge that we hadn't vanquished the creature outright. Caden and I still live in suspicion and fear, with occasional lingering nightmares. And while either of us will ever forget that horrifying moment when we were forced to face pure evil and escape its clutches by mere seconds, we consider ourselves incredibly fortunate to have lived through it all. As is evident by our tale, our lives remain forever changed by what we witnessed personally. But what continues to haunt us even now is the jarring conviction that somewhere in Blue Mesa, or perhaps lurking just beyond its borders, that hideous creature continues to prowl, leaving no doubt of its unwavering intent to hunt once again. When I first moved to Astoria, Oregon, little did I know how my life would take an unexpected turn. My name is Killian Everbright, and I moved in with a couple of friends, Lysander Trask and Octavia Lamont, about three months ago. We were all artists, looking for new inspiration and a change of pace from big city life. Astoria was a picturesque town with charming historic buildings surrounding a quaint downtown area. In our free time, we enjoyed exploring the lush forests and rocky shoreline along the coast. We frequently visited an old lighthouse by the ocean, which provided beautiful views of the surrounding landscape. It wasn't until our fourth visit to the lighthouse that we noticed something peculiar about the area. As we gazed out at the expanse of trees below us, Lysander pointed out that there seemed to be an unusually dense patch of forest due south of us. Intrigued by this observation, we decided to investigate it over the weekend. On Saturday morning, we geared up with backpacks filled with snacks and water bottles and headed towards this mysterious section of woods. The closer we got, the more uneasy we felt. 
It was as if something was watching us as we ventured deeper into the forest. A couple of hours into our hike, we stumbled upon what appeared to be an abandoned campsite. Strewn about were tattered tents, clothing fragments, and remnants of torn hiking gear. What do you think happened here? Octavia pursued her lips, clearly uneasy about this chaotic scene. Before I could utter a response, a guttural growl echoed ahead of us. Our blood turned cold as fear gripped our hearts. Bolting back to where we came from was second nature. Our hearts threatened to burst from our chests as adrenaline coursed through our veins. The thing, whatever it was, stalked us the entire way, its growls and the snapping of branches constantly at our backs. As we raced to safety, I caught a brief glimpse of it in my peripheral vision. A mixture of animals and humans, it was covered in taut, mottled skin with tangled, matted hair. Moments before breaking through the tree line into Astoria's familiar streets, Lysander tripped on a tree root. His anguished cry was cut short abruptly before I could reach to help him up. To this day, we don't know the true origin or explanation behind that horrific creature that appeared to be part animal, part human. Conversations overheard at local bars led us to believe that there are old legends about beings known as skinwalkers, shape-shifting creatures that live within dense forests. But even those tales aren't enough to satisfy us or explain what happened to Lysander. Despite the tragedy and unanswered questions, we remain in Astoria and share our horrifying experience with others who dare to explore the dense forest south of the lighthouse. We hope that sharing the fate of our dear friend serves as a warning for those fearless wanderers trying their luck. And as for me, I spent my quiet moments wondering if the creature still lurks nearby. What if it's waiting to strike again? The thought keeps me awake at night, heart pounding, ears straining for any trace of its approach. It is during these sleepless nights that humiliation, fear, and anger intertwine within me. I hear another guttural growl echoing from afar. That guttural growl heard in the distance became a constant soundtrack to my nights, reminding me of the horror nestled within our quaint town. I couldn't tear apart images of Lysander's disappearance from my mind, and the guilt was eating at me like a ravenous beast. Damn it, I muttered under my breath. I need to do something about this creature. Find out what it really is. One afternoon, three days after Lysander had vanished, I stumbled upon a dusty old book at the local library, tucked away in a forgotten corner. It depicted ancient myths and legends across the world and drew me in like a moth to a flame. I skimmed through the tattered pages, which reeked of old leather and time-worn secrets, when an illustration caught my attention. There it was, hunched over like an animal, hair matted and tangled yet with humanoid features that eerily mirrored the creature I had glimpsed that day. A feeling of dread washed over me as Octavia entered the library. She must have found out that I was investigating the beast. What are you doing here? She asked apprehensively. I can't just forget about Lysander, I said with determination. We owe him that much. Octavia saw the image in front of me and reluctantly agreed to help uncover its origins. We bravely gathered information about this abomination over a number of sleepless nights and discovered that only substances not natural to its form could harm it. Armed with that information, we devised a plan to find this creature and put an end to its terror once and for all. On a Wednesday night, at precisely 11.16 p.m., we trekked towards the dense patch of forest bordering Astoria equipped with bags full of silver-infused ammunition shells. We veered off on an unmarked trail as we tightened our boot laces, our hands trembling and our hearts pounding. Soon enough, we spotted it. 
Strewn amongst its fur and coarse skin were remnants of Lysander's clothing, a grim confirmation of his fate. The creature looked right at us, its lupin eyes reflecting the anticipation of hunting new prey. Anticipating its assault, we fired upon it in unison, silver bullets piercing its soiled hide. A blood-curdling howl resonated through the forest as tendrils of blood and gore wound their way down its body. Its retreat was nothing short of a strategic move. It quickly vanished into the dense canopy before we could follow up with more shots. We can't let it escape again. Octavia panted between breaths, sweat glistening on her brow. But as we tried to go deeper into the forest after it, an excruciating wail pierced through the air. It was demanding enough for the obvious realization that we had managed to hurt this abomination, ending its immediate terrorizing presence in our town. But deep down, I knew this wasn't the end. Only a temporary respite. We retreated back to Astoria with heavy hearts and long faces as uncertainty haunted us like an unforgivable ghost. We spoke not a word of what had happened in that forest. Narrating events would be akin to luring an inescapable darkness towards us and those around us. Our lives would never be the same after that encounter. Our hearts were ceaselessly clad in grief over Lysander's untimely demise and fear regarding what would happen if this creature ever recuperated from its wounds and returned for revenge. But what weighed the heaviest was the guilt trapped within. The guilt that made me question if confronting this malevolent being without knowing all its secrets meant we had sealed our fate once and for all. And so I lie wide awake each night, my senses heightened and braced for the moment it prowls from the shadows of the forest, mandating its gruesome retribution. I was in Vermont's Birchwood Forest at the time, completely enamored with the dizzying variety of plant species that made up its delicate ecosystem. My name is Devante Freeland, and I had come to this sylvan paradise with a group of friends to take our minds off some issues that were going on at school. It was the 16th of June, 2008. During this trip, we joked around and even dabbled in some friendly banter that could only result from friendship forged over years. While laughing with my best friend Cassius, I couldn't help but notice an odd twitch in his eye as he told a particularly raunchy joke about a kangaroo and a mime artist. As the sun dipped lower in the sky, we decided to set up camp near a scenic creek surrounded by thick vegetation. That's when my friend, Juniper Lawrence, noticed something unusual about the twisted branches overhead. They seemed to coil and shape into humanoid figures, contorted bodies stretched out, almost as if they were eternally yearning for release from their wooden prisons. Not long after that discovery, we gathered around a crackling fire while Juniper strummed random notes on her guitar. Just when the atmosphere started to feel light and carefree again, we heard something unsettling, an unnerving howl echoing from somewhere deep within the woods. At first glance, it seemed as though our night would remain uneventful. Jokes exchanged, beers consumed amid pleasant discussions about nothing in particular. But then we felt a sudden drop in temperature, accompanied by an unshakable sense of dread creeping across our skin like invisible spiders scattering swiftly over every exposed inch. Suddenly, my awareness shifted towards something standing about twenty feet away, an almost human figure stooped low and shrouded by darkness. It had unnervingly long limbs with sharp claws at their endpoints. Saliva dripped from its maw while its eyes appeared almost white in their malice. I could barely keep my wits about me as the creature skulked closer and closer with each deliberate, bone-chilling step. 
The noise from our fire seemed to vanish completely, leaving a dreadful silence as I tried vigorously to remain numb to my mounting terror. As the abomination reached the clearing's edge and prepared for its savage assault, it was then that we discovered its monstrous intent. With startling ferocity, it lunged at Juniper, saliva-laden jaws clamped around her arm, tearing flesh and spraying blood chaotically across our horrified faces. The cacophony of screams was swiftly drowned out by the vile guttural growls emanating from this atrocious aggressor. Panicked beyond belief, we fought back with whatever weapons lay nearby, tent stakes and burning sticks hastily yanked from the sputtering fire pit. But every strike seemed only to enrage the creature further. Cassius howled with newfound fury as it swiped a violent arc across his chest, ripping apart his favorite rancid t-shirt and drawing thick crimson lines beneath. We roared with equal venom as we continued beating relentlessly on this seemingly invulnerable monster. Then, in a last-ditch attempt to neutralize our attacker, I grabbed a can of lighter fluid from our supply pile and doused it in an area close to the creature. As my trembling fingertips struck the flint of my trusty lighter for one fleeting spark, the fire roared back to life, engulfing the creature in an inferno. Flames licked at its revolting skin, unleashing an ear-shattering wail that motivated every cell in my body to flee. We scrambled for our belongings and sprinted into the woods, leaving a screaming juniper behind. The forest blurred into a jumble of branches and leaves as we tore through it, gasping for breath and hearts pounding. A thought plagued me. How could something so vicious and repulsive exist? It felt like we had encountered something beyond the boundaries of comprehension, a dark entity manifested from our deepest fears. As we ran, I could hear my friends sobbing and whimpering, their sanity hanging by a thread. The creature's monstrous howls chased us relentlessly through the night. Fear consumed me with every step, and I couldn't shake the image of Juniper's mangled arm gushing with blood her life essence spilling onto the ground like discarded waste. We finally stumbled upon a secluded cabin by a small lake. As Cassius swung open the door, and we piled inside like frightened children, I noticed the scars on his chest still oozing with blood from the beast's attacks while adrenaline coursed through me. The eerie silence that followed was unbearable. It spoke volumes of dread and despair. Time stretched out in front of us like an endless chasm as we weighed our options. A rifle hung above the fireplace. It was our only hope against such an abomination. Though none of us had much experience handling firearms, we decided to take turns keeping watch, armed with that gun as our protector. Four hours after that fateful encounter, we took turns watching from the cabin window for any signs of movement in the moonlit landscape and nursing wounds sustained during our desperate fight back at camp. The lines between fear and numbness started to blur as exhaustion kicked in. Around 3 a.m., it was my turn to stand guard. Peering out the window, I noticed a ripple in the smooth water of the lake. The panic started to creep in again. What if that thing had followed our scent? What if it hadn't satisfied its malevolent cravings yet? The ripples grew larger, and from the depths emerged a figure dripping with water. It was Juniper, her eyes crazed but alive. She limped towards the cabin with a primal ferocity that sent shivers down my spine. Her arm was nothing more than shredded flesh and gore dangling around her blood-soaked clothing. We opened the door to let her in when she snarled with uncontained aggression. Overcome by the insanity of the situation, I grabbed the rifle and aimed it at Juniper's maddened stare, or whatever monstrous force had taken control of my friend. The gunshot echoed through the night, its harsh sound carried by the freezing wind across the desolate landscape. 
Juniper's body crumpled to the ground, an eerie mixture of relief and heartache washing over me. As we huddled together in that forsaken cabin, not knowing whether we would make it out alive, our only comfort came from embracing each other, desperate for solace amidst unimaginable terror. In those final hours before dawn, I realized that what we had encountered that night would never truly leave us. One by one, we would have to confront our own beasts, manifestations of every darkness lurking within us. And as long as we were bound together by love and friendship, maybe, just maybe, we would have a fighting chance against them. However, deep inside, I knew that no matter how hard we tried to move on with our lives or how much we clung to hope and camaraderie, there would always be an eerie reminder of that treacherous evening, a distant howl echoing through the night, a starved creature impatiently awaiting its next prey. I couldn't have imagined that a random conversation with my roommate, Javian Moncrief, would lead to the most terrifying experience of my life. It was November 12, 2019, when he first told me about his strange evening runs in Elf Hollow Forest, a densely wooded area near our college town in northern Pennsylvania. He claimed that there was something inexplicably eerie about the forest yet the adrenaline rush it provided made him go back for more each time. The following weekend, Javian convinced me to join him on his run through Alf Hollow Forest, a decision I would regret almost instantly. We reached the forest as the sun began to set, casting an orange glow on the thick foliage. Javian led the way through the well-worn dirt path cracking jokes and trying to convince me that I had nothing to worry about. About a mile into our run, we stumbled upon what appeared to be a makeshift campsite. The place seemed abandoned for quite some time, with tattered tents and useless camping gear scattered everywhere. There was a distinct sense of dismay in the air that was impossible to ignore. That's when Javian jokingly mentioned that this place reminded him of a horror movie scene. Little did we know how close he would come to predicting our fates. We continued our jog but couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched. Suddenly, we came across an animal carcass sprawled across the path, its insides gutted out and spread around it grotesquely. Our hearts raced as panic set in. Javian turned to me and whispered urgently, Aliaster, someone or something is out there messing with us. I wanted to leave immediately but was too afraid of running into whoever or whatever was responsible for this gruesome sight. As we cautiously sprinted through trees and climbed over dead logs in desperation to escape Elf Hollow Forest, we caught glimpses of a figure flitting behind the bushes and trees something that was either human nor animal. Its movements were unnervingly swift and agile, and each time we thought for sure that we had lost sight of it, it reappeared in a different place. The next hour seemed to last an eternity as we tried our hardest to outsmart and outrun the creature. Finally, Javian tripped on a large root and took a nasty fall. Despair washed over his face as he hissed in pain. His ankle was swollen and bruised. Trying to remain calm for my friend's sake, I helped him up, but it was evident that running would no longer be an option. I gritted my teeth and grabbed Javian's arm, hoisting him over my shoulder as we continued our attempt to escape at a slower pace. The creature's howls echoed behind us. It knew we couldn't get very far like this but seemed to revel in our fear. It was at this moment that we noticed a nearby tree had claw marks etched deep into the trunk. I couldn't help but wonder if these scratches were the work of the same creature relentlessly pursuing us. Pangs of fear and dread coursed through every fiber of my being, 
knowing that this creature could emerge from the shadows at any moment. Out of nowhere, a horrifying screech cut through the tense silence like a knife, a shrill and blood-curdling sound that sent chills down our spines. At that very moment, I saw the creature emerge from behind a tree. It stood around seven feet tall, with dark, mottled fur covering its grotesque, muscular form. Its eyes were bloodshot and wild, glistening with an undisguised sense of malevolence. Sharp, jagged teeth lined its open mouth as saliva dripped onto the forest floor. It was like nothing I had ever seen before, a grotesque mix of man and beast, seemingly stitched together from the nightmares of all who had ever dared to venture into Alf Hollow Forest. It sniffed the air and let out another harrowing screech, clearly aware of our presence. With no time to lose, I searched my surroundings for something, anything, that could be used as a weapon against this horrifying creature. My hands closed around a sturdy tree branch that had fallen nearby. Javian, I whispered, looking back at my injured friend. I'll try to distract it while you find a place to hide. What are you talking about? Javian asked in disbelief. Don't be crazy. We need to stick together. Your ankle is injured. You can't move quickly enough. Trust me on this, I said determinately. He hesitated for a moment before nodding in agreement. As Javian limped towards some dense bushes nearby, I made myself known to the creature by throwing the branch directly at its face. Its horrific eyes shifted towards me as it let out an enraged growl. Taking advantage of its attention on me, I sprinted deeper into the forest. At precisely 6.47 p.m., it started chasing after me like a relentless predator closing in on its prey. Its agility was unnerving. Every time it seemed like I gained some distance from it, those chilling eyes and gnashing teeth would reappear. I struggled to maintain my pace, exhaustion growing with each burning breath, but I knew that stopping would spell my doom. Finally, at 7.04 p.m., I noticed a steep hill up ahead. In a moment of desperate inspiration, I decided to use the hill to my advantage. Scaling the incline was exhausting, but as I reached the top, I could see the creature struggling to climb. Its large, hulking form made it difficult for it to traverse the treacherous terrain quickly. With my last ounce of strength, I threw myself down the other side of the hill and rolled rapidly down the slope. I finally came to a stop at the bottom and looked back just in time to see the creature tumble down as well. The fall had not injured it but left it momentarily disoriented. Seizing this precious window of time, I scanned my surroundings and spotted a cluster of trees nearby that provided enough cover for me to take refuge. At 7.18 p.m., with great difficulty, I hauled myself into one of the trees and clung desperately to a branch. Just as I did so, the creature regained its bearings and roared in frustration below me. It tried to climb after me but found its body too bulky for such a task. Its fury was plain on its distorted face as it circled my tree helplessly. As hours passed in a tense standoff between us, we heard distant voices echoing through the forest. Someone was searching for us. The creature's ears twitched towards the sound before snarling at me one last time. It knew that remaining there would risk its discovery by others. The beast fled into the darkness of Elf Hollow Forest right before our rescue party could reach us. Although Javian and I were relieved to be rescued and treated for our injuries, we couldn't shake off our encounter with this demon. Our once beloved forest would never be the same again, as a nightmare stalked within, untamed and cunning, waiting to strike again.
I've always been fascinated by puzzles and mysteries, trying to unravel the complicated patterns that unobtrusively announce their presence in daily life. It wasn't until I discovered the peculiar events unfolding in Pergola Hollow, a small wooded area in New Hampshire, that I realized just how complex and unnerving some of these enigmas can truly be. My journey began innocuously enough when, on April 7, 2018, my cousin Alaric came into town. Alaric was an amateur historian with an interest in local folklore. He had heard tales of strange sightings and unexplained occurrences connected to Pergola Hollow and decided to investigate further. As the sun dipped below the horizon one Saturday evening, Alaric and I decided to embark on an expedition into the heart of Pergola Hollow. We joked and teased each other as we hiked into the darkness, not a care in the world. The dense foliage seemed to fold around us, creating a cocoon of twisting branches and leaves that shimmered with the first whispers of moonlight. Our laughter died down as we penetrated deeper into the hollow, replaced by an almost tangible silence. It was as if we moved through an invisible wall, leaving behind the light-hearted joy that initially accompanied our endeavor. The air grew colder and heavier, burdening us with an impending sense of dread. Intrigued by what lay ahead, we continued onward until we stumbled upon a small clearing. The fresh scent of overturned soil filled our nostrils, while subtle signs of struggle in the surrounding vegetation indicated something ominous had occurred there recently. We exchanged nervous glances but said nothing. That's when it happened, a twig cracked somewhere off to our left, followed by heavy breathing just out of sight. Frantically scanning our surroundings, I noticed a pair of haunting yellow eyes staring back at me through the dense brush. The creature moved effortlessly through the tightly packed branches, making no sound as it closed the distance between us. Terror rippled through me as I caught sight of its grotesque features, long, twisted limbs that bent at weird angles, a mouth filled with jagged teeth, and coarse hair sprouting from its hunched form. It seemed poised for intelligent savagery, a disheveled remnant of some forgotten legend impossibly resurrected in our modern world. Without a word, Alaric and I began a mad race back down the trail towards safety. Behind us, we could hear the wild hooting of our pursuer, as if it were toying with us like mice being teased by a cat. A gruesome tableau materialized before us with each footfall. Gutted foxes strewn upon the ground, owls lying torn apart, all expertly eviscerated and strung amongst the trees as some twisted reminder of fate's merciless grasp. As we stumbled through the darkness, Alaric tripped over a concealed branch and fell hard into the dirt. The hunt reached its zenith. It let loose an ominous growl as it drew nearer to my fallen cousin, amused by our fear. Refusing to abandon Alaric to his grisly end, I quickly grabbed a large rock, my heart pounding like an out-of-control freight train, and hurled it toward those glowing orbs. A guttural snarl pierced the air as I connected with something solid and instantly vanished. The instant reprieve offered by its scream only seemed to stoke that unyielding instinct for survival deep within my core. The sensation of my spine shuddering only served to fertilize the determination growing within me. I was not about to cower and run away from this malevolent beast. Alaric groaned on the ground, his face contorted with pain, and his ankle twisted unnaturally. He tried saying something, but fear choked the words before they even formed. It was now up to me to confront this unknown antagonist. As I nervously scanned our surroundings for any sign of a weapon that could potentially hurt this creature, my eyes rested on a discarded hunter's arrow partially hidden by the undergrowth. It seemed like a long shot, 
but it was the only option I had available. In that fleeting moment, as I reached for the arrow, it felt as though a strange energy coursed through my veins, a calming certainty of purpose. The creature emerged from behind a massive oak tree at 8.43 p.m., its grotesque form poised like some twisted mockery of human anatomy. Time seemed to freeze, and in one swift motion, I took a defensive stance while drawing back the arrow. The creature seemed amused by my efforts and snickered as it stepped closer, its yellow eyes gleaming intently. The haughty air in which it brandished its jagged teeth oozed contempt and disregard for my meager weapon. As it lunged first towards Alaric, a mere ten feet away from where he lay helplessly on the forest floor, I released the arrow with all my strength at 8.44 p.m. To say that time slowed would be an understatement. It virtually came to a standstill in those precious seconds. The arrow appeared in stark contrast against the darkness as it made its graceful arc toward the creature's heart. In a surreal twist of physics in our favor, it found its target flawlessly at 8.45 p.m. The aftermath deserved its own gory description. The creature's coarse hide, along with its seemingly impenetrable exterior, burst open upon impact, dousing its surroundings in an otherworldly sludge that reeked of decay and putrid meat. It screeched in agony, the gut-wrenching sound echoing wildly off the ancient trunks of Pergola Hollow. The creature seemed to deflate slowly, collapsing into itself like a grotesque effigy made of nightmares. Surprisingly, however, it didn't die. It only diminished and appeared weaker. It instinctively retreated to the shadows once again, but this time with a more palpable sense of fear and surprise etched in its demeanor. Alaric looked up in disbelief as I handed him the makeshift walking stick I had found lying close by. Gingerly getting up on one shaky foot, he murmured his thanks in bewilderment and flashed a somber smile as we moved through the now darkened trail to greet daylight. As we reached the boundary of Pergola Hollow on Sunday morning at 5.26 a.m., my heart was still racing from the previous night's encounter, but now it was tempered with a newfound courage and resolve. The creature we faced and survived was no longer a faceless enigma lurking in the folds of local folklore. It was real, and apparently mortal. Despite our harrowing experience, Alaric and I vowed to return to Pergola Hollow better prepared for whatever lay hidden there. With renewed purpose and unwavering determination, we departed that dreary forest knowing one thing for certain. Our next encounter would undoubtedly be yet another battle of wits against this unearthly adversary. Only this time, we wouldn't be unarmed or unprepared for the challenge ahead. My name is Brecken Reinhold and something happened to me that changed my life forever. I'm not an adventurous guy. Mostly I hang out at home, playing video games or watching movies on my couch. But sometimes, even the most mundane life moments can plunge you into something inexplicable. On June 21, 2018, after finishing some chores, I decided to take a hike through the nearby woods a place called Sand Meadow Lane in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, for some exercise. Fresh air never hurts anyone, right? I meandered through the picturesque and serene setting when I stumbled upon an old abandoned barn. It caught my attention, so I investigated further but maintained a safe distance since some old structures collapsed without warning. As I stood there admiring this ancient architectural beauty, I heard subtle scuffling sounds and noticed a slight movement in the shadows of the barn's interior. Thinking it was probably an animal, a raccoon perhaps, I chuckled to myself but dismissed it. 
The day continued uneventfully until dusk started setting in. It became increasingly important for me to make my way back to civilization before nightfall since I didn't trust my ability to navigate these woods in the dark. Just then, a chilling scream shattered the silence like a sudden thunderstorm in an otherwise serene sky. My body froze as adrenaline rushed through my veins. There was no doubt now, someone needed help urgently. Stepping out of my comfort zone and battling intense fear, I hurriedly ran toward the barn where the sound originated. Upon peering inside the eerie structure, my heart raced as terror gripped every fiber of my being. Before me lay an injured young woman named Kailani Westbrook. Her face was badly bruised and cut. Her clothes were in tatters, with obvious signs of struggle all over her body. As I managed to make out more details in the dimly lit barn, I noticed that parts of her body were mangled beyond recognition, like an animal had savagely mauled her. Trying to console Kailani and assess her need for medical intervention, she began to stammer horrible details of her gruesome encounter with what she believed to be a deranged man. She couldn't see his face clearly, but based on the mangled fingers that pierced her skin with inhuman strength, she felt it was something far worse than merely human. As we exchanged words, a foul odor and gust of air made me uneasy, a feeling that sent shivers down my spine. It felt like we were being hunted by a primal creature hiding in plain sight. Unable to shake off this feeling, we frantically left the barn and bolted towards civilization as fast as our legs could carry us. In the midst of this mad dash, I took a fleeting yet terrifying glance at a beastly figure perched in a nearby tree. Immediately after, another blood-curdling scream echoed through the forest followed by what sounded like numerous birds taking flight. I knew then that whatever monstrosity nearly killed Kailani was not finished with us just yet. Despite my desperate attempt to evacuate us to safety, the ghastly entity gained ground. Not knowing whether it would strike again or if our bodies would simply collapse from exhaustion, terror set in at the thought of becoming just another unsolved murder or even worse, unidentified remains lost forever in obscurity. As I turned around to assess if that fleeting, ominous figure still lurked around us, I decided to confront the creature that had caused so much pain and fear. I knew that it would not be an easy task, but something deep within me told me that it had to be done. Armed with a heavy iron rod I found at the barn, I told Kailani to keep running towards safety as I made my way back to face whatever monstrosity awaited in those shadows. Fear seemed to follow me like an unshakable shadow, but so too did primal determination. I noticed the savage creature had left a trail of devastation as I once more drew near the old barn. Small animals and birds lay lifeless on the ground while branches dangled precariously from their treetop homes. A path of destruction left in the wake of that menacing antagonist. My pulse quickened as I stepped into the barn again. There, perched on a rotting beam, was the beast responsible for all this chaos. Its twisted and grotesque body appeared humanoid in shape yet had viciously elongated limbs. Matted fur draped over its torso and down its viciously clawed limbs. Beady red eyes glared down at me as razor-sharp teeth glinted in the dim light, all heightened by a repulsive stench that permeated every inch of the structure. Seeing my weapon of choice, the beast snarled ferociously before leaping at me with otherworldly agility. Instinctively, I swung my iron rod with all my might, striking it as it barreled towards me. The metallic clang upon impact sent shockwaves up my arm as our gazes met with pure hatred. Injured but evidently undeterred, the creature reared back for another attack. This time, it was faster. 
Claws slashed through the air like relentless knives, aiming directly for my throat. In turn, I fought back with fervor as we engaged in a brutal game of life or death. This monstrous dance of blood and violence continued for what felt like hours, with each blow inflicted by both sides leaving trails of gore behind. Eventually, my strength began to wane, but so did the creatures. We exchanged impossibly intense stares, each understanding that this battle could not carry on indefinitely. Through sheer torment and determination, I managed one final blow, my iron rod embedding itself deep into the creature's skull with a sickening crunch. With an agonized howl, the beast fell back and disappeared into the darkness of the woods. Exhausted, battered, and bruised, but still alive, I stumbled my way back to civilization. As I reached the road and found Kailani receiving medical attention from a passing motorist, we embraced amidst tears of relief and horror. The terrifying image of that twisted beast remained burned into my memory. However, it seemed as if the creature itself had vanished without a trace. Authorities combed the area for days afterwards but found nothing substantial beyond animal carcasses and destruction left in its wake. Although we sought answers to this unfathomable mystery, both Kailani and I ultimately accepted that we may never know or understand exactly what kind of nightmarish being tried so desperately to take our lives. We find comfort in the knowledge that there is an unfathomable evil lurking somewhere within those tangled woods, one that we dared to face and miraculously survived, even though it haunts us with an unbreakable paranoia at every rustle in the night or sinister shadow beyond each corner. It was another regular day hanging out with my cousin Ezekiel Gardner, or Zeke as we call him, when we discovered something truly horrifying. It was May 19, 1997, and it was nearing the end of summer break in the small town of Star Lake, Nevada. Zeke and I had decided to explore an old abandoned house on the outskirts of town we'd heard rumors about from the locals especially the old folks. They asserted that a mysterious creature they couldn't quite describe had cursed or haunted the location. My name is Jasper Worthington, by the way. Neither of us believed in any of that mumbo-jumbo, so we dared each other to go inside and see for ourselves. Little did we know that what we'd find there would change our lives forever. As the sun began to set, Zeke and I approached the crumbling house cautiously. Its time-worn walls seemed almost alive, as if they were silently beckoning us closer. But no putrid smells or eerie sounds escaped from within, at least not yet. We pushed open the creaky front door and took our first steps inside. Despite its dilapidated appearance, it was really just an ordinary old house, cobwebs draped every corner, old, dusty furniture sat untouched for decades, and remnants of faded wallpaper peeled off in strips. We shrugged at each other and continued to poke around. But then a sudden chill ran down my spine as I felt something watching us from within the shadows. I heard a subtle grinding sound a few paces behind me like the crushing of bones. Turning around slowly, I saw a tall figure whose skin appeared almost leathery and had an unnerving animal-like face. Zeke's eyes widened with fear as he stared at the being behind me. The air around us grew heavy with tension as this otherworldly creature emerged fully into view. It emitted a guttural, inhuman growl so deep that we felt it more than heard it. There was no question, this was no ordinary foe. The creature moved with a fluidity and speed we hadn't anticipated, effortlessly closing the gap between us. Panicked, 
We ran through the crumbling house, barely managing to avoid its razor-sharp claws as they swiped at our heels. As we raced towards the door leading outside, I pushed Seek through first and quickly followed. Time seemed to slow down as we scrambled toward the edge of town. A cacophony of gut-wrenching sounds pursued us, like the very earth itself was crying out in terror. As we stumbled into an alleyway, panting and dripping with sweat and adrenaline fueling our every move, the beast emerged from the doorway behind us. Before our eyes it began to morph, its body twisting and contorting in ways that defied logic. It grew larger, its limbs stretching out until it towered over us like a nightmare come to life. This time, however, there was no escape. It was us or this monstrosity. Armed only with our adrenaline-laced resolve and whatever makeshift weapons we could muster from the garbage around us, a broken wooden pallet, a rusted pipe, we stood our ground as the creature closed in on us. I gripped Zeke's shoulder. This was either our last stand or a fate worse than death. With one lung-piercing roar echoing through the night sky, the creature lunged at us with unexpected force, and we swung our makeshift weapons, desperately trying to fend off the advancing menace. To our surprise, the rusted pipe connected with its twisted limb, snapping it cleanly in half. A scream of pain erupted from the creature that sounded almost human. Zeke and I looked at each other in disbelief as the broken limb began to regenerate before our very eyes. Somehow, we had managed to cause the creature pain, something neither of us thought possible. We knew we couldn't kill it, but maybe we could wound it enough to distract it and allow us to escape. Jasper! Aim for the limbs! Zeke shouted over the deafening roar of our relentless assailant. I nodded and attacked with renewed vigor, my terror momentarily replaced by grim determination. We fought fiercely, with broken bones and blood scattered across the alley floor as we hacked away at its ever-growing limbs. Despite our best efforts, the creature was relentless in its pursuit of us. And just when we thought that hope was lost, torrential rain began to pour down around us. As the drops pelted the monster's exposed flesh, it let out a horrific screech, one that filled our hearts with a strange mix of terror and hope. The rain seemed to be slowing down its regeneration process. Seeing an opportunity for escape, we took turns striking at the creature's newly weakened limbs while sprinting through town in search of shelter. We knew there was no guarantee that we could kill this malevolent being, but perhaps we could gain enough distance until it lost interest in tracking us down. Our breath came in ragged gasps as we stumbled upon an old warehouse near the edge of town. We darted inside and barricaded ourselves into a small office space littered with long-forgotten paperwork and dusty furniture. As night gave way to dawn, exhaustion started to cloud our minds. We fought to stay awake, knowing that regardless of how much time had passed, the creature might still be waiting outside our hiding place. With the doors firmly barricaded and our weapons close at hand, Zeke and I shared our last bit of energy to form a plan. We need to let the townspeople know what we saw. Zeke whispered cautiously, his voice trembling with anxiety. If we don't, this thing could keep hurting people. I agreed, but we both knew it wouldn't be an easy task. Most likely, people would think us crazy for claiming that a seemingly immortal creature haunted their once peaceful little town. By late morning, when the rain had reduced to a light drizzle, we cautiously stepped outside and found no sign of the beast. Over the next few days, we did our best to warn everyone in Star Lake about the creature that stalked their town. Some listened, others dismissed us as merely seeking attention. As time went on, strange reports began to emerge from other towns nearby 
stories of twisted limbs, inhuman growls, and unimaginable horrors stalking the shadows. Somehow, knowing that we weren't alone in our terror brought us a sense of grim solidarity. Some might find solace in knowing that perhaps one day soon the creature will move further away from our small Nevada town. But Zeke and I? We'll never forget about those sleepless nights filled with terror and pain, shaped by a monster lurking just out of sight. And for all those creatures who may be lurking just beyond humanity's understanding, be warned. We'll do whatever it takes to make sure no one else suffers at your hands. I've always been a wanderer. Growing up, my parents moved around a lot, which left me with few friends but many adventures. Even as an adult, I've continued to explore the world around me whenever I can. It was on one of my adventures in a dense forest in western Montana that I found out just how strange life can be. My name is Eamon Peregrine, and my older brother is Cashin Peregrine. You see, we come from a long lineage of wandering souls, always looking for the next thrill and never quite finding our place. After hearing about some bizarre disappearances in the forest, we decided to put our skills to the test and figure out what was going on. It was October 23, 2018, and we had made it to the edge of the forest where these mysterious vanishings were rumored to be occurring. Our first step into those woods felt like surrendering to uncertainty. Little did we know just how much truth there was behind this feeling. We trekked deeper into the dense foliage, chatting nervously as an eerie silence enveloped us. The dense fog surrounding us appeared like nature's own shroud of mystery, enticing us further and with its hazy allure. As dusk settled in, the shadows grew longer, and a palpable sense of unease began to creep into our minds. Despite our skepticism and propensity for finding logical explanations in any mysterious situation, even Cashin couldn't shake his growing discomfort. I don't know about you, he whispered through gritted teeth as he lit another cigarette, but there's something about this place that makes my skin crawl. As if on cue, we heard a chilling sound echo through the mist, a low growl followed by what could only be described as an otherworldly screech. Our fear, heightened by instinct alone, scrambled hastily toward this unsettling noise. We found ourselves face to face with a gruesome sight. There, lying in a crumpled heap among the damp leaves, was what remained of an unfortunate hiker. Torn flesh, broken bones, the gory scene was enough to turn even the staunchest of stomachs. What kind of animal could have done this? I asked Cashin in horror, trying to suppress my growing nausea. Before he could respond, I noticed movement from the corner of my eye. It was unlike anything we had ever seen before, unnaturally tall and lean, its limbs twisted at unnatural angles. It radiated malevolence as it moved with unearthly swiftness. In sheer panic, we bolted in the opposite direction, running for our lives. We could hear it giving chase, its terrifying screech echoing behind us like a siren aimed at driving us mad. We stumbled upon a cave entrance and ducked inside for refuge. As we huddled together in the darkness, we whispered about legends like the Skinwalker or Wendigo, creatures who were once humans but had become something altogether more sinister. As time inched on and silence filled the cave's depths, we foolishly tried convincing ourselves that maybe we had imagined it all, that perhaps this creature born of folklore wasn't real after all. But our momentary reprieve was shattered when we peeked out from our hiding spot. There it stood, watching and waiting. Our only hope was to remain frozen in place, 
at least one breath away from our final moments. That's when a plan began to form in my mind. If this thing couldn't be outsmarted, maybe it could be outrun. My heart raced in sync with my thoughts as I shared the idea with Cashin, his eyes mirroring the mix of terror and determination that must have been visible in mine. Listen, I whispered, we're going to have to make a break for it. We can't stay here forever, and I'm sure as hell not going down without a fight. Cashin nodded and we quickly scoured through our backpacks for anything that might give us an advantage. Our best bet was my hunting knife and Cashin's can of bear spray. Not much, but it was all we had. As we steeled ourselves to confront the creature, we noticed that the mist had begun to thin in some areas. This gave me an idea. Using the denser fog as cover, we edged our way closer to the cave entrance while keeping our eyes on the beast. It stood there, relentless and horrific. Veins bulged from its pale skin, lifted slightly by sharp protrusions resembling twisted branches. Its gaunt face sported piercing red eyes and mouths filled with razor-sharp teeth where its ears should have been. It emitted guttural growls as it sniffed the air impatiently. Our hearts pounded fiercely on October 25, 2018, at 7.32 p.m., as Cashin counted down quietly. Three, two, one. In that instant, we sprang from our hiding place and dashed through the small opening between the fog banks. I could feel heavy footsteps shaking the ground behind us as the creature gave chase. Cashin emptied his can of bear spray blindly behind him in an attempt to slow it down or distract it. When we saw a sharp bend up ahead in our path, I screamed at Cashin, Turn now! As we pivoted, I quickly sliced through a waste thick tree trunk with my knife just as the monster neared it. It came crashing down in front of the creature, momentarily blocking its path and buying us some time. Cashin and I ran harder than we had ever run before, our bodies pushed to the limit by adrenaline and fear. Our lungs burned while sweat drenched our clothes. Just as we thought we might collapse from exhaustion, the dense forest gave way to a clearing marked by the old, rusted sign of a park boundary where our car was parked. Without looking back, we managed to fumble with the keys and unlock the car doors. As we peeled out of there, tires screeching against asphalt, we caught one last glimpse of the monstrous creature staring coldly at us from the edge of the woods. Its red eyes seemed to burn with a chilling promise. This wasn't over. In that fleeting moment, our lives changed forever. I could no longer wander into nature with blind curiosity and reckless abandon. Instead, I became burdened with caution and a heavy secret, one that haunted me in quiet moments when I attempted sleep. Whoever else dared explore that forest would unknowingly face an unspeakable terror they would not be able to comprehend. Still, Cashin and I swore never to return to that cursed place or speak of it to anyone outside ourselves. The hunger in those eyes made us realize that some things were better left undisturbed and forgotten. The nefarious beast that stalked those woods was one such thing, one we hoped would remain nothing more than a dark shadow lurking in our memories for as long as we drew breath. There I was, standing in the heart of the Whispering Woods, a place known among locals for countless inexplicable occurrences. My name is Anselmo Broughton, and at that time, on September 22, 2003, I had no idea what was about to unfold that day. My two close friends, Giovanna Kincaid and Kiefer Masterson, 
and I had planned to go on a weekend camping trip to celebrate the end of summer and our shared relief from our tedious desk jobs. As we set up camp beneath the twisted branches of ancient trees, Giovanna pulled out one of her homemade gourmet sandwiches. Kiefer frowned at his own peanut butter and jelly creation. I can't believe you actually took the time to make those, he commented dryly. Giovanna chuckled as she handed one over to him. You know me, she said. I always go the extra mile when it comes to food. Using hand gestures and animations, I recounted an amusing anecdote about our coworker Marcus dropping his phone into the office toilet while attempting to take underwater pictures. We spent hours laughing together as Kiefer told story after story about ghostly encounters reported by the park rangers. It wasn't until nightfall that things began to change, slowly at first. As we huddled around our warm campfire, we heard something rustling in the bushes just beyond our sight. Instinctively grabbing a flashlight, I scanned the darkness while Kiefer shook his head at me. It's just a squirrel or something, he reasoned dismissively. However, Giovanna's face betrayed her concern as she whispered, Did you hear that sound? It's like whispers mixed with growls. We tried our best to brush off our concerns and continue with our evening banter around drinks and stories, but we soon couldn't ignore the increasing feeling of being watched, with goosebumps rising on our skin. The whispers became louder, and it sounded like they were surrounding our campsite. In a panic, Kiefer grabbed a large branch he found nearby, readying himself for a fight. We stood back to back in the center of our campsite as the sounds grew closer. I noticed Kiefer trembling slightly. He was acting tough, but I was sure he was as terrified as me and Giovanna. Without warning, an otherworldly creature emerged from the darkness, grotesque and mangled with razor-sharp teeth and blood-red eyes that struck terror into the core of our being. It resembled some demonic combination of a wolf and a man, standing on its hind legs like some twisted beast out of folklore. Unnervingly, its body seemed to shift and morph, like it couldn't decide what form to take. I begged my friends to run as the creature lunged towards us. Anselmo slapped me across the face, snapping me out of my paralyzing fear, and I started to move. Kiefer smashed the branch onto the creature's head with all his strength, momentarily stunning it. We used this opportunity to flee into the woods at breakneck speed. The creature pursued us relentlessly. I imagined its gnarled claws ripping into my back as we struggled through the underbrush. What could this monstrosity be? How were we ever going to escape this nightmare? Our hearts pounding in our chests as screams filled the woods, adrenaline coursing through our veins. Just as we thought we were out of reach, the creature leapt at us, claws extended, coming within a hair's breadth of tearing into me. I moved to dodge its attack just in time, feeling the rush of cold air as its claws barely missed my face. Using every ounce of strength we had left, we burst through the tree lean and stumbled upon an old, abandoned cabin. Without hesitation, we kicked the door open and slammed it closed behind us. We quickly barricaded it with a heavy wooden wardrobe that was leaning against the wall. The creature clawed and pounded at the door with primal rage as we desperately searched for anything to help us fight off this monstrous intruder. Kiefer found a rusty old hunting knife stashed under a dusty pile of blankets and handed it to me with a determined expression on his face. Keep that thing away from us, he said as he picked up an iron fire poker, ready to defend Giovanna if needed. The creature's relentless assault continued outside. It would only be a matter of time before it broke through. Scratching our brains for possible solutions, 
Giovanna suggested that perhaps a powerful animal trap might be hidden somewhere in the cabin, designed for people who sought refuge from predators during the long winter months. It felt like divine intervention when Kiefer soon discovered an old bear trap shoved into one corner of the dusty attic amongst long-forgotten belongings. We carefully held our breaths as we set up this gruesome instrument beneath the only window in the room. The pained, freakish howls from behind the warped wood continued until they finally stopped. The few seconds of silence felt like eons. Dread filled our hearts as we knew this wasn't over yet. Suddenly, another blood-curdling growl tore through the night air. The creature hurled itself through the window with frightening force, instantly getting caught in the razor-sharp jaws of the bear trap. With a guttural scream, it writhed around in agony, pinned to the filthy cabin floor. Without wasting a second, I lunged forward and buried the hunting knife deep into its twisted form. The creature's howls grew louder, morphing into an all-too-human cry of pain. I stepped back in horror, realizing that whatever this thing was, it wasn't just represented by animal instincts. There was something human in there too. The blood seeping from its grotesque carcass started glowing an eerie greenish hue before being absorbed by the very wooden floor beneath it, as if the wood was feasting upon its tormentor. Stunned by this inexplicable turn of events, we carefully approached the now lifeless creature that only moments ago posed such a threat to our lives. The entity appeared to be decomposing at an alarmingly fast rate. Rot and decay set in within minutes. We felt no sense of closure, only the cold realization that we'd never truly understand what happened that night. As dawn arose, Kiefer whispered, We need to leave this place and never look back. And we silently agreed. We exited the cabin with caution and stepped into daylight, forever tainted by memories of what lurked in those whispering woods. Four days and nights afterward, we each tried to make sense of our encounter with that otherworldly being, searching for answers that would ultimately remain beyond our grasp. Those would still whisper tales of terror. Whether anyone chooses to listen is another story altogether. Every once in a blue moon, you find your life colliding with situations that defy reason, like the riddles that only grow deeper as they unfold. I was reminded of that crazy, unforgettable experience when I came across my father's old hunting gear collecting dust in our attic. My friends and I, Cochrane, Silvestra, and Anson, spent most of our time exploring the lush forests bordering our town. Hiking and camping became second nature to us. As we grew older, our love for adventure morphed into a thrilling game of pushing our boundaries just a little further each time. One particular day on June 2, 2003, we decided to try something new, a week-long hike deep into the wilderness near Colfax, Washington. As we are now familiar with both remote trails and uncharted terrain, we embarked on this well-planned journey with confidence. Our first few days went smoothly. Daytime brought crisp air, and twilight encompassed star-filled skies over increasingly vast nothingness. The brutal openness spiked anticipation, crackling within each of us. About halfway through the trip, however, something shifted almost imperceptibly. A gnawing sense of unease emerged among us in barely perceptible shivers. The wildlife around seemed more eager to flee than before they could be spotted. Even conversations had a hushed quality. Listeners' subconscious grasped for hidden whispers from unknown sources. On the fifth day of our camping trip, among scattered ruins looming in the shadows beyond clearings and thickets alike, 
we finally met face to face with the unexplainable terror that had been stalking us. It happened when Anson paused suddenly during an afternoon trek and silently gestured at a figure lurking low behind thick bushes further up the path. It stood perfectly still as all five pairs of eyes remained locked in a mortal standoff. The creature was about eight feet tall and cloaked in matted hair with antlers adorning its head. Its yellow, predatory eyes flickered hungrily onto each of ours before slinking back into the trees. For several long minutes, we couldn't move or speak. None of us ever experienced such a bizarre encounter. Something beyond our comprehension had infiltrated our ranks. Individually, we tried to brush off the incident but never strayed too far from each other after that. Days expended themselves in a blur of lost rationality and unanswered questions. The creature's haunting gaze imprinted itself on our collective psyche, and though we searched for any mention of it in local folklore or legends, none could be found. Throughout the night, it would torment us, circling our campsite, its presence tangible through distant groans and snaps of twigs underfoot. Yet we stayed close together, too paralyzed by confusion and fear to move. Until one morning, when we discovered Anson's bedroll empty. His shoes and backpack were gone as well, replaced by clawed footprints burned deep into the solid ground. Searching nearby led us only to old ruins shrouded in secrecy, hiding the truth behind these enigmatic occurrences. Finally, exhaustion forced acknowledgement that our friend was gone, irretrievably snatched away by a beast beyond understanding. We knew the time had come to abandon this unfathomable nightmare and return to a human society where compassion conquered cruelty. With heavy hearts weighed down by loss, we slogged back through the wilderness born now of malignant purpose. Bewilderment and sorrow lay thick upon our heaving shoulders. Just as our destination, a semblance of known reality, was almost within reach once again, we stumbled upon a dilapidated cabin with the faint smell of decay wafting from it. Our instincts begged us to stay far away from this place but the unsolved mystery of Anson's disappearance compelled us to investigate. Approaching the cabin, we armed ourselves with fallen branches and rocks. Anything that could provide some semblance of protection against the beast we had witnessed just days prior. Slowly, we pushed open the rotting door and cautiously stepped inside. The cabin appeared to have been long forgotten. Animal bones and rusted tools were scattered across the dusty floor. As our eyes adjusted to the dim light, we noticed dried bloodstains and peculiar symbols etched onto the walls. One symbol in particular looked like intertwining antlers surrounding a star, an eerie representation of the creature itself. Whispered conversations between Cochrane, Silvestra, and me filled the room as we debated our next move. I couldn't shake off my unending concern for Anson's safety. Taking a deep breath, I decided that we would continue our search to confront the creature, rescue Anson, or at least bring an end to this maddening nightmare. As we made our way back outside, an agonized scream echoed through the dense forest. The sound ripped at our hearts with terror, it was unmistakably Anson's voice. We raced hastily towards the gut-wrenching cries for help. Adrenaline fueled every breath as our bodies refused to succumb to exhaustion. As darkness enveloped us on June 7th at precisely 10.44 p.m., we arrived at a clearing where the creature loomed menacingly over a battered Anson. The beast bared its sharp teeth while picking at its prey with jagged claws dripping blood. Without a second thought, adamant that this sadistic predation needed to end right there and then, Cochrane hurled his rocks, and Sylvester swung his makeshift branch weapon with all his might. The creature recoiled in pain, snarling viciously at us. 
Despite its agonized rage, it began retreating, leaving a trail of black blood. Unfortunately, our relief turned to despair as we realized that Ensign had succumbed to his injuries. Sobs and whispered curses filled the air as we mourned his loss. Wrapping our dead friend in his own tattered clothes, we faced the grim task of carrying him back to civilization. In the days that followed our escape from that cursed forest, we sought solace in each other's company. We shared stories of our time with Anson, celebrating his life even as grief anchored us down. But nestled deeply within our hearts was an unsettling understanding, one that whispered of the beasts lurking still in those woods, where remnants of bloody carnage testified to its existence. And though it never again crossed paths with us or any living soul in Colfax, its memory carved a chilling legacy into our lives. A permanent reminder of a gruesome encounter in which death remained unvanquished, and the boundaries between reality and the inexplicable became frightfully blurred. My name is Thane Austin and this was an experience that I won't soon forget. I always considered myself a rational person, always relying on cold, hard facts rather than fanciful tales or superstitions. It was on August 3rd, 2018, that I found myself questioning everything. In those days, I was an amateur photographer looking to build my portfolio which led me to some of the most remote parts of the United States. I had ventured deep into the forests near Wilkinsburg, Wyoming, a place not known for its tourist attractions. I remember meeting up with my friend Dravko Ivanov and his dog at a local campground before beginning our hike. We started walking through dense woodland, occasionally stopping to take photographs of the landscape. As we continued deeper into the woods, we stumbled upon something that caught our full attention, scattered animal remains covered in what seemed to be puncture wounds. Curiosity peaked. We followed the strange phenomenon deeper into unknown territory. A few unsettling moments later, Dravko froze. I could feel his uneasiness in the thick silence that surrounded us. He whispered lowly, Thane, look! Pointing shakily towards the trees nearest us, I realized there were claw marks gouged deep into their trunks. Even stranger were the strange sounds we heard next. They sounded nothing like anything I had ever heard before, a mix between an inhuman growl and human-like whisperings. Despite our growing apprehension, we decided to push forward for what felt like ours. As darkness began to settle in, we knew we had no choice but to set up camp for the night. While huddled around our small campfire, we couldn't shake off our heightened sense of unease. That night was marked by the sounds of snapping branches and soft footsteps circling our campsite. Early morning light couldn't come fast enough, so Dravko announced. Thane, I think we should leave. This place isn't safe. My dog's been acting strange all night. It was then that I caught sight of something in the shadows. A tall, hunched figure with elongated limbs and shimmering fur slinks around in the trees. The sight alone was enough to make my mind race. As if it sensed our newfound awareness, the creature let out a deafening inhuman screech that had us grabbing our belongings and sprinting back towards civilization. Days later, still traumatized by what happened, I decided to do some research on what we might have encountered in those woods. Some online forums and local rumors alluded to the creature known as a skinwalker, a shapeshifter of Native American folklore said to have an unnatural and voracious appetite for blood. The more I dug into the lore and testimonies from others who claimed to have come across it, 
the more chills traveled up my spine. Even though we were far from what happened, Dravko confided in me that sometimes during his midnight smoke breaks he still hears whispers in the wind. While no one except Dravko and myself knows exactly what we saw that night, I now find myself bewitched by anything related to this mysterious phenomenon. Even so, part of me still wishes that we had never stepped foot into those cursed woods. The next day, Dravko and I decided to return to the woods. I know it sounds crazy, but we had to find proof of what we saw. We armed ourselves with rifles and hunting knives, both for self-defense and in case we found any more animal victims of this terrifying creature. On August 6th, at exactly 7.27 a.m., we began our journey back into the ominous forest. The atmosphere was heavy with tension but also determination. As we trekked through the dark underbrush, we saw more gruesome sights, mutilated wildlife and deep gashes in tree trunks that were undeniably from claws. Around noon, we stumbled upon a clearing with a small pond. It was there that I noticed something truly horrifying, bloody feathers scattered around a mutilated bird carcass. The injuries were so severe that it was barely recognizable as an animal. At precisely 1.34 p.m., the ominous growling returned. Dravko gripped his rifle tighter and whispered, Stay close to me. No sooner had he uttered these words than something large crashed through the foliage behind us. We spun around and spotted a huge figure standing roughly ten feet away, the same fur-covered beast we encountered the night before. The monster had gleaming red eyes that seemed to pierce our souls, and its grotesque physique was covered in clotted blood. The elongated limbs appeared muscular yet flexible. They twitched with anticipation as they snarled at us. Its canine-like head taunted us by snapping its putrid jaws, revealing strong, sharp teeth coated in gore. Without thinking, Dravko fired his rifle at the beast's chest. It howled in pain and fury but didn't retreat or fall. Instead, it lunged at us ferociously. We scrambled away desperately while firing rounds right into the creature's body. All was chaos as we fought against this aberration. The skinwalker swiped at us with its horrifying claws, narrowly missing us each time. We severed one of the creature's fingers, but it only enraged the beast further. It retaliated by sinking its teeth into Dravko's shoulder. I'll never forget his agonized scream as he dropped to the ground. With a primal cry, I lunged at the creature with my hunting knife, stabbing it repeatedly in the neck and torso. As if sensing that it was finally facing a significant threat, the monster released my friend and turned to face me directly. In a final act of desperation, I managed to land an enormously powerful blow on what I assumed was its head and watched as it stumbled away from me. To my astonishment, the creature began to recede into the trees, severely hurt but not fatally so. Fearing that it would return with even deadlier intent, we gathered our remaining strength and hobbled our way back to civilization, Dravko's shoulder bearing a wound that would never truly heal. After this dreadful encounter, life slowly went back to normal. But Dravko and I can never forget those chilling events near Wilkinsburg, Wyoming. To this day, we both remain haunted by nightmares of elongated limbs and red eyes glowing ominously in the darkness. I may not know for certain what it is that we encountered in those cursed woods. Still, the horror we faced convinced us both that some legends are best left unchallenged, no matter how rational or skeptical one might claim to be. The day began like any other, 
Never would I have thought that the events would unfold as they did. My name is Arcadios Balthazar, and it was on October 8, 2002, that I found myself in a small diner called Gary's Greasy Spoon in Marlette, Michigan, cracking jokes with my friends Morgan Salvadori and Baldwin Hootner over a plate of badly done scrambled eggs. So, what's the plan for today? inquired Morgan as he took a considerable drag from his cigarette. We could head out to the lake, Baldrin suggested with a sly grin. You know, for some fishing or whatever. At Baldrin's suggestion, we unanimously agreed to spend the day by the secluded Bachman Lake on the outskirts of town. Unbeknownst to us, it was a decision we would deeply regret soon enough. As we approached our destination, we couldn't shake off the feeling that something was off about the atmosphere that day. After setting up our fishing gear by the serene lake, we noticed an oddly mutilated animal carcass in the bushes nearby. The damage to its body didn't seem like it had been inflicted by any predator we knew of. It was too precise and brutal at times. Largely dismissing our grisly discovery, we continued our afternoon by attempting to catch some fish. It wasn't long before Baldwin noticed something strange involving a group of trees near the edge of the water. Do you guys see that? He asked nervously. That shadow over there? Morgan and I squinted in disbelief. There appeared to be some sort of figure clad in darkness that briefly emerged between two trees before retreating back into their cover. Within minutes, we found ourselves unable to focus on anything other than those menacing trees along the shore. They seemed to bear down on us as if hiding a malevolent secret. Our previous jovial spirits had given way to utter dread. Just then, we heard a guttural growl from behind us, and a monstrous figure emerged from the trees. Standing tall on hind legs with elongated limbs, the creature was covered in matted fur and had unholy eyes that bore into our souls. Without proper thought, we raced away, our hearts pounding as the vicious pursuit persisted. As we ran through the thick of the woods, Morgan tripped and fell to the ground. I turned to see him struggling to free his leg from a fallen log while the beast inched closer. Its mouth watered at the sight of its prey within reach, and it had no intention of showing mercy. Frantically searching for something, anything, to use as a weapon, my hand found a sturdy branch just in time. I lunged at the creature with all my might and managed to strike it hard enough to knock it away from Morgan momentarily. Seizing this short window of opportunity, Morgan broke free from the log and joined Baldwin and me as we sprinted away from our pursuer. Despite seemingly losing track of us, nobody dared to breathe easy as we staggered breathless back into town. Later, inquiring around town confirmed our most terrifying thoughts. We had encountered none other than a skinwalker, an evil shapeshifter from nightmares and hushed legends. Humbled by the events that transpired on that fateful day, we knew we had to make sure nobody else encountered this vicious beast. On October 10, 2002, as the sun began to set, Morgan, Baldwin, and I gathered at my house, determined to come up with a plan to keep the skinwalker at bay. We researched the creature and its known weaknesses, Silver being one of them. Armed with silver bullets and an ample supply of courage, we ventured back into the woods near Bachman Lake, hell-bent on confronting the monster. As we cautiously approached the location where we had last seen the creature, every rustle of leaves and snap of twigs made us jump. I checked my watch. It was precisely 9.37 p.m. The darkness seemed to grow thicker with every passing second. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream echoed through the woods, sending shivers down our spines. 
Morgan pointed towards a nearby clearing, where we found Jenny Thompson from our town lying on the ground in shock. Her face was pale, and her clothes were torn. She must have encountered the beast as well. Baljuin and I quickly helped her up while Morgan scanned the surroundings for any sign of the skinwalker. I couldn't help but gasp as I saw what remained of Jenny's boyfriend. His body lay lifeless several feet away from her, horribly mutilated beyond recognition. Organs spilled out onto the forest floor like some gruesome puzzle that no one wanted to solve. It was a horrific sight, one that would be etched into our memories forever. The moon shone brightly above us at exactly 10.15 p.m. when we heard that low guttural growl once again. It echoed past each tree trunk like an alert for impending doom. We braced ourselves as a hulking figure emerged from behind a large oak tree. It was him, unmistakable and terrifying as ever with his firm matted and those wicked, gleaming eyes. Get ready, I whispered to my friends, gripping my gun tightly. In our zeal to defend our town and exact revenge on the innocent lives lost as a result of the monster's savagery, we took position and fired our silver-infused bullets at the skinwalker. The bullets pierced the creature's body, but he merely flinched before suddenly disappearing in a swirl of black smoke. Panicked and stunned at what we had witnessed, we stood there for a moment, wondering how this was even possible. The air grew colder. I glanced at my watch, and it read 10.37 p.m. We decided to head back to town, bringing an injured Jenny with us and leaving behind the gruesome scene that marked another victim of this seemingly invincible beast. As days turned into weeks, no one dared speak of the skinwalker. But despite our best attempts at protecting others from the terrible fate we had witnessed firsthand, nothing seemed to keep the creature at bay. Instead, it continued its reign of terror and secrecy. Though we couldn't destroy or capture the skinwalker, we ensured that everyone in Marlette knew about its existence to help them be more cautious. Tales of its grotesque actions remained whispered secrets among residents as fear spread like wildfire throughout our little town. The unfortunate truth is that some horrors remain hidden among us, lurking just beyond our comprehension with no discernible end in sight. But as long as there are people like myself, Morgan, and Baldwin who refuse to cower in fear and continuously strive to confront these evils head-on, hope prevails. I had always been a night owl, so when my best friend Elora suggested we go out for a midnight hike, I was more than eager to tag along. We decided on the dauntingly beautiful Timberwood Forest, known for its lush trees and serene atmosphere. If you're from the area, you know how quiet and peaceful it can be. What could possibly go wrong? On July 17, 2014, Elora and I set off from her place around 11 p.m. I'm Javen Kumbersky, by the way, a proud insomniac and adventure seeker. We entered Timberwood Forest with nothing but our flashlights and some food and water in our backpacks, ready to explore the unknown. The first hour went by smoothly as we chatted about anything and everything, from our favorite obscure shows to... Did you hear that Laramie Fisklet broke up with his girlfriend? Your typical pop gossip. As we ventured further into the dense woods, an uneasy feeling began to settle in my stomach, which I initially shrugged off as one of Elora's ghost stories from earlier. However, it wasn't long before we started noticing large scratch marks on tree trunks, as if some prehistoric beast had marked its territory. Trying to imitate brave explorers on TV, I tapped on the scratch mark slightly with a stick, 
only to have them crumble like ash beneath my makeshift tool. Concerned but not dissuaded enough to turn back, Elora and I continued on our path. It was then that a sudden rustling sound nearby made us freeze in our tracks whispering in hushed tones to maintain an element of surprise or perhaps out of pure terror-induced instinct. We continued forward side by side towards the source of the noise. That's when we saw it. A grotesque figure with scarred skin like a thousand tortured souls, eyes that pierced through the darkness like hot coals, and long and twisted limbs much like a malformed spider. Slowly and deliberately it approached us while we were too paralyzed with fear to move. The monstrous creature was eerily silent as it got dangerously close. Instincts finally kicked in, and Elora and I traded hurried looks before sprinting away from the creature in a desperate attempt to lose sight of it. As our ragged breaths echoed in the night and adrenaline coursed through our veins, Every sense heightened to perceive even the slightest sound. We had to navigate the forest while avoiding an unforeseen predator. We could hear its unsettling movements just beyond our vision, as well as its chilling growls that sent shivers down our spines. The only thing keeping us going was our shared determination for survival. As we wove through the trees, the mutated monster seemed relentless in its pursuit. Which brings me to where we are now, still in the dark forest with nothing but our flashlights flickering and gradually fading with each passing moment. We huddle behind a large tree trunk as the sinister creature's presence looms ever closer, wondering if it'll ever end. As we hid, our hearts pounding in our ears, I couldn't take the tension anymore. I knew we had to do something, or that horrifying creature would tear us apart with its razor-sharp appendages. Elora, I whispered, we can't keep running. We need weapons. We need a plan. Elora nodded, and we both started digging through our backpacks in search of anything that could help us. I picked up a small pocket knife while Elora found a can of pepper spray she had brought for self-defense. These were hardly arsenals against such an enemy, but they were better than nothing. We peeked around the tree and saw the creature still lurking in the shadows some distance away, its twisted limbs carrying it in an unnatural manner. We noticed how its scarred skin seemed to emit a faint glow under the moonlight, making it visible even among the trees. Concentrating on the grotesque beast, we were slow and deliberate with our movements. At 2.15 a.m., we noticed that its attention was drawn away from us as it heard something deeper within the forest. This was our chance. We sprinted towards it, brandishing our makeshift weapons with determination and fear intermingling in our minds. Just as we neared the creature at 2.18 a.m., it spotted us and lashed out with one of its spider-like limbs. Elora swiftly dodged and retaliated by spraying its gruesome face with pepper spray. The creature recoiled, giving me an opportunity to lash out with my pocket knife and slash one of the legs that resembled a combination of bone and rotting flesh. It let out an unearthly shriek as black ichor oozed from its wound. Our attack hadn't stopped it completely, but it was now more cautious. We began circling one another, Alora launching quick bursts of pepper spray at its eyes, while I took advantage of every opening to slash at its legs with my knife, ignoring the repulsive sensation as the icor splattered on me. Each hit made it angrier and more desperate. It was at 2.23 a.m. when the creature finally stumbled backward. It unexpectedly paused for a moment, then stared directly at us with those haunting coal-like eyes. It let out a guttural sound, not unlike a low growl, and retreated into the darkness from which it came. We knew better than to pursue it. This thing had proven itself far too dangerous for us to even consider following it into its lair. 
Alora and I staggered back to where we had entered the forest hours earlier after catching our breath, feeling encouraged by our small victory but fully aware that we were still in grave danger. We were bruised and battered, covered in ichor and sweat. We dared not speak until we emerged from those cursed woods. It was at 3.07 a.m. when Alora's house finally came into view. Safety felt like an illusion as we stepped onto her front porch. As she unlocked her door, we couldn't shake the feeling that something was still watching us. It knew where we lived. It could follow us home to exact revenge. Four days after that nightmarish encounter, Alora and I couldn't sleep. Every creak of the floorboards or rustle of leaves outside would bring back visions of that grotesque figure with its twisted limbs and scarred skin. Our fear is palpable, and the knowledge that this horrifying creature is still out there haunts us daily. But if anything is clear from that heart-stopping night in Timberwood Forest, it's that together, Alora and I somehow stood strong against a monster we can scarcely comprehend. Will it come back for vengeance one day? It's a question we dare not speak aloud but ponder silently as we live our lives, eyes ever on the shadows, hearts never far from terror. They say curiosity killed the cat and in my case, it nearly killed me too. I was never one to shy away from an unsolved mystery, but this time, the trail led me somewhere I wish it just hadn't. July 11, 2016 seemed like an ordinary day at first. Just another long summer day spent with my friends Xander Ackley and Rena Wexley. We cherished those moments during our last year of college. That day started off harmless enough, laughing, joking, and shooting the breeze at a local bar. My name is Oscar Morganfield, and just like any other young adult, I thought I knew everything. Until that night, that dreadful night, when we ventured to an unknown location deep within a forest in central Wisconsin, the Devil's Bridge as locals like to whisper about but refuse to openly acknowledge. The place wasn't anything special and at first glance looked like any other old wooden bridge. However, it was part of a forgotten logging route that ran through private land no one dared visit anymore. We didn't think too much about it as we chucked our discarded beer bottles into the murky abyss below the bridge. It wasn't long before we noticed something strange happening on the bank across the river. A low growl at first echoed through the air, and we exchanged glances filled with a mix of fear and curiosity. Xander inched closer to take a better look while Rena clung nervously to my arm as her heart raced faster than I'd ever felt before. Gathering courage from their reactions, I cautiously joined Xander by his side peering into the darkness of the thicket. There was something strangely off about how ominously quiet it was now, as if all living creatures had abandoned this patch of darkness that seemed to defy logic. Then suddenly, without warning or provocation, a massive shape lunged out of nowhere. It viciously dug its sharp claws into Xander, ripping him apart in an instant. My heart froze in terror as I beheld the nightmarish creature, standing over six feet tall, a grotesque mix between a bear and a man with the glowing red eyes of pure evil. Rena and I screamed in horrified panic, fumbling to escape the monstrosity. Rena tripped, breaking her ankle in the chaos and moaning in agony. The abomination was too focused on its macabre meal to notice our escape for now, but we knew we had only seconds before it would turn its attention to us. We had no other choice but to leave Xander's lifeless body behind and find help. We narrowly escaped the creature that night, or maybe it intentionally let us go, 
and we couldn't explain what had happened, but when we returned with local authorities to investigate, all that remained were remnants of Xander's clothes and deep claw marks embedded into the bridge's crumbling wood. To this day, I continue to wonder about that horrible being lurking deep within the forest, feasting on those unfortunate or foolish enough to cross its domain. The nightmares of that gruesome summer day still haunt me, a somber reminder of the cruel mystery lurking in our world and that some things just can't be explained. In the following days, Rena and I began our search for any piece of information about the creature that murdered Xander. We knew that we needed to be prepared if we ever had to face it again, so our journey led us to a local historian, Mr. Thompson, who specialized in local legends and mysterious occurrences. We shared our harrowing experience with him without holding anything back. Mr. Thompson listened carefully. It sounds like you came face to face with Old Red, he said solemnly. For centuries, it's been rumored that Old Red is a monstrous being that's part man, part animal. They say it roams these forests, luring people away from the path and devouring them. He took out an old book and pointed to a disturbing illustration showing a grotesque figure with a bear-like head and muscular human body standing on two powerful legs with glowing red eyes, just as we'd seen that night on Devil's Bridge. People have tried to hunt Old Red down over the years, he continued, but none have ever succeeded. We need to stop this creature from hurting anyone else, I declared. Rena agreed, although fear still shone in her eyes. Over the next few days, we did everything we could to prepare ourselves for the upcoming showdown. We bought hunting gear like rifles and knives at a local store, as well as supplies meant for tracking animals like food bait, binoculars, and camouflage outfits. We left for the forest on July 15th at around 7.30 p.m., as we approached Devil's Bridge, we decided to set up an ambush near the spot where Xander was attacked. The sense of dread filled my veins. However, there was also an undeniable urge to put an end to Old Red's reign of terror. The sun had finally dipped below the horizon when we heard crackling noises coming from nearby bushes. Rena tightened her grip on her shotgun as we both aimed our weapons at the incoming sound. Slowly, a large, dark figure emerged from the brush, revealing the nightmarish monster we had confronted days ago. The air was thick with tension. My pulse pounded in my ears as I focused on Old Red. It was now or never. As it neared our hiding spot, we opened fire. Bullets pierced the creature's body, eliciting guttural screams of agony. Surprisingly, instead of charging towards us, Old Red began to retreat in a frenzied panic. We continued shooting until it disappeared into the forest like a phantom. Fearful that it might return, we decided to get out of there at once and report the incident to local authorities. As Rena and I fled through the woods, trying to process the whirlwind of emotions dominating our senses, we couldn't help but wonder if we'd actually caused some damage to Old Red. In the end, locals heaped praise on us for confronting the murderous beast but warned us that Old Red might return in time for yet another attack. The unresolved nature of our encounter left us uneasy, but we decided to continue our lives with caution and determination. We've become living tragedies and warnings about the true dangers that may lurk just outside our otherwise ordinary lives. Each passing day serves as a reminder to me that there are unnatural creatures in this world. Sometimes they're lucky enough not to cross our paths for extended periods. But for how long can we remain safe before they decide to return again? Though Xander's memory gives us strength to move forward. I can't help but feel like a hunted animal myself ever since that fateful night near Devil's Bridge.
I had always been a bit of a skeptic, especially when it came to wild stories and urban myths. So naturally, when I first heard about the strange incidents occurring near Humboldt County, California, I didn't give it much thought. It was a typical Friday afternoon as my close friend Salvatore, Sal, Romano and I were enjoying some time in our usual spot, the local bar called Jack's Hideout. In the third round of drinks, at Sal's insistence, we decided to take a weekend camping trip out to Humboldt County. His cousin Marcella had recently moved out there and told him about an eerily secluded spot deep within the woods. They say this creepy creature roams around there, man. It might be fun trying to see if it actually exists. He chuckled sarcastically as he lit up a cigarette. We arrived around 8.30 p.m. on Saturday at Marcella's house. She greeted us warmly and handed us a rough map she had sketched with the location of the isolated clearing in the woods. We grabbed our camping gear and took off on our adventure, snickering under our breath all along. We could hardly believe that grown adults believe these tales. After about two hours of hiking and cursing Marcella's hand-drawn map, we finally discovered the hidden clearing deep in the woods. We set up camp and started a small campfire, cracking open a couple of beers as we settled in for the night. In the blink of an eye, everything changed. The air was filled with a nauseating metallic smell, while an eerie feeling invaded us. Suddenly, we heard branches snapping nearby. We jumped to our feet, flashlights in hand, nervously scanning our surroundings. And there it was. The creature looked like nothing we had ever seen before or could possibly imagine, tall and grotesque with an almost human-like quality but twisted beyond comprehension. Its eyes were blood red, and it had long, gnarly claws at the ends of its twisted limbs. Before we could react, the creature lunged at a fellow camper nearby that we hadn't spotted before. The horrifying sounds of ripping flesh and blood-curdling screams sent us running back towards Marcella's house, stumbling and cursing ourselves forever doubting what we heard. But there was no way on earth we could have prepared for what we saw. Our panic-fueled escape seemed to span an eternity but we finally burst through the door of Marcella's house, panting and hysterical. She quickly calmed us down just enough to hear our frantic story. Surprisingly, she didn't doubt us and, in fact, knew someone who had seen it previously, a park ranger named Troy Whitlock. We couldn't just sit there and wait. We had to do something. So... After a lengthy discussion with Marcella and Troy, we came up with a plan. Troy had experience dealing with dangerous animals in the park, and he suggested that we could try using tranquilizer darts to subdue the creature. Sal and I decided to arm ourselves with these weapons and accompany Troy on a mission to confront him. The very next morning, at 7.13 a.m., we gathered our gear and set off into the woods where we last saw the creature and had stumbled upon its victim. We came across what was left of the campsite, and it was a grisly sight to behold, bloody bits of tissue strewn all over, torn clothes scattered about, and an overwhelming smell of carnage hanging in the air. Despite our determination to put an end to this horror, there was no denying that fear took hold of us as we examined the scene. We continued through the woods for several hours until Troy spotted a trail marked by broken branches and crushed undergrowth, evidence suggesting that something of considerable size had passed through recently. Following this trail, at 11.27 a.m., we arrived at what appeared to be the creature's lair, a dark, damp cave filled with a horrid stench emanating from within. Nervous as hell but fortified by our sense of duty, Sal, Troy, and I cautiously entered the cave with our dart guns at the ready. 
The darkness threatened to swallow us whole as we proceeded further in, with only our flashlights guiding us. At 11.45 a.m., as we turned the corner at one point, we heard heavy breathing coming from ahead of us. Followed by those sinister, blood-red eyes glaring directly at us from the shadows. It was hiding, waiting for us. Troy fired his trank dart first, striking true on his target. The creature roared in pain and anger before it sprung forward, charging at us on its grotesque limbs. Without a second thought, Sal and I fired our own darts. As the creature faltered mid-charge from the tranquilizer's effects, we knew we had done enough to incapacitate it, but it wasn't going down without a fight. With one last burst of strength, the creature swiped at Sal with its gnarly claws, leaving him face down in a pool of his own blood. Troy quickly pulled out some heavy-duty restraints he had brought along, and as I held the fading flashlight beam on the now immobilized creature, Troy managed to bind its hands and feet securely. We then carefully approached Sal. He was barely conscious, his chest ripped open by those monstrous claws. I swore under my breath, not knowing if he would make it despite my best efforts to comfort him. We radioed for support. Troy's ranger colleagues were able to reach us by 2.05 p.m. and carefully transport Sal while we guided them. On our way back, with Sal being attended to by medics, we reported everything that happened, explaining that the creature would need professional containment within government authorities. It had been a horrifying experience, as we never encountered anything so gruesome before. Either of us could have fathomed such an occurrence without living through it ourselves. The creature was found deceased in captivity due to the trauma incurred during its capture, yet somehow that didn't feel like closure. To this day, even though Sal eventually recovered from his ordeal that attacked us both mentally and physically, we swore off ever returning to those chilling woods of Humboldt County, taking nothing for granted anymore. What once seemed like myths and legends are less easily ignored now that we know that something so terrifying could exist just beyond our sight, waiting, lurking, in the deepest corners of our world. Living through this nightmare, I can only say with certainty that it's better to believe in the improbable than to be blindsided by reality when it strikes. Because sometimes fiction isn't nearly as chilling as the truth. It all began while I was visiting a little-known part of Alaska for a unique skiing experience. My name is Zalman Krieger, and if you told me what would unfold on that fateful trip, I would have laughed in your face. Always a skeptic, I never put much stock in legends or spooky stories. But trust me, what you're about to hear is no fairy tale. My buddy Huxley had invited me and our friend Santiago to stay at his family's cabin for some extreme skiing off the beaten path. Little did we know how quickly things would take a sinister turn. As we neared the remote cabin on our snowmobiles, Huxley explained that the area had recently seen some bizarre incidents involving local wildlife. Animals had been found brutally mutilated, with investigators pointing to an unidentified predator as the culprit. Arriving at the cabin, we unloaded our gear and settled comfortably in front of the fire, sharing jokes and poking fun at Huxley for all his top secret skiing spots. The next day was perfect for skiing. Crisp blue skies and untouched powder made us giddy with excitement. As we shred down the mountainside, something caught my eye. Halfway between the trees lay a mauled moose carcass, partially devoured, with a trail of mangled bloody entrails behind it. Unsettled but determined to make the most of our adventure, 
We continued skiing only to witness fresh kill after fresh kill as miles stretched behind us, seemingly placed as if by design. When night fell, sleep was impossible. The gruesome sights haunted my dreams. Suddenly awoken by an eerie scratching outside the cabin walls, Santiago panicked, bounding from his bed and pressing an ear against the window frame. We joined him curiously but cautiously. When he flung open the curtains, we caught a brief glimpse of a massive humanoid figure with glowing eyes locked on ours. It disappeared as quickly as it appeared. I sensed it was toying with us, the predator from Huxley's stories. Terrified, we locked all doors and windows, armed with hunting rifles and ready to unload on anything that tried to get in. But the anticipation was torturous. Hours passed with no sign of the creature's return. At dawn, we couldn't take it anymore, deciding to make a break for our snowmobiles. As we made our way out of the cabin, my heart raced at the thought of what might be waiting for us in the icy morning air. Gunshots echoed throughout the desolate landscape as Santiago fired into the trees, convinced he saw movement behind them. Then, like a thunderclap from above, an enormous tree branch smashed down onto our snowmobiles, obliterating our only chance of escaping this wretched wilderness alive. Huxley's sudden disappearance left Santiago and me horrified. I peered into the now fading darkness, my rifle aimed at any movement in the snowy wilderness. Solomon, we need to get out of here! Santiago shouted. There were no other options. We had to move forward on foot towards civilization. We trudged through the cold snow for hours our unflinching determination fueling our progress. As we cautiously moved through the dense Alaskan forest, a dark figure loomed in the distance. It was the creature from before, towering at least eight feet tall with matted fur as black as midnight. Its teeth appeared razor sharp, dripping with blood and saliva. As it took a step into the moonlight, I could see it was covered in ghastly wounds, the beast had been in many battles and survived. I glanced over at Santiago, who whispered, We have to confront it, otherwise it'll keep coming for us. Our eyes locked, and without a word exchanged between us, we shared the same resolve to face the creature head-on. Armed with our hunting rifles and adrenaline pumping through our veins, we approached the monster cautiously but deliberately. Time seemed to freeze as we stood before this nightmarish beast, its glowing red eyes staring back at us like two sinister orbs of hatred. Ready? I asked Santiago. He nodded firmly. Let's do this. Both of us took aim at the creature's massive head and started firing repeatedly, every shot echoing through the icy landscape. As each bullet met its mark, the beast howled in agony but did not fall. It appeared as though gunfire alone wouldn't be enough to defeat this thing. With each second that passed, we could see the fiend growing angrier and more relentless in its pursuit of us. This nightmare would never end unless we found another way to stop it. Our ammunition running low, Santiago called out. Zalman, try hitting that icy stalactite above the creature. The idea struck me as ingenious. Crushing the beast might be our best chance. We focused our remaining firepower on the sharp icicle that hung precariously overhead. As cracks splintered across its foundation, a tremor shook it free from its icy bonds. In one heart-stopping moment, the enormous stalactite plunged down and impaled the monster. The forest echoed with its agonized screams as the massive icicle skewered the beast from shoulder to hip, pinning it to the frozen ground below. Its blood-stained moss snapped open in an earth-shattering howl of pain before going silent. Gasping for breath, we stared at our seemingly vanquished foe. Though severely wounded, 
It was uncertain whether we had truly killed the creature or merely immobilized it for a time. Fear of what might be pursuing us made our journey to safety difficult and drawn out. Santiago and I refused to let our guard down until we finally reached civilization. We vowed never to return to that forsaken cabin or face whatever evil continues to lurk in the Alaskan wilderness. Though this chapter of our ordeal may have concluded, nightmares continue to haunt me every waking hour, each as vivid and horrifying as my memories of that fateful trip. This monstrous creature defied understanding and left a question I feel I can never answer. What happens when whatever you fear most springs forth from myth into reality? How do you even begin to explain such an encounter? Despite my lingering doubt and uncertainty, one thing remains crystal clear. Some secrets of this world are best left sealed in ice-cold darkness. A lesson I will never forget. I had never been a believer in tall tales and urban legends, but what happened on February 29, 2008, changed everything for me. My friend Arkady Pritchard and I decided to explore the sprawling backwoods of Dryden, New York. We planned it as an innocent hike to escape our mundane daily routines. Little did we know that we were walking into a living nightmare. Our adventure began in the early hours of the morning. Sporting our backpacks filled with food and supplies, we felt invincible as we ventured into the dense forest. The chirping birds and rustling leaves formed a soothing soundtrack to our light-hearted conversation and laughter. As we made our way deeper into the woods, however, an unnerving silence began to surround us. My name is Ephraim Moliat, and I'm here to tell you about the horrifying revelation that neither Arkady nor I saw coming. An event that makes my once carefree heart tremor at the thought of what lurks within those trees. We stumbled upon an old wooden cabin nestled between ancient oaks and towering pines. It almost seemed as though the environment itself was attempting to conceal its own existence because of how overrun it was by nature. Curious yet cautious, we approached the cabin with just a touch of trepidation. As we neared the creaking structure, our apprehension grew palpable. The air felt heavy with something sinister, causing each step to grow heavier than before. I grabbed a rusted door handle and pulled it just far enough for a chill draft to escape from inside. The dim light inside revealed blood splattered against the worn wooden floors in violent patterns. Flesh and gore littered every surface, fresh enough for the smell of iron to still hang in an overpowering cloud around us. Arkady gagged as his eyes watered at the sight. Panic welled up within us as we stumbled back, suddenly realizing that we were trespassing on the territory of something monstrous. The unnatural stillness of the forest snapped back into life with sickening snarls echoing through the trees. Our hearts pounded in our chests as we scrambled to find some means of escape. Suddenly, from the dense brush burst forth a grotesque creature with a hulking posture and gnarled limbs. Its twisted body looked like an amalgamation of man and beast, and its breath smelled like carrion. We had unknowingly entered the hunting grounds of a horrifying entity, a beast that should have existed only in the realm of legends or the darkest corners of one's imagination. With adrenaline pumping through our veins, Arkady and I sprinted through the woods with no sense of direction. The heavy thudding of footsteps close behind us filled us with an unrelenting terror that forced us to ignore our screaming muscles and push onward. The chilling growls echoed louder as we struggled through the undergrowth and realized that our struggle had turned into a desperate attempt to put distance between us and the bloodthirsty creature. 
It was 3.46 p.m. when Arkady screamed a warning. I had a split second to react as he tossed me his hunting knife. Gripping it tightly, I swung at the abomination behind me. The blade made contact with its leathery skin, but the wound only seemed to enrage it further. As we ran, gasping for breath, we spotted a river up ahead. Arkady, lurching in his exhaustion, shouted at me. Ephraim! Quick! That's our best shot at losing it! We plunged into the frigid water and allowed the current to carry us downstream briefly before surfacing and swimming for our lives. We clambered onto the other side of the riverbank chilled to our bones but still alive. Still hearing the monstrous growls that followed us, we knew we needed to make a stand or risk being hunted down like doomed prey. In our frantic attempt to create a weapon from anything available, Arkady discovered bear traps covered in vines among the brush. At 4.04 p.m., my fingers shook as I helped him set up the traps between us and where we believed our attacker to be lurking. The snarling grew angrier and more impatient with every passing moment until it finally burst through the tree lean. Shivering from both cold and terror, Arkady whispered hoarsely, This is it. The monster charged at us full speed upon spotting its prey only to be halted abruptly by the bear traps clamping onto its gnarled limbs. It let out an ear-splitting screech of pain as we watched it thrash wildly in futile attempts to free itself. A glimmer of hope flickered in Arkady's eyes as he picked up rocks and threw them with all his strength at the trapped creature, trying to incapacitate it further. Run, Ephraim! Arkady panted, still launching rocks at the beast. Get help. I'll try to keep it busy. If I can keep it wounded, maybe it'll take longer to come after us again. At 4.27 p.m., with my heart aching and bile churning in my stomach from leaving my friend behind, I ran for our lives. The sounds of the trapped creature's painful moans faded behind me as I sprinted through the woods, braving my exhaustion and despair. It was dusk when I finally stumbled back onto the familiar path we had taken earlier that day. A rescue team emerged alongside a local ranger who had heard my distressed cries for help. The next morning after sunrise, a heavily armed search party accompanied me back to the scene of our grisly discovery, and ultimately, where Arkady had made his stand against the monstrous attacker. To my immense relief, we found Arkady alive amongst the broken traps and blood-soaked ground, bruised and coughing up blood but conscious. We took him and ourselves far away from those woods and vowed never to return. While both our lives were spared that day, with Arkady eventually recovering from his injuries, a part of us can't help but shudder when thinking about whatever creature still lurks there today waiting for its next victim. Every time we cast a glance into the shadows beyond the tree lean or let horrifying memories drive a nightmare consume us, a feeling of lingering dread overcame both of us. Although we were fortunate enough to escape its deadly grasp on that fateful February afternoon in Dryden's backwoods, its vivid presence remains an inescapable terror in the darkest recesses of our minds. But one thing is for certain, it remains out there, waiting, hunting, and no one is truly safe from its reach. There I was, sitting in the quaint coffee shop in the heart of Roanoke, Virginia, on the 15th of November. 2005. It was around 1.30 p.m. when my friend Ellery Quincy came barging in, looking panicked and disheveled. He was always an excitable person, but this time, it was different. Something dreadful had happened. Lennox, you're not going to believe this. 
He gasped as he collapsed into the seat across from me. I couldn't help but notice a dark stain on his jacket sleeve. It almost looked like blood. He began recounting his tale, a horrific event that left him shaken to the core. Ellery had been exploring the edge of a dense forest on his family's property while searching for his missing dog. Along the way, he stumbled upon what appeared to be an old abandoned barn that had collapsed with age. As he approached it, a foul stench wrapped around him like a suffocating blanket. Eyeing him cautiously, I asked about the smell, to which Ellery responded with a quiver in his voice. I followed it and found my dog, or at least what was left of him. Apparently, something had torn his cherished pet apart. Whatever had done this was clearly no ordinary predator. With tears welling up in his eyes, Ellery spoke of how, amidst the carnage, he saw something he could only describe as monstrous, slink back into the cover of the trees. He referred to its long limbs and twisted frame draped in matted fur. The creature's eyes held an unnatural amber glow that seemed to pierce straight through him. At first, I thought perhaps his fear and sorrow were clouding his memory. Maybe it was just a particularly vicious wild animal he'd seen. But as the days went by, more people from our small town began sharing similar stories. An inescapable sense of dread washed over us. Then came the news of the Walker boy. He had been fishing alone near his family's property when he was found dead, his body mangled and lifeless. The shocking crime scene suggested a viciousness beyond anything an ordinary animal could inflict. The town was gripped with terror, a paranoia swirling through the air infecting everyone it touched. We were feeling cornered, our once peaceful lives haunted by fear and uncertainty. Desperately, Ellery and I decided we needed to do something to protect ourselves and our families from this monstrous threat that lurked in the shadows. Loaded with supplies and determination, we ventured out into the murky woods at dusk, armed with hunting knives and our old faithful shotgun named... Olga. As night descended upon us, the air thickened with an eerie silence that sent shivers down our spines. Despite our burning resolve, we couldn't ignore how vulnerable we felt as we trudged deeper into the darkness. Suddenly, a chilling howl cut through the oppressive stillness, followed by the sound of rustling branches just a few steps behind us. Our hearts raced. Ellery clutched Olga tightly while I gripped my knife as though my life depended on it, which it very well might have. With every fiber of my being screaming at me to run, but too paralyzed with fear to heed their call, my eyes strained through the dense foliage for any sign of movement. The creature's eyes suddenly flared up in that unnatural hue of amber, just yards away from where we stood. The ground shook as if it were angry, an earthquake originating from deep beneath our feet sent dirt cascading down around us as the creature lunged forward. Its matted fur, a hideous mixture of black and brown, covered a body that was both terrifying and grotesque. Its mouth was filled with jagged, protruding teeth that oozed with thick saliva and blood. It stood at least eight feet tall on its twisted hind legs, with long, clawed arms swiping wildly at the air. Lennox, we need to get out of here now! Ellery shouted, his voice barely audible over the deafening pounding of my own heart. With fear as our guide, we sprinted through the woods, branches whipping against our faces and adrenaline surging through our veins. Glancing back, I saw the creature gaining speed with ease as it bounded after us, propelled by its hunger for our flesh. What do we do? I gasped as we stumbled into a murky clearing. It was then that I noticed a deep ravine cutting a jagged path through the earth, just beyond the edge of the tree lean. Lennox! 
Ellery shouted urgently while struggling to load Olga. Jump across! We might be able to buy some time! I took a few steps back, then charged forward with everything I had left in me before leaping across the ravine. The wind whipped past my ears as I landed hard on the other side, letting out a sharp cry of pain. Ellery followed suit. His breaths were ragged from exertion and fear. Before the monster could reach us, Ellery unleashed a bone-rattling blast from Olga. The noise was deafening in such close quarters, but it seemed only to enrage the creature further. Frantically unloading whatever supplies we had left, gasoline canisters pulled around us. My hands shook violently as I struggled to light a match, but gladly, luck had graced us this time. As flames licked their way towards the creature, it screamed in what seemed to be anger. Backing away, it disappeared into the shadows of the forest, leaving us battered and petrified. With our hearts pounding a mile a minute and adrenaline pumping through our veins, we helped each other climb up from the ravine and begin back towards town. The sun was beginning to rise when we finally reached Ellery's family's land, exhausted, dirty, and bloody. The echoes from the hellish screams of that creature still haunt my mind. But what keeps me awake at night is knowing that the beast we fought that fateful night in the woods still stalks our town, hidden in those dark, unforgiving shadows. It all began on August 12, 2011 in the isolated wilderness of Nome, Alaska. My name is Ainsley Finch, and my buddies Brock Thompson and Darius Mitchell had decided to embark on a week-long camping trip. What was meant to be a retreat from urban life would change our lives forever. On day four, we decided to explore some deeper parts of the woods, following an old, beaten path. As we walked further away from our campsite, we couldn't help but observe how eerily quiet it was becoming. Darius jokingly mentioned that maybe we were being watched by mountain spirits. Brock scoffed at the idea and continued walking. By mid-afternoon, Brock had spotted something strange in the distance. A carcass littered on the forest floor. As we carefully approached it, we saw that it was a grizzly bear's mutilated body. It appeared as if it had been ripped apart by something even more massive and powerful than itself. We decided to continue our hike despite being alarmed by the sight, but we were cautious of our surroundings. Later that night, while sitting around the campfire, Darius brought up the encounter with the bear carcass. You don't think a more formidable predator took down that grizzly? He asked with fear in his voice. Before anyone could respond, something unsettling interrupted the conversation. A guttural growl emanated from deep within the woods surrounding us. We huddled close together as our eyes darted frantically in every direction, attempting to locate what lurked beyond our camp. Brock bravely voiced, We should put out the fire and grab the flashlights. Darius reluctantly agreed. It seemed like hours since I last blinked as my adrenaline raced through my body. With each passing second, an unknown fear grew closer. Once the extinguished embers were covered with dust, we cautiously scanned the nearby area with our flashlight beams. It was then that we caught sight of a shadow unlike anything we'd ever seen before. A grotesque figure stood on two hind legs reaching at least seven feet tall. Its body was mangled and twisted, giving off an unmistakable sense of dread. At this moment, we couldn't ignore the horrifying realization that we were not dealing with a typical wild animal. With instinct kicking in, Darius urged us to move back and forth, attempting to keep this monstrous being in our collective sights. 
Stepping lightly, our hearts pounding relentlessly, we carefully retreated towards our camp. The further away we got from the creature, the closer it appeared in response. The realization sank in that it could easily outpace us if it chose to close the gap. Upon reaching our tents, Brock's face paled as he realized the only gun we had brought was inside his backpack within his tent. As he nervously attempted to unzip the tent and retrieve the weapon, I heard heavy breathing just behind me. Frozen with fear but knowing I had no choice, I turned slowly and saw its gruesome features mere inches from my face. I screamed as the world started spinning around me. Our lives were on the line, and I knew that every decision made at this moment would determine our fate. As I maintained eye contact with the creature, my fear gradually transformed into steely determination. I rolled to my left, grabbed a large rock, and hurled it at the creature's grotesque face. The rock struck its target with immense force, temporarily disorienting the monster. Seizing this opportunity, Brock emerged from his tent, brandishing the gun in our defense. Darius pulled out a flare gun from his backpack and fired it into the sky to signal for help. We could only hope someone would see it and come to our aid. In that instant, our panicked minds instinctively began concocting a plan to escape from this seemingly unstoppable beast. Brock fired several shots at the creature as we scrambled around haphazardly in an attempt to confuse it. To our disbelief, bullets did little to slow down the beast's ferocious advances. True to its twisted nature, the grotesque figure revealed a long, blood-stained tail equipped with razor-sharp spines. Instead of pursuing us directly, it lashed its tail in our direction, barely missing my head as I narrowly dodged out of its reach. As we fought for our lives against this seemingly invincible creature, we heard a distant rumble grow louder as an all-terrain vehicle came into view. Help had arrived. The ATV skidded to a halt beside us and two armed park rangers emerged from their seats with urgency etched on their faces. They opened fire on the beast alongside Brock, who was now dangerously low on ammo. The bullets seemed to finally have an effect as the creature reeled back in pain. We seized this opportunity once more and boarded the ATV along with our saviors. As we sped away from certain death, a massive tree branch caught hold of that monstrous figure's tail, and for a fleeting second, we saw the terror in the beast's eyes before it was whisked away from us. As we escaped through the dark forest, we recounted our harrowing story to the rangers. They admitted that they were already searching for this creature after several reports of bizarre events in the area. They were relieved to have finally located and cornered it, but expressed concern that our encounter might not be the last. When we finally arrived back at the ranger station, shivering and covered in dirt, we couldn't help but feel grateful, not only for our lives but also for having each other's backs in those chilling moments. Despite the nightmare that unfolded, an unbreakable bond was forged between us that night. In time, we would move on with our lives, but we could never forget what happened to us in Nome. The creature's fate remained uncertain, leaving all of us with lingering paranoia that it may return one day and seek revenge.